Section 1 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. Section 1. Ode to Dr. William Sancroft, late Lord Bishop of Canterbury. Written in May 1689, at the desire of the late Lord Bishop of Ely. Truth is eternal, and the sun of heaven, bright affluence of the mortal ray, chief cherub and chief lamp of that high sacred seven, which guard the throne by night, and are its light by day. First of God's darling attributes, thou daily seest him face to face, nor does thy essence fixed depend on giddy circumstance of time or place. Two foolish guides in every sublunary dance. How shall we find thee then in dark disputes? How shall we search thee in a battle gained, or a weak argument by force maintained? In dagger contests, and the artillery of words, for swords are madmen's tongues, and tongues are madmen's swords. Contrive to tire all patience out, and not to satisfy the doubt? But where is even thy image on our earth? For of the person much I fear, since heaven will claim its residence as well as birth. And God himself has said, He shall not find it here. For this inferior world is but heaven's dusky shade, by dark reverted rays, from its reflection made. Whence the weak shapes wild and imperfect pass, like sunbeams shot at too far distance from a glass, which all the mimic forms express, though in strange uncouth postures and uncomely dress. So when Cartesian artists try to solve appearances of sight, in its reception to the eye, and catch the living landscape, through a scanty light. The figures all inverted show, and colors of a faded hue. Here a pale shape with upward footstep treads, and men seem walking on their heads. There whole herds suspended lie, ready to tumble down into the sky. Such are the ways ill-guided mortals go, to judge of things above by things below disjointing shapes as in the fairy land of dreams, or images that sink in streams. No wonder, then, we talk amiss of truth and what or where it is. Say, muse, for thou, if any, knowest, since the bright essence fled, where haunts the reverend ghost? If all that our weak knowledge titles virtue be, high truth, the best resemblance of exalted thee. If a mind fixed to combat fate, with those two powerful swords, submission and humility, sounds truly good or truly great, ill may I live if the good Sancroft, in his holy rest, in the divinity of retreat, be not the brightest pattern earth can show of heaven-born truth below. But foolish man still judges what is best, In his own balance false and light, Following opinion dark and blind, That vagrant leader of the mind, Till honesty and conscience are clear out of sight. And some, to be large ciphers in a state, Pleased with an empty swelling to be counted great, Make their minds travel o'er infinity of space, wrapped through the wide expanse of thought, and oft in contradiction's vortex caught, to keep that worthless clod the body in one place. Errors like this did old astronomers misguide, led blindly on by gross philosophy and pride, who, like hard masters, taught the sun through many a heedless sphere to run, many an eccentric and unthrifty motion make, and a thousand incoherent journeys take, 
whilst all the advantage by it got was but to light earth's inconsiderable spot the herd beneath who see the weathercock of state hung loosely on the church's pinnacle believe it firm because perhaps the day is mild and still but when they find it turn with the first blast of fate by gazing upward giddy grow and think the church itself does so thus fools for being strong and numerous known suppose the truth like all the world their own and holy sancroft's motion quite irregular appears because tis opposite to theirs in vain then would the muse the multitude advise whose peevish knowledge thus perversely lies in gathering follies from the wise rather put on thy anger and thy spite and some kind power for once dispense through the dark mass the dawn of so much sense to make them understand and feel me when i write the muse and i no more revenge desire each line shall stab shall blast like daggers and like fire ah britain land of angels which of all thy sins say hapless isle although it is a bloody list we know has given thee up a dwelling place to fiends sin and plague ever abound in governments too easy and too fruitful ground evils which a too gentle king too flourishing a spring and too warm summers bring our british soil is over rank and breeds among the noblest flowers a thousand poisonous weeds and every stinking weed so lofty grows as if twould overshade the royal rose the royal rose the glory of our morn but ah too much without a thorn forgive original mildness this ill-governed zeal tis all the angry slighted muse can do in the pollution of these days no province now is left her but to rail and poetry has lost the art to praise alas the occasions are so few none e'er but you and your almighty master knew with heavenly peace of mind to bear free from our tyrant passions anger scorn or fear the giddy turns of popular rage and all the contradictions of a poisoned age the son of god pronounced by the same breath which straight pronounced his death and though i should but ill be understood in wholly equaling our sin and theirs and measuring by the scanty thread of wit what we call holy and great and just and good methods in talk whereof our pride and ignorance make use and which our wild ambition foolishly compares with endless and with infinite yet pardon native albion when i say among thy stubborn sons there haunts that spirit of the jews that those forsaken wretches who to-day revile his great ambassador seem to discover what they would have done were his humanity on earth once more to his undoubted master heaven's almighty son but zeal is weak and ignorant though wondrous proud though very turbulent and very loud the crazy composition shows like that fantastic medley in the idol's toes made up of iron mixed with clay this crumbles into dust that moulders into rust or melts by the first shower away nothing is fixed that mortals see or know unless perhaps some stars above be so and those alas do show like all transcendent excellence below in both false mediums cheat our sight and far exalted objects lessen by their height thus primitive sancroft moves too high to be observed by vulgar eye 
and rolls the silent year on his own secret regular sphere and sheds though all unseen his sacred influence here kind star still mayest thou shed thy sacred influence here or from thy private peaceful orb appear for sure we want some guide from heaven to show the way which every wandering fool below pretends so perfectly to know and which for aught i see and much i fear the world has wholly missed i mean the way which leads to christ mistaken idiots see how giddily they run led blindly on by avarice and pride what mighty numbers follow them each fond of erring with his guide some whom ambition drives seek heaven's high sun in caesar's court or in jerusalem others ignorantly wise among proud doctors and disputing pharisees what could the sages gain but unbelieving scorn their faith was so uncourtly when they said that heaven's high sun was in a village born that the world's savior had been in a vile manger laid and fostered in a wretched inn necessity thou tyrant conscience of the great say why the church is still led blindfold by the state why should the first be ruined and laid waste to mend dilapidations in the last and yet the world whose eyes are in our mighty prince thinks heaven has cancelled all our sins and that his subjects share his happy influence follow the model close for so i'm sure they should but wicked kings draw more examples than the good and divine sancroft weary with the weight of a declining church by faction her worst foe oppressed finding the mitre almost grown a load as heavy as the crown wisely retreated to his heavenly rest ah may no one kind earthquake of the state nor hurricano from the crown disturb the present mitre as that fearful storm of late which in its dusky march along the plain swept up whole churches as it list wrapped in a whirlwind and a mist like that prophetic tempest in the virgin rain and swallowed them at last or flung them down such were the storms good sancroft long has borne the mitre which his sacred head has worn was like his master's crown enwreathed with thorn death's sting is swallowed up in victory at last the bitter cup is from him passed fortune in both extremes though blasts from contrariety of winds yet to firm heavenly minds is but one thing under two different names and even the sharpest eye that has the prospect seen confesses ignorance to judge between and must to human reasoning opposite conclude to point out which is moderation which is fortitude thus sancroft in the exaltation of retreat shows lustre that was shaded in his seat short glimmerings of the prelate glorified which the disguise of greatness only served to hide why should the sun alas be proud to lodge behind a golden cloud though fringed with evening gold the cloud appears so gay tis but a low-born vapor kindled by a ray at length tis overblown and past puffed by the people's spiteful blast the dazzling glory dims their prostituted sight no deflowered eye can face the naked light yet does this high perfection well proceed from strength of its own native seed this wilderness the world like that poetic wood of old bears one and but one branch of gold or the blessed spirit lodges like the dove and which to heavenly soil transplanted will improve to be as twas below the brightest plant above 
For what here theologic levellers dream, There are degrees above, I know, As well as here below. The goddess Muse herself has told me so. Where high patrician souls, Dressed heavenly gay, Sit clad in lawn of purer woven day, there some high-spirited throne to Sancroft shall be given, in the metropolis of heaven. Chief of the mitred saints, and from archprelate here, translated to archangel there. Since, happy saint, since it has been of late either our blindness or our fate, to lose the providence of thy cares, pity a miserable church's tears that begs the powerful blessing of thy prayers. Some angels say, what were the nation's crimes that sent these wild reformers to our times? Say what their senseless malice meant to tear religion's lovely face, stripper of every ornament and grace, in striving to wash off the imaginary paint. Religion now does on her deathbed lie, heart-sick of a high fever and consuming atrophy. How the physicians swarm to show their mortal skill, and by their college arts methodically kill. Reformers and physicians differ but in name, one end in both and the design the same. Cordials are in their talk, while all they mean is but the patient's death and gain. Check in thy satire, angry muse, or a more worthy subject choose. Let not the outcasts of an outcast age provoke the honours of my muse's rage, nor be thy mighty spirit raised, since heaven and Cato both are pleased. End of section one. Section 2 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Ode to the Honorable Sir William Temple Written at Moor Park in June 1689 Virtue, the greatest of all monarchies, Till its first emperor, rebellious man, Deposed from off his seat, It fell and broke with its own weight into small states and principalities, by many a petty lord possessed, but never since seated in one single breast. Tis you must this land subdue, the mighty conquests left for you, the conquest and discovery too. Search out this utopian ground, virtue's terra incognita, where none ever led the way, nor ever since but in descriptions found like the philosopher's stone, with rules to search it, yet obtained by none. We have too long been led astray, too long have our misguided souls been taught, with rules from musty morals brought. Tis you must put us in the way, let us, for shame, no more be fed, with antique relics of the dead. The gleanings of philosophy, Philosophy, the lumber of the schools, the roguery of alchemy, and we, the bubbled fools, spend all our present life in hopes of golden rules. But what does our proud ignorance learning call? We, oddly, Plato's paradox make good. Our knowledge is but mere remembrance all. Remembrance is our treasure and our food. Nature's fair table book our tender souls, we scrawl all o'er with old and empty rules, stale memorandums of the schools. For learning's mighty treasures look into that deep grave, a book. Think that she there does all her treasures hide, and that her troubled ghost still haunts there since she died. Confine her walks to colleges and schools her priests, her train, and followers show, as if they all were spectres too. They purchase knowledge at the expense of common breeding, common sense, and grow at once scholars and fools. 
affect ill-mannered pedantry, rudeness, ill-nature, incivility, and sick with dregs and knowledge grown, which greedily they swallow down, till cast it up and nauseate company. Cursed be the wretch, nay, doubly cursed, if it may lawful be to curse our greatest enemy, who learned himself that heresy first, which since has seized on all the rest, that knowledge forfeits all humanity, taught us, like Spaniards, to be proud and poor, and fling our scraps before our door. Thrice happy you have scaped this general pest, those mighty epithets learned good and great, which we ne'er joined before, but in romances meet. We find in you at last united grown. You cannot be compared to one. I must, like him, that painted Venus's face, borrow from every one a grace. Virgil and Epicurus will not do, their courting a retreat like you, unless I put in Caesar's learning too. Your happy frame at once controls this great triumvirate of souls. Let not old Rome boast Fabius's fate. He saved his country by delays, but you by peace. You bought it at a cheaper rate, nor has it left the usual bloody scar to show it cost its price in war. War that mad game the world so loves to play and for it does so dearly pay. For though with loss or victory a while, fortune the gamesters does beguile, and yet at the last the box sweeps all away. Only the laurel got by peace, no thunder air can blast, the artillery of the skies shoots to the earth and dies, and evergreen and flourishing will last, nor dipped in blood, nor widow's tears, nor orphan's cries. About the head crowned with these bays, like lambent fire, the lightning plays, nor its triumphal cavalcade to grace, makes up its solemn train with death. It melts the sword of war, yet keeps it in the sheath. The wily shafts of state, those jugglers' tricks, which we call deep designs and politics, as in a theatre the ignorant fry, because the cords escape their eye, wonder to see the motions fly. Methinks when you expose the scene, down the ill-organed engines fall. Off fly the wizards and discover all, how plain I see through the deceit, how shallow and how gross the cheat. Look where the pulleys tied above. Great God, said I, what have I seen? On what poor engines move the thoughts of monarchs and designs of states? What petty motives rule their fates? How the mouse makes the mighty mountains shake. The mighty mountain labors with its birth. Away the frightened peasants fly, scared at the unheard of prodigy, expect some great gigantic son of earth. Lo, it appears. See how they tremble, how they quake. Out starts the little beast and mocks their idle fears. Then tell, dear favorite muse, what serpents that which still resorts still lurks in palaces and courts. Take thy unwanted flight, and on the terrace light. See where she lies, see how she rears her head, and rolls about her dreadful eyes, to drive all virtue out, or look it dead. T'was sure this basilisk sent temple vents, and though as some tis said for their defense, have worn a casement o'er their skin, so wore he his within, made up of virtue and transparent innocence. And though he oft renewed the fight, and almost got priority of sight, he ne'er could overcome her quite. In pieces cut, the viper still did reunite, till at last 
tired with loss of time and ease, resolved to give himself, as well as country, peace. Sing, beloved muse, the pleasures of retreat, and in some untouched virgin strain, show the delights thy sister nature yields. Sing of thy vales, sing of thy woods, sing of thy fields. Go publish o'er the plain how mighty a proselyte you gain, how noble a reprisal on the great. How is the muse luxuriant grown, whene'er she takes this flight, she soars clear out of sight. These are the paradises of her own. Thy Pegasus, like an unruly horse, though ne'er so gently led, to the loved pastures where he used to feed, runs violent o'er his usual course. Wake from thy wanton dreams, come from thy dear-loved streams, the crooked paths of wandering Thames. Fain the fair nymph would stay, oft she looks back in vain, oft gainst her fountain does complain, and softly steals in many windings down, as loath to see the hated court and town, and murmurs as she glides away. In this new happy scene are nobler subjects for your learned pen. Here we expect from you more than your predecessor Adam knew. Whatever moves our wonder or our sport, whatever serves for innocent emblems of the court, how that which we a colonel see whose well-compacted forms escape the light, unpierced by the blunt rays of sight, shall ere long grow into a tree, whence takes its increase and whence its birth, or from the sun or from the air or from the earth, where all the fruitful atoms lie. How some go downward to the root, some more ambitious upwards fly, and form the leaves, the branches, and the fruit. You strove to cultivate a barren court in vain, your gardens better worth your nobler pain. Here mankind fell, and hence must rise again. Shall I believe a spirit so divine was cast in the same mould with mine? Why then does nature so unjustly share among her elder sons the whole estate, and all her jewels and her plate? Poor we, cadets of heaven, not worth her care, take up at best with lumber and the leavings of a fair. Some she binds prentice to the spade, some to the drudgery of a trade, some she does to Egyptian bondage draw, bids us make bricks, yet sends us to look out for straw. Some she condemns for life to try, to dig the leaden mines of deep philosophy. Me she has to the muses' galleys tied. In vain I strive to cross the spacious main. In vain I tug and pull the oar. And when I almost reach the shore, straight the muse turns the helm, and I launch out again. And yet to feed my pride, whene'er I mourn, stops my complaining breath with promise of a mad reversion after death. Then, sir, Accept this worthless verse, the tribute of a humble muse, tis all the portion of my niggard stars. Nature, the hidden spark, did at my birth infuse, and kindled first with indolence and ease, and since too oft debauched by praise, tis now grown an incurable disease. In vain to quench this foolish fire I try, in wisdom and philosophy. In vain all wholesome herbs I sow, where naught but weeds will grow. Whate'er I plant like corn on barren earth, Section 3 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Ode to King William on his successes in Ireland. To purchase kingdoms and to buy renown 
are arts peculiar to dissembling France. You mighty monarch, nobler actions crown, and solid virtue does your name advance. Your matchless courage with your prudence joins, the glorious structure of your fame to raise. With its own light your dazzling glory shines, and into adoration turns our praise. Had you by dull succession gained your crown, cowards are monarchs by that title made, part of your merit chance would call her own, and half your virtues had been lost in shade. But now your worth its just reward shall have. What trophies and what triumphs are your due? Who could so well a dying nation save, at once deserve a crown, and gain it, too. You saw how near we were to ruin brought. You saw the impetuous torrent rolling on, and timely on the coming danger thought, which we could neither obviate nor shun. Britannia stripped of her sole guard the laws, ready to fall Rome's bloody sacrifice. You straight stepped in, and from the monster's jaws did bravely snatch the lovely, helpless prize. Nor this is all, as glorious is the care to preserve conquests as at first to gain. In this your virtue claims a double share, which, what it bravely won, does well maintain. Your arm has now your rightful title showed, an arm on which all Europe's hopes depend to which they look as to some guardian god that must their doubtful liberty defend. Amazed thy action at the Boyne we see, when Schomburg started at the vast design. The boundless glory all redounds to thee. The impulse, the fight, the event were wholly thine. The brave attempt does all our foes disarm, you need but now give orders and command. Your name shall the remaining work perform, and spare the labor of your conquering hand. France does in vain her feeble arts apply to interrupt the fortune of your course. Your influence does the vain attacks defy of secret malice or of open force. Boldly we hence the brave commencement date, of glorious deeds that must all tongues employ. William's the Pledge and Section 4 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1 by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Ode to the Athenian Society Moore Park, February 14th, 1691 As when the deluge first began to fall, that mighty ebb never to flow again, when this huge body's moisture was so great, it quite o'ercame the vital heat, that mountain which was highest, first of all, appeared above the universal main, to bless the primitive sailor's weary sight. And t'was perhaps Parnassus, if in height it be as great as tis in fame, and nigh to heaven as is its name. So, after the inundation of a war, when learning's little household did embark, with her world's fruitful system in her sacred ark, at the first ebb of noise and fears, philosophy's exalted head appears and the dove muse will now no longer stay, but plumes her silver wings and flies away. And now a laurel wreath she brings from far, to crown the happy conqueror, to show the flood begins to cease, and brings the dear reward of victory and peace. The eager muse took wing upon the wave's decline, when war her cloudy aspect just withdrew, when the bright sun of peace began to shine, and for a while in heavenly contemplation sat on the high top of peaceful Ararat, 
and plucked a laurel branch, for laurel was the first that grew, the first of plants after the thunder, storm, and rain, and thence with joyful, nimble wing flew dutifully back again, and made an humble chaplet for the king. And the dove muses fled once more, glad of the victory, yet frightened at the war, and now discovers from afar a peaceful and a flourishing shore. No sooner did she land on the delightful strand than straight she sees the country all around, where fatal Neptune ruled erewhile, scattered with flowery vales, with fruitful gardens crowned, and many a pleasant wood, as if the universal Nile had rather watered it than drowned. It seems some floating piece of paradise, preserved by wonder from the flood, long wandering through the deep, as we are told, famed Delos did of old. And the transported muse imagined it to be a fitter birthplace for the god of wit, or the much-talked of oracular grove, when with amazing joy she hears an unknown music all around, charming her greedy ears with many a heavenly song of nature and of art, of deep philosophy and love while angels tune the voice and God inspires the tongue. In vain she catches at the empty sound, in vain pursues the music with her longing eye, and courts the wanton echoes as they fly. Pardon, ye great unknown and far-exalted men, the wild excursions of a youthful pen. Forgive a young and almost virgin muse, whom blind and eager curiosity, yet curiosity, they say, is in her sex a crime needs no excuse, has forced to grope her uncouth way after a mighty light that leads her wandering eye. No wonder then she quits the narrow path of sense for a dear ramble through impertinence. Impertinence, the scurvy of mankind, and all we fools who are the greater part of it, though we be of two different factions still, both the good-natured and the ill. Yet wheresoever you look, you'll always find we join like flies and wasps in buzzing about wit. In me, who am of the first sect of these, all merit that transcends the humble rules of my own dazzled scanty sense, begets a kinder folly and impertinence of admiration and of praise. And our good brethren of the surly sect must e'en all herd us with their kindred fools. For though possessed of present vogue, they've made railing a rule of wit and obloquy a trade. Yet the same want of brains produces each effect. And you, whom Pluto's helm does wisely shroud, from us the blind and thoughtless crowd, like the famed hero in his mother's cloud, who both our follies and impertinences see, do laugh perhaps at theirs, and pity mine and me. But censures to be understood, the authentic mark of the elect, the public stamp heaven sets on all that's great and good, our shallow search and judgment to direct. The war, methinks, has made our wit and learning narrow as our trade. Instead of boldly sailing far to buy a stock of wisdom and philosophy, we fondly stay at home in fear of every censuring privateer, forcing a wretched trade by beating down the sail and selling basely by retail. The wits, I mean, the atheists of the age, who fain would rule the pulpit as they do the stage, wondrous refiners of philosophy, of morals and divinity, by the new modish system of reducing all to sense, against all logic and concluding laws, do own the effects of providence, and yet deny the cause. This hopeful sect now it begins to see how little, very little, do prevail, 
their first and chiefest force, to censure, to cry down and rail, not knowing what or where or who you be, will quickly take another course. And by their never-failing ways of solving all appearances they please, we soon shall see them to their ancient methods fall, and straight deny you to be men or anything at all. I laugh at the grave answer they will make, which they have always ready, general, and cheap. Tis but to say that what we daily meet, and by a fond mistake perhaps imagine to be wondrous wit, and think, alas, to be by mortals writ, is but a crowd of atoms justling in a heap, which from eternal seeds begun, justling some thousand years till ripened by the sun. There now, just now, as naturally born, as from the womb of earth a field of corn. But as for poor contented me, who must my weakness and my ignorance confess, that I believe in much I ne'er can hope to see, methinks I'm satisfied to guess that this new, noble, and delightful scene is wonderfully moved by some exalted men who have well studied in the world's disease, that epidemic error and depravity, or in our judgment, or our eye, that what surprises us can only please. We often search contentedly the whole world round to make some great discovery, and scorn it when tis found. Just so the mighty Nile has suffered in its fame, because, tis said, and perhaps only said, we found a little inconsiderable head that feeds the huge unequal stream. Consider human folly, and you'll quickly own that all the praises it can give, by which some fondly boast they shall forever live, won't pay the impertinence of being known. Else, why should the famed Lydian king, whom all the charms of an usurped wife and state, with all that power unfelt, courts mankind to be great, did with new unexperienced glories wait, still wear, still dote, on his invisible ring? Were I to form a regular thought of fame, which is perhaps as hard to imagine right as to paint echo to the sight, I would not draw the idea from an empty name, because, alas, when we all die, careless and ignorant posterity, although they praise the learning and the wit, and though the title seems to show the name and man by whom the book was writ, yet how shall they be brought to know whether that very name was he, or you, or I. Lest should I daub it o'er with transitory praise, and watercolors of these days. These days, where e'en the extravagance of poetry is at a loss for figures to express men's folly, whimsies, and inconstancy, and by a faint description makes them less. Then tell us what is fame, where shall we search for it? Look where exalted virtue and religion sit, enthroned with heavenly wit. Look where you see the greatest scorn of learned vanity, and then how much a nothing is mankind, whose reason is weighed down by popular air, who by that vainly talks of baffling death, and hopes to lengthen life by a transfusion of breath, which yet Whoever examines right will find to be an art as vain as bottling up of wind. And when you find out these, believe true fame is there, far above all reward, yet to which all is due. And this, ye great unknown, is only known in you. The juggling sea god, when by chance trepanned, by some instructed queerest sleeping on the sand, impatient of all answers, straight became a stealing brook and strove to creep away into his native sea, vexed at their follies, 
murmured in his stream, but disappointed of his fond desire, would vanish in a pyramid of fire. This surly slippery god, when he designed to furnish his escapes, ne'er borrowed more variety of shapes than you to please and satisfy mankind, and seem almost transformed to water, flame, and air. So well you answer all phenomena there, though madmen and the wits, philosophers, and fools, with all that factious or enthusiastic dotard's dream, and all the incoherent jargon of the schools, though all the fumes of fear, hope, love, and shame contrive to shock your minds with many a senseless doubt, doubts where the Delphic god would grope in ignorance and night, the god of learning and of light, would want a god himself to help him out. Philosophy, as it is before us, lies, seems to have borrowed some ungrateful taste of doubts, impertinence, and niceties, from every age through which it passed, but always with a stronger relish of the last. This beauteous queen by heaven designed to be the great original for man to dress and polish his uncourtly mind. In what mock habits have they put her since the fall, more oft in fools' and madmen's hands than sages? She seems a medley of all ages, with a huge farthingale to swell her fustian stuff, a new commode, a top-knot, and a ruff, her face patched o'er with modern pedantry, with a long sweeping train of comments and disputes, ridiculous and vain, all of old cut with a new dye. How soon have you restored her charms, and rid her of her lumber and her books, dressed her again genteel and neat, and rather tight than great. How fond we are to court her to our arms! How much of heaven is in her naked looks! Thus the deluding muse oft blinds me to her ways, and even my very thoughts transfers and changes all to beauty and the praise of that proud tyrant sex of hers. The rebel muse, alas, takes part, but with my own rebellious heart, and you with fatal and immortal wit conspire to fan the unhappy fire. Cruel unknown, what is it you intend? Ah, could you, could you hope a poet for your friend? Rather forgive what my first transport said. May all the blood which shall by woman's scorn be shed lie upon you and upon your children's head. For you, ah, did I think I e'er would live to see the fatal time when that could be, have even increased their pride and cruelty. Woman seems now above all vanity grown, still boasting of her great unknown, platonic champions gained without one female while, or the vast charges of a smile which tis a shame to see how much of late you've taught the covetous wretches to orate, and which they've now the consciences to weigh in the same balance with our tears and with such scanty wages pay, the bondage and the slavery of years. Let the vain sex dream on, the empire comes from us, and had they common generosity they would not use us thus. Well, though you've raised her to this high degree, ourselves are raised as well as she. In spite of all that they or you can do, tis pride and happiness enough to me still to be of the same exalted sex with you. Alas, how fleeting and how vain is even the nobler man, our learning and our wit. I sigh whene'er I think of it, as at the closing an unhappy scene of some great king and conqueror's death, when the sad melancholy muse stays but to catch his utmost breath. I grieve this nobler work 
most happily begun, so quickly and so wonderfully carried on, may fall at last to interest, folly, and abuse. There is a noontide in our lives, which still the sooner it arrives, although we boast our winter sun looks bright, and foolishly are glad to see it at its height, yet so much sooner comes the long and gloomy night. No conquest ever yet begun, and by one mighty hero carried to its height, ere flourished under a successor or a son. It lost some mighty pieces through all hands it passed, and vanished to an empty title in the last. For when the animating mind is fled, which nature never can retain, nor e'er call back again, the body, though gigantic, lies all cold and dead. And thus undoubtedly twill fare, with what unhappy men shall dare, to be successors to these great unknown, on learning's high-established throne, censure and pedantry and pride, numberless nations stretching far and wide, shall, I foresee it, soon with Gothic swarms come forth from ignorance's universal north, and with blind rage break all this peaceful government. Yet shall the traces of your wit remain like a just map to tell the vast extent of conquest in your short and happy reign. And to all future mankind shew how strange a paradox is true, that men who lived and died without a name Section 5 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To Mr. Congreve, written in November 1693. Thrice with a prophet's voice and prophet's power, the muse was called in a poetic hour, and insolently thrice the slighted maid dared to suspend her unregarded aid. Then, with that grief we form in spirits divine, pleads for her own neglect, and thus reproaches mine. Once highly honoured, false is the pretense you make to truth, retreat, and innocence. Who, to pollute my shades, bringst with thee down the most ungenerous vices of the town? Near sprung a youth from out this isle before, I once esteemed and loved, and favoured more, nor ever maid endured such court-like scorn, so much in mode, so very city-born. Tis with a foul design the muse you send, like a cast mistress to your wicked friend. But find some new address, some fresh deceit, nor practice such an antiquated cheat. These are the beaten methods of the stews. Stale forms, of course, all mean deceivers use, who barbarously think to scape reproach by prostituting her they first debauch. Thus did the muse severe unkindly blame this offering long designed to Congreve's fame. First child the zeal as unpoetic fire, which soon his merit forced her to inspire. Then call this verse that speaks her largest aid, the greatest compliment she ever made, and wisely judge no power beneath divine, could leap the bounds which part your world and mine. For youth, believe, to you unseen, is fixed, a mighty gulf unpassable betwixt, nor tax the goddess of a mean design to praise your parts by publishing of mine. That be my thought when some large bulky writ shows in the front the ambition of my wit, there to surmount what bears me up and sing, like the victorious wren perched on the eagle's wing. This could I do, and proudly o'er him tower, 
where my desire is but heightened to my power. Godlike the force of my young Congreve's bays, softening the muse's thunder into praise, sent to assist an old unvanquished pride that looks with scorn on half mankind beside. A pride that well suspends poor mortal's fate, gets between them and my resentment's weight, stands in the gap twixt me and wretched men, to vert the impending judgments of my pen. Thus I look down with mercy on the age, by hopes my congreve will reform the stage. For never did poetic mind before produce a richer vein or cleaner ore. The bullion stamped in your refining mind serves by retail to furnish half mankind. With indignation I behold your wit, forced on me, cracked and clipped and counterfeit, by vile pretenders who a stock maintain from broken scraps and filings of your brain. Through native dross your share is hardly known, and by short views mistook for all their own. So small the gains those from your wit do reap, who blend it into folly's larger heap. Like the sun's scattered beams which loosely pass, when some rough hand breaks the assembling glass. Yet want your critics no just cause to rail, since knaves are near obliged for what they steal. These pad on wit's high road, and suits maintain, with those they rob, by what their trade does gain. Thus censure seems that fiery froth which breeds, o'er the sun's face, and from his heat proceeds, crusts o'er the day, shadowing its partent beam, as ancient nature's modern masters dream. This bids some curious praetors here below call titans sick because their sight is so. And well, methinks, does this illusion fit to scribblers and the god of light and wit, those who by wild delusions entertain a lust of rhyming for a poet's vein raise envy's clouds to leave themselves in night, but can no more obscure my congreve's light. Then swarms of gnats that wanton in array, which give them birth, can rob the world of day. What northern hive poured out these foes to wit? Whence came these goths to overrun the pit? How would you blush the shameful birth to hear, of those you so ignobly stoop to fear. For ill to them, long have I travelled since, round all the circles of impertinence, searched in the nest where every worm did lie, before it grew a city butterfly. I'm sure I found them other kind of things than those with backs of silk and golden wings. A search, no doubt, as curious and as wise, as virtuosos in dissecting flies. For could you think the fiercest foes you dread in court and prologues all our country bred? Bred in my scene and for the poet's sins, adjourned from tops and grammar to the inns, those beds of dung where schoolboys sprout up bow far sooner than the nobler mushroom grows. These are the lords of the poetic schools, who preach the saucy pedantry of rules, those powers the critics who may boast the odds, or Nile with all its wilderness of gods. Nor could the nations kneel to viler shapes, which worshipped cats and sacrificed to apes. And can you think the wise forbear to laugh at the warm zeal that breeds this golden calf? Happily you judge these lines severely writ, against the proud usurpers of the pit. Stay while I tell my story short and true, to draw conclusions shall be left to you. Nor need I ramble far to force a rule, but lay the scene just here at Farnham School. Last year a lad, hence by his parents sent, with other cattle to the city went. 
where, having cast his coat and well pursued, the methods most in fashion to be lewd, returned a finished spark this summer down, stocked with the freshest gibberish of the town, a jargon formed from the lost language wit, confounded in that babble of the pit, formed by diseased conceptions weak and wild, sick lust of souls, and an abortive child, born between whores and fops by lewd compacts, before the play or else between the acts. Nor wonder it from such polluted minds should spring such short and transitory kinds, or crazy rules to make us wits by rote, last just as long as every cuckoo's note. What bungling rusty tools are used by fate? T'was in an evil hour to urge my hate. My hate, whose lash just heaven has long decreed, Shall on a day make sin and folly bleed. When man's ill genius to my presence sent, This wretch to rouse my wrath for ruin meant. Who in his idiom vile, with Gray's in grace, squandered his noisy talents to my face, named every player on his fingers' ends, swore all the wits were his peculiar friends, talked with that saucy and familiar ease of Witcherly and you and Mr. Bayes, said how a late report your friends had vexed, who heard you meant to write heroics next. For tragedy, he knew, would lose you quite, and told you so at wills but t'other night. Thus are the lives of fools a sort of dreams, rendering shades, things, and substances of names. Such high companions may delusion keep, lords are a footboy's cronies in his sleep. As a fresh miss by fancy, face, and gown, rendered the topping beauty of the town, draws every rhyming, prating, dressing sot, to boast of favours that he never got, of which whoever lacks confidence to prate, brings his good parts and breeding in debate. And not the meanest coxcomb you can find, but thanks his stars that Phyllis has been kind. Thus prostitute my Congreve's name is grown to every lewd pretender of the town. Troth I could pity you, but this is it you find to be the fashionable wit. These are the slaves whom reputation chains, whose maintenance requires no help from brains. For should the vilest scribbler to the pit, whom sin and want e'er furnished out a wit, whose name must not within my lines be shown, lest here it live when perished with his own. Should such a wretch usurp my congreve's place, and choose out wits who ne'er have seen his face, I'll bet my life but the dull cheat would pass, nor need the lion's skin conceal the ass. Yes, that bow's look, that vice, those critic ears, must needs be right so well resembling theirs. Perish the muse's hour thus vainly spent, in satire to my congreve's praises meant. In how ill season her resentments rule, What's that to her if mankind be a fool? Happy beyond a private muse's fate, In pleasing all that's good among the great, Where though her elder sister's crowding throng, She still is welcome with her innocent song. Whom were my congreve blessed to see and know, What poor regards would merit all below? How proudly would he haste the joy to meet, and drop his laurel at Apollo's feet. Here by a mountain's side, a reverend cave, gives murmuring passage to a lasting wave. Tis the world's watery hourglass streaming fast. Time is no more when that most drop is past. Here on a better day some druid dwelt, and the young muse's early favor felt. Druid, a name she does with pride repeat, Confessing Albion, once her darling seat. Far in this primitive cell might we pursue, Our predecessor's footsteps still in view. Here would we sing, but, ah, 
you think I dream, and the bad world may well believe the same. Yes, you are all malicious slanders by, while two fond lovers prate, the muse and I. Since thus I wander from my first intent, nor am that grave adviser which I meant, take this short lesson from the god of bays, and let my friend apply it as he please. Beat not the dirty paths where vulgar feet have trod, but give the vigorous fancy room. For when, like stupid alchemists, you try to fix this nimble god, this volatile mercury, the subtle spirit all flies up in fume. Nor shall the bubbled virtuoso find more than fade insipid mixture left behind. While thus I write, vast shoals of critics come, and on my verse pronounce their saucy doom. The muse, like some bright country virgin, shows, fallen by mishap among a knot of bows. They, in their lewd and fashionable prate, rally her dress, her language, and her gait, spend their base coin before the bashful maid, current like copper, and as often paid. She who on shady banks has joyed to sleep, Near better animals, her father's sheep, Shamed and amazed, beholds the chattering throng, To think what cattle she has got among. But with the odious smell and sight annoyed, In haste she does the offensive herd avoid. Tis time to bid my friend a long farewell, the muse retreats far in yon crystal cell. Faint inspiration sickens as she flies. Like distant echo spent, the spirit dies. In this descending sheet you'll haply find Some short refreshment for your weary mind. Not it contains is Section 6 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Occasioned by Sir William Temple's Late Illness and Recovery. Written in December 1693. Strange to conceive how the same objects strike at distant hours the mind with forms so like. Whether in time, deduction's broken chain, meets and salutes her sister Link again, or haunted fancy by a circling flight comes back with joy to its own seat at night. Or whether dead imagination's ghost oft hovers where alive it haunted most, or if thought's rolling globe her circle run turns up old objects to the soul, her son. Or loves the muse to walk with conscious pride, O'er the glad scene whence first she rose a bride. Be what it will, late near yon whispering stream, Where her own temple was her darling theme, There first the visionary sound was heard, When to poetic view the muse appeared. Such seemed her eyes as when an evening ray Gives glad farewell to a tempestuous day. Weak is the beam to dry up nature's tears, Still every tree the pendant sorrow wears. Such are the smiles where drops of crystal show, Approaching joy at strife with parting woe, As when to scare the ungrateful or the proud, Tempests long frown and thunder threatens loud till the blessed sun, to give kind dawn of grace, darts weeping beams across heaven's watery face. When soon the peaceful bow unstringed is shown, a sign God's dart is shot, and wrath o'erblown. Such to unhallowed sight the muse divine might seem when first she raised her eyes to mine. What mortal change does in thy face appear? Lost youth, she cried, since first I met thee here. 
with how undecent clouds are overcast thy looks when every cause of grief is past unworthy the glad tidings which i bring listen while the muse thus teaches thee to sing as parent earth burst by imprisoned winds scatters strange augues o'er men's sickly minds and shakes the atheist's knees such ghastly fear late i beheld on every face appear mild dorothea peaceful wise and great trembling beheld the doubtful hand of fate mild dorothea whom we both have long not dared to injure with our lowly song sprung from a better world and chosen then the best companion for the best of men as some fair pile yet spared by zeal and rage lives pious witness of a better age so men may see what once was womankind in the fair shrine of dorothea's mind you that would grief describe come here and trace its watery footsteps in dorinda's face grief from dorinda's face does near depart farther than its own palace in her heart ah since our fears are fled this insolent expel at least confine the tyrant to his cell and if so black the cloud that heaven's bright queen shrouds her still beams how should the stars be seen thus when dorinda wept joy every face forsook and grief flung sables on each menial look the humble tribe mourned for the quickening soul that furnished spirit and motion through the whole so would earth's face turn pale and life decay should heaven suspend to act but for a day so nature's crazed convulsions make us dread that time is sick or the world's mind is dead take youth these thoughts large matter to employ the fancy furnished by returning joy and to mistaken man these truths rehearse who dare revile the integrity of verse ah favorite youth how happy is thy lot but i'm deceived or thou regardest me not speak for i wait thy answer and expect thy just submission for this bold neglect unknown the forms we the high priesthood use at the divine appearance of the muse which to divulge might shake profane belief and tell the irreligion of my grief grief that excused the tribute of my knees and shaped my passion in such words as these malignant goddess bane to my repose thou universal cause of all my woes say whence it comes that thou art grown of late a poor amusement for my scorn and hate the malice thou inspirest i never fail on thee to wreak the tribute when i rail fools commonplace thou art their weak ensconcing fort the peal of dullness in the last resort heaven with a parent's eye regarding earth deals out to man the planet of his birth but sees thy meteor blaze about me shine and passing o'er mistakes thee still for mine ah should i tell a secret yet unknown that thou near hadst a being of thy own but a wild form dependent on the brain scattering loose features o'er the optic vein troubling the crystal fountain of the sight which darts on poet's eyes a trembling light kindled while reason sleeps but quickly flies like antic shapes in dreams from waking eyes in some a glittering voice a painted name a walking vapor like thy sister fame but if thou beest what thy mad votaries prate a female power loosed governed thoughts create why near the dregs of youth perversely wilt thou stay 
so highly courted by the brisk and gay. Wert thou right woman, thou should scorn to look on an abandoned wretch by hopes forsook. Forsook by hopes, ill fortune's last relief, assigned for life to unremitting grief. For let heaven's wrath enlarge these weary days, if hope ere dawns the smallest of its rays. Time o'er the happy takes so swift a flight, and treads so soft, so easy, and so light, that we, the wretched, creeping far behind, can scarce the impression of his footsteps find, smooth as that airy nymph so subtly born, with inoffensive feet or standing corn, which bowed by evening breeze with bending stalks, salutes the weary traveller as he walks, but o'er the afflicted with a heavy pace, sweeps the broad scythe and tramples on its face. Down falls the summer's pride and sadly shows nature's bare visage furrowed as he mows. See, muse, what havoc in these looks appear. These are the tyrant's trophies of a year. Since hope his last and greatest foe is fled, despair and he lodge ever in its stead. March o'er the ruined plain with motion slow, still scattering desolation where they go. To thee I owe that fatal bent of mind, still to unhappy restless thoughts inclined. To thee what oft I vainly strive to hide, that scorn of fools by fools mistook for pride. From thee whatever virtue takes its rise, grows a misfortune or becomes a vice. Such were thy rules to be poetically great. Stoop not to interest, flattery, or deceit, nor with hired thoughts be thy devotion paid. Learn to disdain their mercenary aid. Be this thy sure defence, thy brazen wall. Know no base action, at no guilt turn pale. And since unhappy distance thus denies, to expose thy soul clad in this poor disguise, since thy few ill-presented graces seem to breed contempt where thou hast hoped esteem. Madness like this no fancy ever seized, still to be cheated, never to be pleased, since one false beam of joy in sickly minds is all the poor content delusion finds. There thy enchantment broke, and from this hour I here renounce thy visionary power. And since thy essence on my breath depends, Section 7 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Written in a Lady's Ivory Table Book, 1698. Peruse my leaves through every part, and think thou seest my owner's heart, scrawled o'er with trifles thus and quite, as hard as senseless and as light. Exposed to every coxcomb's eyes, but hid with caution from the wise. Here you may read, Dear charming saint, beneath a new receipt for paint. Here in bow spelling, true tell death, there in her own, for an el breath. Here, lovely nymph, pronounce my doom. There, a safe way to use perfume. Here a page filled with billet doux, on t'other side, laid out for shoes. Madame, I die without your grace. Item for half a yard of lace. Who that had wit would place it here, for every peeping fop to jeer, to think that your brain's issue is exposed to the excrement of his, in power of spittle and a clout, whene'er he pleased to blot it out, and then to heighten the disgrace, 
clap his own nonsense in the place. Whoe'er expects to hold his part in such a book and such a heart, if he be wealthy and a fool, is in all points the fittest to. Section 8 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mrs. Francis Harris's Petition, 1699 To their excellencies, the Lords Justice of Ireland, the humble petition of Francis Harris, who must starve and die a maid if it miscarries, humbly sheweth that I went to warm myself in Lady Betty's chamber, because I was cold, and I had in a purse seven pounds, four shillings, and sixpence, besides farthings, in money and gold. So because I had been buying things for my lady last night, I was resolved to tell my money to see if it was right. Now you must know, because my trunk has a very bad lock, therefore all the money I have, which God knows is a very small stock, I keep in my pocket, tied about my middle, next my smock. So when I went to put up my purse, as God would have it, my smock was unripped, and instead of putting it into my pocket, down it slipped. Then the bell rung, and I went down to put my lady to bed, and God knows I thought my money was as safe as my maidenhead. So when I came up again, I found my pocket feel very light. But when I searched and missed my purse, Lord, I thought I should have sunk outright. Lord, madam, says Mary, how do you do? Indeed, says I, never worse, but pray, Mary, can you tell me what I have done with my purse? Lord, help me, says Mary, I never stirred out of this place. Nay, said I, I had it in Lady Betty's chamber, that's a plain case. So Mary got me to bed and covered up me warm. However, she stole away my garters that I might do myself no harm. So I tumbled and tossed all night, as you may very well think, but hardly ever set my eyes together or slept a wink. So I was a dreamed, methought, that I went and searched the folks round, and in a corner of Mrs. Duke's box, tied in a rag, the money was found. So next morning we told Whittle, and he fell a-swearing. Then my Dame Wadgar came, and she, you know, is thick of hearing. Dame, said I, as loud as I could bawl, do you know what a loss I have had? Nay, says she, my Lord Galway's folks are all very sad, for my Lord Dromedary comes a Tuesday without fail. Pew, said I, but that's not the business that I ail, says Carrie, says he. I have been a servant this five and twenty years come spring, and in all the places I lived I never heard of such a thing. Yes, says the steward, I remember when I was at my Lord Shrewsbury's. Such a thing as this happened just about the time of gooseberries. So I went to the party suspected, and I found her full of grief. Now you must know of all the things in the world I hate a thief. However, I was resolved to bring the discourse slyly about. Mrs. Duke, said I, here's an ugly accident has happened out. Tis not that I value the money three skips of a louse, but the thing I stand upon is the credit of this house. Tis true seven pounds four shillings and sixpence makes a great hole in my wages. Besides, as they say, Service is no inheritance these ages. Now, Mrs. Duke, you know, and everybody understands, that though tis hard to judge, yet money can't go without hands. The devil take me, said she, blessing herself, if ever I sought. So she roared like a bedlam, as though I'd called her all to naught. So, you know, what could I say to her any more? 
I even left her and came away as wise as I was before. Well, but then they would have had me gone to the cunning man. No, said I, tis the same thing. The chaplain will be here anon. So the chaplain came in. Now the servants say he's my sweetheart, because he's always in my chamber, and I always take his part. So as the devil would have it, before I was aware, out I blundered. Parson, said I, can you cast a nativity when a body's plundered? Now you must know he hates to be called parson like the devil. Truly, says he, Mrs. Nab, it might become you to be more civil. If your money be gone, as a learned divine says, do you see? You are no text for my handling, so take that from me. I was never taken for a conjurer before, I'd have you to know. Lord, said I, don't be angry, I'm sure I never thought you so. You know I honour the cloth, I designed to be a parson's wife. I never took one in your coat for a conjurer in all my life. With that he twisted his girdle at me like a rope, as who should say, Now you may go hang yourself for me, and so went away. Well, I thought, I should have swooned. Lord, said I, what shall I do? I have lost my money, and shall lose my true love too. Then my lord called me. Harry, said my lord, don't cry, I'll give you something toward thy loss. And says my lady, so will I. Oh, but I said, what if, after all, the chaplain won't come too? For that, he said, and to please your excellencies, I must petition you. The premises tenderly considered, I desired your excellency's protection, and that I may have a share in next Sunday's collection, and over and above that I may have your excellency's letter, with an order for the chaplain aforesaid, or, instead of him, a better. And then your poor petitioner, both night and day, or the ch Section 9 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Ballad on the Game of Traffic, written at the Castle of Dublin, 1699. My lord, to find out who must deal, delivers cards about. But the first knave does seldom fail to find the doctor out. But then his honor cried, Gadzooks, and seemed to knit his brow, for on a knave he never looks, but he thinks upon Jack Howe. My lady, though she is no player, some bungling partner takes, and wedged in corner of a chair, takes snuff and holds the stakes. Dame Floyd looks out in grave suspense, for pair royals and sequence, but wisely cautions of her pence, the castle seldom frequents. Quoth Harry's fairly putting cases, I'd won it on my word, if I'd had but a pair of aces, and could pick up a third. But Weston has a new cast gown, on Sundays to be fine in, and if she can but win a crown, twill just new dye the lining. With these is Parson Swift. Section 10 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Ballad to the Tune of the Cut Purse, written in August 1702. Once on a time, as old stories rehearse, a friar would need show his talent in Latin, but was sorely put to in the midst of a verse, because he could find no word to come pat in. Then all in the place he left a void space, and so went to bed in a desperate case, when behold the next morning a wonderful riddle, he found it was strangely filled up in the middle. Chorus, let censuring critics then think what they list on it. Who would not write verses with such an assistant? 
This put me the friar into an amazement, for he wisely considered it must be a sprite, that he came through the keyhole or in at the casement, and it needs must be one that could both read and write. Yet he did not know if it were friend or foe, or whether it came from above or below. However it was civil, an angel or elf, for he ne'er could have filled it so well of himself. Chorus, let censuring, etc. Even so Master Doctor had puzzled his brains, in making a ballad but was at a stand, he had mixed little wit with a great deal of pains, when he found a new help from invisible hand. Then good Doctor Swift, pay thanks for the gift, for you freely must own you were at a dead lift. And though some malicious young spirit did do it, Section 11 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Discovery When wise Lord Berkeley first came here, statesmen and mob expected wonders, nor thought to find so great a peer, ere a week past, committing blunders, till on a day cut out by fate, when folks came thick to make their court, out slipped a mystery of state to give the town and country sport now enters bush with new state heirs his lordship's premier minister and who in all profound affairs is held as needful as his clister with head reclining on his shoulder he deals and hears mysterious chat while every ignorant beholder asks of his neighbour who is that with this he put up to my lord the courtiers kept their distance due, he twitched his sleeve and stole a word, then to a corner both withdrew. Imagine now my lord and bush, whispering in junto most profound, like good king Fis and good king Ush, while all the rest stood gaping round. At length a spark not too well bred, a forward face and ear acute, advanced on tiptoe leaned his head to overhear the grand dispute. To learn what northern kings design, or from Whitehall some new express, Papists disarmed or fall of coin, for sure, thought he, it can't be less. My lord, said Bush, a friend and I, disguised in two old threadbare coats, ere morning's dawn stole out to spy how markets went for hay and oats. With that he draws two handfuls out, the one was oats, the other hay, puts this to excellency's snout and begs he would the other way. My lord seems pleased, but still directs, by all means to bring down the rates. Then with a congee circumflex, Bush smiling round on all retreats. Our listener stood a while confused, but gathering spirits, wisely ran for it. Section 12 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Problem That My Lord Berkeley Stinks When He Is In Love Did ever problem thus perplex, or more employ the female sex? So sweet a passion, who would think, Jove ever formed to make a stink? The ladies vow and swear they'll try, whether it be a truth or lie. Love's fire, it seems, like inward heat, works in my lord by stool and sweat, which brings a stink from every pore, and from behind and from before. Yet what is wonderful to tell it, none but the favorite nymph can smell it. But now to solve the natural cause by sober philosophic laws, whether all passions, when in ferment, work out as anger does in vermin. So, when a weasel you torment, you find his passion by his scent. We read of kings who, in a fright, though on a throne, would fall to shite. 
Beside all this, deep scholars know that the main string of Cupid's bow once on a time was an ass gut, now to a nobler office put. By favor or desert preferred, from giving passage to a turd, but still, though fixed among the stars, does sympathize with human arse. Thus, when you feel a hard-bound breach, conclude love's bowstring at full stretch, till the kind looseness comes, and then conclude the bow relaxed again. And now the ladies all are bent to try the great experiment. Ambitious of a regent's heart, spread all their charms to catch a fart. Watching the first unsavory wind, some ply before and some behind. My lord on fire amid the dames, farts like a laurel in the flames. The fair approach, the speaking part, to try the back way to his heart. For as when we a gun discharge, although the bore be none so large, before the flame from muzzle burst, just at the breech it flashes first. So from my lord his passion broke, he farted first, and then he spoke. The ladies vanish in the smother, to confer notes with one another, and now they all agreed to name whom each one thought the happy dame. Quoth Neil, what ere the rest may think, I'm sure twas I that smelt the stink. You smell the stink, by God you lie, quoth Ross, for I'll be sworn twas I. Ladies, quoth Levens, pray forbear, let's not fall out, we all had share. Section 13 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Description of a Salamander, 1705 As mastiff dogs in modern phrase are, called Pompey, Scipio, and Caesar, as pies and daws are often styled, with Christian nicknames, like a child, as we say monsieur to an ape without offence to human shape so men have got from bird and brute names that would best their nature suit the lion eagle fox and boar were heroes titles heretofore bestowed as hieroglyphics fit to show their valour strength or wit for what is understood by fame besides the getting of a name but ere since men invented guns, a different way their fancy runs. To paint a hero, we inquire, for something that will conquer fire. Would you describe Turenne or Trump? Think of a bucket or a pump. But are these too low? Then find out grander. Call my Lord Cuts a salamander. Tis well, but since we live among detractors with an evil tongue, who may object against the term, Pliny shall prove what we affirm. Pliny shall prove, and we'll apply, and I'll be judged by standers by. First, then, our author has defined this reptile of the serpent kind, with gaudy coat and shining train, but loathsome spots his body stain. Out from some hole obscure he flies, when rains descend and tempests rise, till the sun clears the air and then crawls back neglected to his den. So when the war has raised a storm, I've seen a snake in human form, all stained with infamy and vice, leap from the dunghill in a trice, burnish and make a gaudy show, become a general peer and bow, till peace has made the sky serene, then shrink into its hole again. All this we grant, why then look yonder, sure 
that must be a salamander. Further we are, by Pliny told, this serpent is extremely cold, so cold that put it in the fire, twill make the very flames expire. Besides, it spews a filthy froth, whether through rage or lust or both, of matter purulent and white, which, happening on the skin to light, and there corrupting to a wound, spreads leprosy and baldness round. So have I seen a battered bow, by age and claps grown cold as snow, whose breath or touch, where he came, blew out love's torch or chilled the flame. And should some nymph, who ne'er was cruel, like Carlton Cheap or famed Durul, receive the filth which he ejects, she soon would find the same effects, her tainted carcass to pursue as from the salamander's spew, a dismal shedding of her locks, and, if no leprosy, a pox. Section 14 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To Charles Mordaunt, Earl of Peterborough. Mordanto fills the trump of fame, the Christian world his deeds proclaim, and prints are crowded with his name. In journeys he outrides the post, sits up till midnight with his host, talks politics and gives the toast. Knows every prince in Europe's face, flies like a squib from place to place, and travels not but runs a race. From Paris Gazette Alamein, this day arrived without his train, Mordanto in a week from Spain. A messenger comes all a reek, Mordanto at Madrid to seek, he left the town above a week. Next day the postboy winds his horn, and rides through Dover in the morn. Mordanto's landed from Leghorn. Mordanto gallops on alone, the roads are with his followers strewn, this breaks a girth and that a bone, his body active as his mind, returning sound in limb and wind, except some leather lost behind. A skeleton in outward figure, his meagre corpse, though full of vigor, would halt behind him were it bigger. So wonderful is expedition, when you have not the least suspicion, he's with you like an apparition. Shines in all climates like a star, in senates bold and fierce in war, a land commander and a tar. Heroic actions early bred in. Section 15 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On the Union The Queen has lately lost a part of her entirely English heart, for want of which, by way of botch, she pieced it up again with scotch. Blessed revolution which creates divided hearts, united states, See how the double nation lies, like a rich coat with skirts of fries, as if a man in making posies should bundle thistles up with roses. Who ever yet a union saw of kingdoms without faith or law? Henceforward let no statesman dare a kingdom to a ship compare, lest he should call our commonweal a vessel with a double keel, which just like ours, new rigged and manned, and got about a league from land, by change of wind to leeward side, the pilot knew not how to guide. Section 16 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On Mrs. Biddy Floyd, or 
The Receipt to Form a Beauty, 1707. When Cupid did his grandsire Jove entreat to form some beauty by a new receipt, Jove sent and found, far in a country scene, truth, innocence, good nature, look serene. From which ingredients first the dexterous boy picked the demure, the awkward, and the coy, the graces from the court did next provide breeding and wit and air and decent pride. These Venus cleansed from every spurious grain of nice coquet affected pert and vain. Jove mixed Section 17 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Reverse To Swift's Verses on Biddy Floyd, or Mrs. Clud. Venus one day, as story goes, but for what reason no man knows, in sullen mood and grave deport, trudged it away to Jove's high court, and there his godship did entreat to look out for his best receipt, and make a monster strange and odd, abhorred by man and every god. Jove, ever kind to all the fair, nor e'er refused a lady's prayer, straight oped scrutoire, and forth he took a neatly bound and well-gilt book. Sure sign that nothing entered there but what was very choice and rare. Scarce had he turned a page or two, it might be more, for aught I knew, but, be the matter more or less, mong friends twill break no squares, I guess. Then smiling to the dame, quoth he, Here's one will fit you to a T. But, as the writing doth prescribe, tis fit the ingredients we provide, Away he went, and searched the stews, and every street about the mews. Diseases, impudence, and lies are found and brought him in a trice. From hackney then he did provide a clumsy air and awkward pride. From lady's toilet next he brought noise, scandal, and malicious thought. These Jove put in an old clothes stool, and with them mixed the vain, the fool. But now came on his greatest care, of what he should his paste prepare. For common clay or finer mould was much too good such stuff to hold. At last he wisely thought on mud, so raised it up and called it clud. Section 18 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Apollo Outwitted To the Honorable Mrs. Finch, under her name of Ardelia Phoebus, now shortening every shade, up to the northern tropic came, and thence beheld a lovely maid attending on a royal dame. The god laid down his feeble rays, then lighted from his glittering coach, but fenced his head with his own bays, before he durst the nymph approach. Under those sacred leaves secure, from common lightning of the skies, he fondly thought he might endure the flashes of Ardelia's eyes. The nymph, who oft had read in books, of that bright god whom bards invoke, soon knew Apollo by his looks and guessed his business ere he spoke. He, in the old celestial cant, confessed his flame and swore by sticks, what e'er she would desire to grant, but wise Ardelia knew his tricks. Ovid had warned her to beware of strolling gods whose usual trade is, under pretense of taking air, to pick up sublunary ladies. Howe'er she gave no flat denial, as having malice in her heart, and was resolved upon a trial to cheat the god in his own art. Hear my request, 
the virgin said, let which I please of all the nine attend whene'er I want their aid, obey my call and only mine. By vow obliged, by passion led, the god could not refuse her prayer. He waved his wreath thrice o'er her head, thrice muttered something to the air. And now he thought to seize his due, but she the charm already tried. Thalia heard the call and flew to wait at bright Ardelia's side. On sight of this celestial prude, Apollo thought it vain to stay, nor in her presence durst be rude, but made his leg and went away. He hoped to find some lucky hour when on their queen the muses wait, but Pallas owns Ardelia's power, for vows divine are kept by fate. Then, full of rage, Apollo spoke, Deceitful nymph, I see thy art, and though I can't my gift revoke, I'll disappoint its nobler part. Let stubborn pride possess thee long, and be thou negligent of fame, with every muse to grace thy song, mayst thou despise a poet's name. Of modest poets be thou first, to silent shades repeat thy verse, till fame and echo almost burst, yet hardly dare one line rehearse. And last my vengeance to complete, may you descend to take renown. Section 19 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Answer to Lines from Mayfair Now first published In pity to the emptying town Some god Mayfair invented When nature would invite us down To be by art prevented. What a corrupted taste is ours When milkmaids in mock state Instead of garlands made of flowers Adorn their pails with plate. So are the joys which nature yields, inverted in Mayfair. In painted cloth we look for fields, and step in booths for air. Here a dog dancing on his hams, and puppets moved by wire, do far exceed your frisking lambs, or song of feathered choir. Howe'er such verse as yours I grant would be Section 20 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Van Brew's House, built from the ruins of Whitehall that was burnt, 1703. Earlier Version In times of old, when time was young, and poets their own verses sung, a verse would draw a stone or beam that now would overload a team lead him a dance of many a mile, then rear him to a goodly pile. Each number had its different power. Heroic strains could build a tower. Sonnets and elegies to Chloris might raise a house about two stories. A lyric ode would slate a catch, would tile an epigram, would thatch. Now poets feel this art is lost, both to their own and landlord's cost. Not one of all the tuneful throng can hire a lodging for a song. For Jove considered well the case that poets were a numerous race, and if they all had power to build, the earth would very soon be filled. Materials would be quickly spent, and houses would not give a rent. The god of wealth was therefore made sole patron of the building trade leaving to wits the spacious air, with license to build castles there. In right whereof their old pretense to lodge in garrets comes from thence. There is a worm by Phoebus bred, by leaves of mulberry is fed, which unprovided where to dwell, conforms itself to weave a cell. 
Then curious hands this texture take, And for themselves fine garments make. Meantime a pair of awkward things Grow to his back instead of wings. He flutters when he thinks he flies, Then sheds about his spawn and dies. Just such an insect of the age Is he that scribbles for the stage. His birth he does from Phoebus raise, And feeds upon imagined bays, Throws all his wit and hours away In twisting up an ill-spun play. This gives him lodging and provides A stock of tawdry shift besides, With the unravelled shreds of which The underwits adorn their speech. And now he spreads his little fawns, For all the muses' geese are swans, And born on fancy's pinion thinks He soars sublimest when he sinks. But scattering round his fly-blows dies, Whence broods of insect poets rise. Premising thus, in modern way, The greater part I have to say, Sing, muse, the house of poet Van, In higher strain than we began. Van, for tis fit the reader know it, Is both a herald and a poet. No wonder, then, if nicely skilled In each capacity to build, As herald he can in a day Repair a house gone to decay, Or, by achievement's arms device, Erect a new one in a trice. And poets, if they had their due, By ancient right, are builders too. This made him to Apollo pray For leave to build the poet's way. His prayer was granted for the god, consented with the usual nod. After hard throes of many a day, Van was delivered of a play, which in due time brought forth a house, just as the mountain did the mouse. One story high, one postern door, and one small chamber on a floor. Born like a phoenix from the flame, but neither bulk nor shape the same, as animals of largest size corrupt to maggots, worms, and flies. A type of modern wit and style, the rubbish of an ancient pile. So chemists boast they have a power, from the dead ashes of a flower, some faint resemblance to produce, but not the virtue, taste, nor juice. So modern rhymers strive to blast the poetry of age. Section 21 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Van Brew's House, built from the ruins of Whitehall that was burnt, 1703. Later Version In times of old, when time was young, and poets their own verses sung, a verse would draw a stone or beam that now would overload a team. Lead him a dance of many a mile, then rear him to a goodly pile. Each number had its different power. Heroic strains could build a tower. Sonnets or elegies to Chloris might raise a house about two stories. A lyric ode would slate, a catch would tile, an epigram would thatch. But to their own or landlord's cost, now poets feel this art is lost. Not one of all our tuneful throng Can raise a lodging for a song. For Jove considered well the case, Observed they grew a numerous race, And should they build as fast as right, T'would ruin undertakers quite. This evil, therefore, to prevent, He wisely changed their element. On earth the god of wealth was made, Sole patron of the building trade. Leaving the wits the spacious air, with license to build castles there, and tis conceived their old pretense to lodge in garrets comes from thence. Premising thus in modern way, the better half we have to say, sing muse the house of poet Van, in higher strains than we began. Van, for tis fit the reader know it, is both a herald and a poet. No wonder then if nicely skilled in both capacities to build. As herald he can, in a day, repair a house gone to decay, or, by achievement's arms device, 
erect a new one in a trice. And as a poet he has skill to build in speculation still. Great Jove, he cried, the art restore, to build by verse as heretofore, and make my muse the architect, what palaces shall we erect? No longer shall forsaken Thames lament his old white hall in flames. A pile shall from its ashes rise, fit to invade or prop the skies. Jove smiled, and, like a gentle god, consenting with the usual nod, told Van he knew his talent best, and left the choice to his own breast. So Van resolved to write a farce, but, well perceiving wit was scarce, with cunning that defect supplies, takes a French play as lawful prize, steals thence his plot and every joke, not once suspecting Jove would smoke, and, like a wag set down to write, would whisper to himself a bite. Then from his motley mingled style proceeded to erect his pile. So men of old, to gain renown, did build Babel with their tongues confounded. Jove saw the cheat, but thought it best to turn the matter to a jest. Down from Olympus's top he slides, laughing as if he'd burst his sides. I thought the god are these your tricks, why then old plays deserve old bricks, and since you're sparing of your stuff, your building shall be small enough. He spake and grudging lent his aid, the experienced bricks that knew their trade, as being bricks at second hand, now move and now in order stand. The building, as the poet writ, rose in proportion to his wit, and first the prologue built a wall, so wide as to encompass all. The scene a wood produced no more than a few scrubby trees before. The plot as yet lay deep, and so a cellar next was dug below. But this a work so hard was found, two acts it cost him underground. Two other acts, we may presume, were spent in building each a room. Thus far advanced he made a shift to raise a roof with act the fifth. The epilogue behind did frame a place not decent here to name. Now poets from all quarters ran to see the house of Brother Van, looked high and low, walked often round, but no such house was to be found. One asks the watermen hard by, where may the poet's palace lie? Another of the Thames inquires if he has seen its gilded spires. At length they in the rubbish spy a thing resembling a goose pie. Thither in haste the poets throng, and gaze in silent wonder long, till one in raptures thus began to praise the pile and builder van. Thrice happy poet, who mayest trail thy house about thee like a snail, or harnessed to a nag at A's, take journeys in it like a chaise or in a boat, whene'er thou wilt, canst make it serve thee for a tilt. Capacious house, tis owned by all, thou art well contrived, though thou art small. For every wit in Britain's isle may lodge within thy spacious pile. Like Bacchus thou, as poets feign, thy mother burnt art born again. Born like a phoenix from the flame, but neither bulk nor shape the same, as animals of largest size corrupt to maggots, worms, and flies, a type of modern wit and style, the rubbish of an ancient pile. So chemists boast they have a power, from the dead ashes of a flower, some faint resemblance to produce, but not the virtue, taste, or juice. So modern rhymers wisely blast the poetry of ages past, Section 22 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bacchus and Philemon On the ever-lamented loss of the two yew-trees in the parish of Chilthorne, Somerset, 1706. Imitated from the Eighth Book of Ovid. Original Version 
In ancient time, as story tells, the saints would often leave their cells and stroll about but hide their quality to try good people's hospitality. It happened on a winter's night, as authors of the legend write, to brother hermits, saints by trade, taking their tour in masquerade, came to a village hard by Rixham, ragged and not a groat betwixt them. It rained as hard as it could pour, yet they were forced to walk an hour, from house to house wet to the skin, before one soul would let him in. They'd called at every door, good people, my comrade's blind, and I'm a creeple. Here we lie starving in the street, t'would grieve a body's heart to see't. No Christian would turn out a beast, in such a dreadful night at least. Give us but straw, and let us lie, in yonder barn to keep us dry. Thus in the stroller's usual cant, they begged relief which none would grant. No creature valued what they said, one family was gone to bed. The master bawled out half asleep, You fellows, what a noise you keep! So many beggars pass this way, we can't be quiet night nor day. We cannot serve you every one. Pray take your answer and be gone. One swore he'd send em to the stocks, a third could not forbear his mocks, but bawled as loud as he could roar, you're on the wrong side of the door. One surly clown looked out and said, I'll fling the piss-pot on your head. You shan't come here nor get a souse. You look like rogues would rob a house. Can't you go work or serve the king, you blind and lame? Tis no such thing. That's but a counterfeit sore leg. For shame, two sturdy rascals beg. If I come down, I'll spoil your trick, and cure you both with a good stick. Our wandering saints in woeful state, treated at this ungodly rate, having through all the village passed, to a small cottage came at last, where dwelt a good old honest yeoman, called thereabout good man Philemon, who kindly did the saints invite, in his poor house to pass the night. And then the hospitable sire bid goody Bacchus mend the fire, whilst he from out the chimney took a flitch of bacon off the hook, and freely from the fattest side cut out large slices to be fried, which tossed up in a pan with batter and served up in an earthen platter, quoth Bacchus, This is wholesome fare, eat, honest friends, and never spare. And if we find our victuals fail, we can but make it out in ale. To a small kilderkin of beer, brewed for the good time of the year, Philemon, by his wife's consent, stepped with a jug and made a vent, and having filled it to the brink, invited both the saints to drink. When they had took a second draught, behold, a miracle was wrought, for Bacchus with amazement found, although the jug had twice gone round, it still was full up to the top, as they never had drunk a drop. You may be sure so strange a sight put the old people in a fright. Philemon whispered to his wife, These men are saints, I'll lay my life. The strangers overheard and said, You're in the right, but beant afraid. No hurt shall come to you or yours, but for that pack of churlish boors, not fit to live on Christian ground, they and their village shall be drowned. Whilst you shall see your cottage rise, and grow a church before your eyes. Scarce had they spoke when fair and soft the roof began to mount aloft. Aloft rose every beam and rafter, the heavy wall went clambering after. The chimney widened and grew higher, became a steeple with a spire. The kettle to the top was hoist, and there stood fastened to a joist, but with the upside down to show its inclination for below, in vain for a superior force applied at bottom stops its course, doomed ever in suspense to dwell, tis now no kettle, but a bell. 
The wooden jack, which had almost Lost by disuse the art to roast, A sudden alteration feels, Increased by new intestine wheels. But what adds to the wonder more, The number made the motion slower. The flyer, although it had leaden feet, Would turn so quick you scarce could see it. But now stopped by some hidden powers, Moves round but twice in twice twelve hours. While in the station of a jack, T'was never known to turn its back. A friend in turns and windings tried, Nor ever left the chimney's side. The chimney to a steeple grown, The jack would not be left alone, But up against the steeple reared, Became a clock, and still adhered. And still its love to household cares, By a shrill voice at noon declares, Warning the cook made not to burn That roast meat which it cannot turn. The groaning chair began to crawl, Like a huge insect up the wall, There stuck and to a pulpit grew, But kept its matter and its hue, And mindful of its ancient state, Still groans while tattling gossip's prate. The mortar only changed its name, In its old shape a font became. The porringers that in a row Hung high and made a glittering show, To a less noble substance changed, were now but leathern buckets ranged. The ballads pasted on the wall Of Chevy Chase and English Mall, Fair Rosamond and Robin Hood, The little children in the wood, Enlarged in picture, size, and letter, And painted looked abundance better. And now the heraldry describe Of a church warden or a tribe, A bedstead of the antique mode, Composed of timber many a load, such as our grandfathers did use, was metamorphosed into pews, which yet their former virtue keep by lodging folk disposed to sleep. The cottage with such feats as these, grown to a church by just degrees, the holy men desired their host to ask for what he fancied most. Philemon, having paused a while, replied in complimental style, your goodness more than my desert makes you take all things in good part. You've raised a church here in a minute, and I would fain continue in it. I'm good for little at my days. Make me the parson, if you please. He spoke, and presently he feels his grazier's coat reach down his heels, the sleeves new bordered with a list, widened and gathered at his wrist but being old continued just as threadbare and as full of dust a shambling awkward gait he took with a demure dejected look talked of his offerings tithes and dues could smoke and drink and read the news or sell a goose at the next town decently hid beneath his gown contrived to preach old sermons next changed in the preface and the text at christenings well could act his part and had the service all by heart. Wished women might have children fast, and thought whose sow had farrowed last. Against dissenters would repine, and stood up firm for right divine. Carried it to his equals higher, but most obedient to the squire. Found his head filled with many a system, but classic authors he near missed him. Thus having furbished up a parson, Dame Bacchus next they played their farce on. Instead of homespun coifs were seen, Good pinners edged with culvertine. Her petticoat, transformed apace, Became black satin flounced with lace. Plain goody would no longer down, T'was madam in her grogram gown. Philemon was in great surprise, And hardly could believe his eyes, Amazed to see her look so prim, and she admired as much as him. Thus happy in their change of life were several years this man and wife, when on a day which proved their last, discoursing o'er old stories past, they went by chance amidst their talk to the churchyard to take a walk. When Bacchus hastily cried out, My dear, I see your forehead sprout. Sprout? quoth the man. What's this you tell us? I hope you don't believe me jealous, but yet methinks I feel it true, and really yours is budding too. Nay, 
Now I cannot stir my foot, It feels as if twere taking root. Description would but tire my muse, In short, they both were turned to use. Old Goodman Dobson of the Green, Remembers he the trees has seen, He'll talk of them from noon till night, And goes with folk to show the sight. On Sundays, after evening prayer, He gathers all the parish there, Points out the place of either you, Here Bacchus, there Philemon grew, Till once a parson of our town, To mend his barn, cut Bacchus down, At which tis hard to be believed, How much the other tree was grieved, Grew scrubby, died a top, was stunted, So the next parson Section 23 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bacchus and Philemon on the ever-lamented loss of the two yew-trees in the parish of Chilthorne, Somerset, 1706. Imitated from the Eighth Book of Ovid. Later Version In ancient times, as story tells, the saints would often leave their cells, and stroll about, but hide their quality, to try good people's hospitality. It happened on a winter's night, as authors of the legend write, two brother hermits, saints by trade, taking their tour in masquerade, disguised in tattered habits went, to a small village down in Kent where, in the stroller's canting strain, they begged from door to door in vain, tried every tone might pity win, but not a soul would let them in. Our wandering saints in woeful state, treated at this ungodly rate, having through all the village passed, to a small cottage came at last, where dwelt a good old honest yeoman, called in the neighbourhood Philemon who kindly did these saints invite in his poor hut to pass the night. And then the hospitable sire bid goody Bacchus mend the fire, while he from out the chimney took a flitch of bacon off the hook, and freely from the fattest side cut out large slices to be fried, then stepped aside to fetch him drink, filled a large jug up to the brink, and saw it fairly twice go round, yet what was wonderful they found twas still replenished to the top as if they ne'er had touched a drop the good old couple were amazed and often on each other gazed for both were frightened to the heart and just began to cry what art then softly turned aside to view whether the lights were burning blue the gentle pilgrims soon aware on told them their calling and their errand. Good folk, you need not be afraid, we are but saints, the hermit said. No hurt shall come to you or yours, but for that pack of churlish boors not fit to live on Christian ground, they and their houses shall be drowned, while you shall see your cottage rise and grow a church before your eyes. They scarce had spoke when fair and soft the roof began to mount aloft. Aloft rose every beam and rafter. The heavy wall climbed slowly after. The chimney widened and grew higher, became a steeple with a spire. The kettle to the top was hoist, and there stood fastened to a joist. But with the upside down to show its inclination for below, in vain for a superior force applied at bottom stops its course, doomed ever in suspense to dwell, tis now no kettle but a bell. A wooden jack, which had almost lost by disuse the art to roast, a sudden alteration feels, increased by new intestine wheels. And, what exalts the wonder more, the number made the motion slower. The flyer, though it had leaden feet, turned round so quick you scarce could see it. 
but slackened by some secret power, now hardly moves an inch an hour. The jack and chimney near allied had never left each other's side. The chimney to a steeple grown, the jack would not be left alone. But up against the steeple reared became a clock and still adhered, and still its love to household cares by a shrill voice at noon declares, warning the cook made not to burn that roast meat which it cannot turn. The groaning chair began to crawl, like a huge snail half up the wall. There stuck aloft in public view, and with small change a pulpit grew. The porringers that in a row hung high and made a glittering show, to a less noble substance changed, were now but leathern buckets ranged. The ballads pasted on the wall, of Joan of France and English Mall, Fair Rosamond and Robin Hood, the little children in the wood, now seemed to look abundance better, improved in picture, size, and letter. And, high in ordered place to describe, the heraldry of every tribe, a bedstead of the antique mode, compact of timber many a load, such as our ancestors did use, was metamorphosed into pews, which still their ancient nature keep, by lodging folk disposed to sleep. The cottage by such feats as these, grown to a church by just degrees, the hermits then desired their host to ask for what he fancied most. Philemon, having paused a while, returned them thanks in homely style, then said, My house is grown so fine, methinks I still would call it mine. I'm old, and fain would live at ease. Make me the parson, if you please. He spoke, and presently he feels his grazier's coat fall down his heels. He sees, yet hardly can believe, about each arm a pudding sleeve. His waistcoat to a cassock grew, and both assumed a sable hue. But being old, continued just, as threadbare and as full of dust. His talk was now of tithes and dues, could smoke his pipe and read the news, knew how to preach old sermons next, vamped in the preface and the text, at christenings well could act his part, and had the service all by heart, wished women might have children fast, and thought whose sow had farrowed last, against dissenters would repine, and stood up firm for right divine, found his head filled with many a system, but classic authors he ne'er missed him. Thus having furbished up a parson, Dame Bacchus next they played their farce on. Instead of homespun coifs were seen, good pinners edged with colbertine. Her petticoat transformed apace, became black satin flounced with lace. Plain goody would no longer down, t'was madam in her grogram gown. Philemon was in great surprise, and hardly could believe his eyes, amazed to see her look so prim, and she admired as much as him. Thus happy in their change of life were several years this man and wife, when on a day which proved their last, discoursing o'er old stories past, they went by chance amidst their talk to the churchyard to take a walk when Bacchus hastily cried out, My dear, I see your forehead sprout. Sprout, quoth the man, what's this you tell us? I hope you don't believe me jealous. But yet methinks I feel it true, and really yours is budding too. Nay, now I cannot stir my foot. It feels as if t'were taking root. Description would but tire my muse. In short, they both were turned to use. Old Goodman Dobson of the Green Remembers he the trees has seen. He'll talk of them from noon till night, And goes with folk to show the sight. On Sundays, after evening prayer, He gathers all the parish there, Points out the place of either you. Here Bacchus, there Philemon grew till once a parson of our town, to mend his barn, cut Bacchus down. At which tis hard to be believed how much the other tree was grieved.
Section 24 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The History of Van Brew's House, 1708 When Mother Clud had rose from play, and called to take the cards away, Van saw, but seemed not to regard, how Miss picked every painted card and busy both with hand and eye, soon reared a house two stories high. Van's genius, without thought or lecture, is hugely turned to architecture. He viewed the edifice and smiled, vowed it was pretty for a child. It was so perfect in its kind, he kept the model in his mind. But when he found the boys at play, and saw them dabbling in their clay, he stood behind a stall to lurk, and mark the progress of their work. With true delight observed them all, raking up mud to build a wall. The plan he much admired, and took the model in his table-book, thought himself now exactly skilled, and so resolved a house to build. A real house with rooms and stairs, five times at least as big as theirs, taller than Mrs. by two yards, not a sham thing of play or cards. And so he did, for, in a while, he built up such a monstrous pile that no two chairmen could be found able to lift it from the ground. Still at Whitehall it stands in view, just in the place where first it grew. There all the little schoolboys run, envying to see themselves outdone. From such deep rudiments as these, Van is become, by due degrees, for building famed and justly reckoned at court Vitruvius the second. No wonder, since wise authors show, that best foundations must be low, and now the duke has wisely taken him to be his architect at Blenheim. But raillery at once depart, if this rule holds in every art, or if his grace were no more skilled in the art of battering walls, Section 25 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Grub Street Elegy on the Supposed Death of Partridge the Almanac Maker, 1708. Well, tis as Bickerstaff has guessed, though we all took it for a jest, Partridge is dead, nay, more, he died, ere he could prove the good squire lied. Strange an astrologer should die, without one wonder in the sky, not one of all his crony stirs to pay their duty at his hearse. No meteor, no eclipse appeared, no comet with a flaming beard. The sun hath rose and gone to bed, just as if Partridge were not dead, nor hid himself behind the moon to make a dreadful night at noon. He at fit periods walks through Aries, however our earthly motion varies, and twice a year he'll cut the equator as if there had been no such matter. Some wits have wondered what analogy there is twixt cobbling and astrology, how Partridge made his optics rise from a shoe sole to reach the skies, a list the cobbler's temple's ties to keep the hair out of his eyes. From whence tis plain the diadem that princes wear derives from them, and therefore crowns are nowadays adorned with golden stars and rays, which plainly shows the near alliance twixt cobbling and the planet's science. Besides that slow-paced sign Bootes, as tis miscalled, we know not who tis, but Partridge ended all disputes, he knew his trade and called it boots. The horned moon, which heretofore upon their shoes the Romans wore, whose wideness kept their toes from corns, and whence we claim our shoeing horns, shows how the art of cobbling bears a near resemblance to the spheres. A scrap of parchment hung by geometry, a great refiner in barometry, can like the stars foretell the weather, and what is parchment else but leather? which an astrologer might use either for almanacs or shoes. 
Thus Partridge, by his wit and parts, at once did practice both these arts. And as the boding owl, or rather, the bat because her wings are leather, steals from her private cell by night, and flies about the candlelight, so learned Partridge could as well creep in the dark from leathern cell, and in his fancy fly as far to peep upon a twinkling star. Besides, he could confound the spheres, and set the planets by the ears. To show his skill he Mars could jine, to Venus in aspect malign, then call in Mercury for aid, and cure the wounds that Venus made. Great scholars have in Lucian read, when Philip king of Greece was dead, his soul and spirit did divide, and each part took a different side. One rose a star, the other fell, beneath and mended shoes in hell. Thus Partridge still shines in each art, the cobbling and star-gazing part, and is installed as good a star as any of the Caesars are. Triumphant star, some pity show, on cobbler's militant below, whom roguish boys in stormy nights torment by pissing out their lights, or through a chink convey their smoke, enclosed artificers to choke. Though high exalted in thy sphere, mayst follow still thy calling there, to thee the bull will lend his hide, by Phoebus newly tanned and dried. For thee they Argo's hulk will tax, and scrape her pitchy sides for wax. Then Ariadne kindly lends her braided hair to make thee ends. The points of Sagittarius's dart turns to an all by heavenly art, and Vulcan, wheedled by his wife, will forge for thee a paring knife. For want of room by Virgo's side, she'll strain a point and sit astride. To take the Section 26 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Epitaph Here five feet deep lies on his back a cobbler, starmonger, and quack, who to the stars in pure good will does to his best look upward still. Weep, all you customers that use, his pills, his almanacs, or shoes, and you that did your fortunes seek, step to his grave but once a week. This earth, which bears his body's print, you'll find has so much virtue in't, that I durst pawn my ears, twill tell, what ear concerns you full as well. Section 27 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Description of the Morning Written in April 1709 and first printed in The Tatler Now hardly here and there an hackney coach Appearing showed the ruddy morn's approach Now Betty from her master's bed had flown And softly stole to discompose her own the slipshod prentice from his master's door had pared the dirt and sprinkled round the floor. Now Moll had whirled her mop with dexterous airs, prepared to scrub the entry and the stairs. The youth with broomy stumps began to trace the kennel's edge where wheels had worn the place. The small coal man was heard with cadence deep, till drowned in shriller notes of chimney sweep. Duns at his lordship's gate began to meet and brick-dust mole had screamed through half the street. The turnkey now his flock returning sees, duly let out a night's to steal for fees. The watchful bailiff's t Section 28 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A description of a city shower, written in October 1710, and first printed in The Tatler, number 238. Careful observers may foretell the hour, by sure prognostics, when to dread a shower. While rain depends, the pensive cat gives o'er, her frolics and pursues her tail no more. Returning home at night, you'll find the sink. Strike your offended sense with double stink. If you be wise, then, go not far to dine. You'll spend in coach hire more than save in wine. A coming shower your shooting corns presage. Old age has throb, your hollow tooth will rage. Sauntering in coffee-house is dullman seen. He damns the climate and complains of spleen. Meanwhile in the south, rising with dabbled wings, A sable cloud athwart the welkin flings, That swilled more liquor than it could contain, And like a drunkard gives it up again. Brisk Susan whips her linen from the rope, While the first drizzling shower is borne aslope. Such is that sprinkling which some careless queen Flirts on you from her mop, but not so clean. You fly, invoke the gods, then, turning, stop. To rail she singing still, whirls on her mop. Not yet the dust had shunned the unequal strife, But aided by the wind, fought still for life. And wafted with its foe by violent gust, T'was doubtful which was rain and which was dust. Ah, where must needy poet seek for aid, When dust and rain at once his coat invade? Sole coat where dust, cemented by the rain, Erects the nap and leaves a cloudy stain. Now in contiguous drops the flood comes down, Threatening with deluge this devoted town. To shops in crowds the daggled females fly, Pretend to cheapen goods, but nothing by. The Templar spruce, while every spout's a brooch, Stays tilt his fair, yet seems to call a coach. The tucked-up sempstress walks with hasty strides, While streams run down her oiled umbrella's sides. Here various kinds, by various fortunes led, Commence acquaintance underneath a shed. Triumphant Tories and desponding Whigs Forget their feuds, and join to save their wigs. Boxed in a chair, the bow impatient sits, While sprouts run clattering o'er the roof by fits. And ever and anon, with frightful din, The leather sounds he trembles from within. So when Troy chairman bore the wooden steed, Pregnant with Greeks, impatient to be freed, those bully Greeks, who, as the moderns do, Instead of paying chairmen, ran them through. Laocoon struck thee outside with his spear, And each imprisoned hero quaked for fear. Now from all parts the swelling kennels flow, And bear their trophies with them as they go. Filth of all hues and odor seem to tell What street they sailed from, by their sight and smell. They, as each torrent drives with rapid force, From Smithfield to St. Polkers, shape their course. And in huge confluence joined at Snowhall Ridge, Fall from the conduit prone to Holborn Bridge, Sweeping from butchers' stalls, dung guts and blood, Drowned puppies' stinking sprats, Section 29 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On the Little House by the Churchyard of Castlenock, 1710. Whoever pleases to inquire why yonder steeple wants a spire, the gray old fellow, Poet Joe, the philosophic cause will show. 
Once on a time a western blast, at least twelve inches overcast, reckoning roof, weather, cock and all, which came with a prodigious fall, and tumbling topsy-turvy round, lit with its bottom on the ground, for by the laws of gravitation it fell into its proper station. This is the little strutting pile you see just by the churchyard style. The walls in tumbling gave a knock, and thus the steeple got a shock, from whence the neighboring farmer calls the steeple knock the vicar walls. The vicar once a week creeps in, sits with his knees up to his chin, here cons his notes and takes a wet, till the small ragged flock is met. A traveller who by did pass, observed the roof behind the grass, on tiptoe stood and reared his snout, and saw the parson creeping out, was much surprised to see a crow venture to build his nest so low. A schoolboy ran unto it and thought, the crib was down, the blackbird caught. A third who lost his way by night was forced for safety to alight, and stepping o'er the fabric roof, his horse had like to spoil his hoof. Warburton took it in his noodle, this building was designed a model, or of a pigeon house or oven, to bake one loaf or keep one dove in. Then Mrs. Johnson gave her verdict, and every one was pleased that heard it. All that you make this stir about is but a still which wants a spout. The Reverend Dr. Raymond guessed, more probably than all the rest, he said but that it wanted room, it might have been a pygmy's tomb. The doctor's family came by, and little miss began to cry, Give me that house in my own hand. Then madam bade the chariot stand, called to the clerk in manner mild, Pray, reach that thing here to the child. That thing, I mean, among the kale, and here's to buy a pot of ale. The clerk said to her in a heat, What, sell my master's country seat? Where he comes every week from town, he would not sell it for a crown. Pa fellow, keep not such a pother, in half an hour thou'lt make another. Says Nancy, I can make for miss a finer house ten times than this. Section 30 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Town Eclogue, 1710. Scene, the Royal Exchange. Corydon. Now the keen rigor of the winter's o'er, No hail descends, and frost can pitch no more, While other girls confess the genial spring, and laugh aloud, or amorous ditties sing, secure from cold their lovely necks display, and throw each useless chafing dish away. Why sits my fill this discontented here, nor feels the turn of the revolving year? Why on that brow dwell sorrow and dismay, where loves were wont to sport and smiles to play? Phyllis I corry den, survey the change around. Through all the change, no wretch like me is found. Alas, the day when I, poor heedless maid, was to your rooms in Lincoln's Inn betrayed. Then how you swore, how many vows you made, ye listening zephyrs that o'erheard his love, waft the soft act sense to the gods above alas the day for o oh, eternal shame i sold you handkerchiefs and lost my fame corydon when i forget the favour you bestowed red herrings shall be spawned in tyburn road fleet street transformed become a flowery green and mass be sung where operas are seen. The wealthy sit, 
and the St. James bow, Shall change their quarters and their joys forgo. Stock jobbing this to Jonathan's shall come, At the groom porters that play off his plum. Phyllis But what to me does all that love avail, If while I doze at home or porter's ale, each night with wine and wenches you regale. My live-long hours in anxious cares are paced, And raging hunger lays my beauty waste. On Templar spruce in vain I glances throw, And with shrill voice invite them as they go. Exposed in vain my glossy ribbons shine, and unregarded wave upon the twine. The week flies round, and when my profit's known, I hardly clear enough to change a crown. Corydon. Hard fate of virtue thus to be distressed, Thou fairest of thy trade and far the best. As fruitman stalls the summer market grace, And ruddy peat them at first in place plum cake is seen or smaller pastry ware and ice on that so phyllis does appear in playhouse and in park above the rest of bells mechanic elegantly dressed phyllis and yet crepundia that conceited fair amid her toys affects a saucy air and views me hourly with this scornful eye, Corydon, she might as well with bright Cleora vie. Phyllis, with this large petticoat I strive in vain to hide my folly past and coming pain. Tis now no secret she and fifty more observe the symptoms I had once before. A second babe at Wapping must be placed, When I scarce bear the charges of the laced. Corydon, what I could raise, I send a pound of plums, Five shillings and a coral for his gums. Tomorrow I intend him something more. Phyllis, I sent a frock and pair of shoes before. Corydon, However you shall home with me to-night, Forget your cares and revel in delight. I have in store a pint or two of wine, Some cracknels and the remnant of a chine. And now on either side and all around The weighty shop boards fall and bars resound. Each ready semps. Section 31 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Conference Between Sir Harry Pierce's Chariot and Mrs. D. Stopford's Chair Chariot My pretty dear cuz, though I've roved the town o'er, To dispatch in an hour some visits a score, Though since first on the wheels I've been every day, at the change, at a raffling, at church, or a play, And the fops of the town are pleased with the notion Of calling your slave the perpetual motion, Though oft at your door I've whined out my love, As my knight does grin his at your lady above. Yet near before this, though I used all my care, I ere was so happy to meet my dear chair. And since we're so near, like birds of a feather, let's e'en, as they say, set our horses together. Chair. By your awkward address, you're that thing which should carry, with one footman behind, our lover Sir Harry. By your language, I judge, you think me a wench. He that makes love to me must make it in French. Thou that's drawn by two beasts, and carriest a brute, 
Canst thou vainly ere hope I'll answer thy suit? Though sometimes you pretend to appear with your six, No regard to their colour, their sexes you mix. Then on the grand paw you'd look very great, With your new-fashioned glasses and nasty old seat. Thus a bow I have seen strut with a cocked hat, And newly rigged out with a dirty cravat. You may think that you make a figure most shining, But it's plain that you have an old cloak for a lining. Are those double gilt nails? Where's the lustre of carry? To set off the knight and to finish the jerry. If you hope I'll be kind, you must tell me what's due. In George's lane for you, ere I'll buckle too. Chariot. Why, how now, doll diamond, you're very alert. Is it your French breeding has made you so pert? Because I was civil, here's a stir with a pox. Who is it that values your, or your fox? Sure tis to her honour he ever should bed, His bloody red hand to her bloody red head. You're proud of your gilding, but I tell you each nail Is only just tinged with a rub at her tail. And although it may pass for gold on a ninny, Sure we know a bath shilling soon from a guinea. Nay, her foretop's a cheat, each morn does she black it, Yet ere it be night, it's the same with her placket. I'll ne'er be run down any more with your cant, Your velvet was wore before in a mant. On the back of her mother, but now tis much duller, The fire she carries hath changed its colour. Those creatures that draw me you never would mind, If you'd but look on your own, Pharaoh's lean kine. They're taken for spectres, they're so meagre and spare, Drawn damnably low by your sorrel mare. We know how your lady was on you befriended, You're not to be paid for till the lawsuit is ended. But her bond it is good, he need not to doubt, She is two or three years above being out. Could my knight be advised, he should... Section 32 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To Lord Harley on his marriage, October 31st, 1713. Among the numbers who employ their tongues and pens to give you joy, dear Harley, generous youth, admit, what friendship dictates more than wit? Forgive me when I fondly thought by frequent observations taught, a spirit so informed as yours could never prosper in amours. The god of wit and light and arts, with all acquired and natural parts, whose harp could savage beasts enchant, was an unfortunate gallant. Had Bacchus after Daphne reeled, the nymph had soon been brought to yield, or had embroidered Mars pursued, the nymph would dear have been a prude. Ten thousand footsteps, full in view, Mark out the way where Daphne flew. For such is all the sex's flight, They fly from learning, wit, and light. They fly, and none can overtake, But some gay coxcomb or a rake. How then, dear Harley, could I guess That you should meet, in love, success? For if those ancient tales be true, Phoebus was beautiful as you, yet Daphne never slacked her pace, for wit and learning spoiled his face. And since the same resemblance held, in gifts wherein you both excelled, I fancied every nymph would run from you as from Latona's son. Then where, said I, shall Harley find a virgin of superior mind, with wit and virtue to discover, and pay the merit of her lover? This character shall Candish claim, born to retrieve her sex's fame, the chief among the glittering crowd, of titles, birth, and fortune proud. As fools are insolent and vain, madly aspire to wear her chain. But Pallas guardian of the maid, descending to her charge's aid, held out Medusa's snaky locks, which stupefied them all to stocks. 
The nymph with indignation viewed, The dull, the noisy, and the lewd. For Pallas, with celestial light, Had purified her mortal sight, Showed her the virtues all combined, Fresh blooming in young Harley's mind. Terrestrial nymphs by formal arts Display their various nets for hearts, their looks are all by method set, when to be prude and when coquette. Yet wanting skill and power to choose, their only pride is to refuse. But when a goddess would bestow her love on some bright youth below, round all the earth she casts her eyes, and then, descending from the skies, makes choice of him she fancies best, and bids the ravished youth be blessed. Thus the bright empress of the morn Chose for her spouse a mortal born. The goddess made advances first, Else what aspiring hero durst? Though like a virgin of fifteen, She blushes when by mortal seen, Still blushes and with speed retires, When soul pursues her with his fires. Diana thus, heaven's chastest queen, Struck with Endymion's graceful mien, Down from her silver chariot came, and to the shepherd owned her flame. Thus Cayandish as Aurora bright, and chaster than the queen of night, Section 33 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Phyllis, or the Progress of Love, 1716 Desponding Phyllis was endued with every talent of a prude. She trembled when a man drew near, salute her, and she turned her ear. If or against her you were placed, she durst not look above your waist. She'd rather take you to her bed than let you see her dress her head. In church you hear her through the crowd repeat the absolution loud. In church, secure behind her fan, she durst behold that monster man. There practised how to place her head and bite her lips to make them red, or on the mat devoutly kneeling would lift her eyes up to the ceiling and heave her bosom unaware for a neighbouring bow to see it bare. At length a lucky lover came, and found admittance to the dame. Suppose all parties now agreed, the writings drawn, the lawyer feed. The vicar and the ring bespoke. Guess how could such a match be broke? See then what mortals place their bliss in, next morn betimes the bride was missin'. The mother screamed, the father chid, where can this idle wench be hid? No news of Phil, the bridegroom came, and thought his bride had skulked for shame, because her father used to say the girl had such a bashful way. Now John the butler must be sent to learn the road that Phyllis went. The groom was wished to saddle crop, for John must neither light nor stop, but find her wheresoe'er she fled, and bring her back alive or dead. See here again the devil to do, for truly John was missing too. The horse and pillion both were gone, Phyllis, it seems, was fled with John. Old madam, who went up to find what papers Phil had left behind, a letter on the toilet sees, To my much-honoured father, these. Tis always done, romances tell us, when daughters run away with fellows, filled with the choicest commonplaces by others used in the like cases. That long ago a fortune-teller exactly said what now befell her, and in a glass had made her see a serving man of low degree. It was her fate must be forgiven, for marriages were made in heaven. His pardon begged but to be plain, she'd do it if twere to do again. Thanked God, t'was neither shame nor sin, for John was come of honest kin. Love never thinks of rich and poor, she'd beg with John from door to door. Forgive her if it be a crime, 
she'll never do it another time. She ne'er before in all her life once disobeyed him, maid nor wife. One argument she summed up all in, the thing was done and past recalling, and therefore hoped she should recover his favour when his passion's over. She valued not what others thought her, and was his most obedient daughter. Fair maidens all attend the muse, who now the wandering pair pursues. Away they rode in homely sort, their journey long, their money short. The loving couple, well bemired, the horse and both the riders tired, their victuals bad, their lodgings worse. Phil cried, and John began to curse. Phil wished that she had strained a limb when first she ventured out with him. John wished that he had broke a leg when first for her he quitted Peg. But what adventures more befell him, the muse hath now no time to tell him, how Johnny wheedled, threatened, fond, till Phyllis all her trinkets pawned, how oft she broke her marriage vows, in kindness to maintain her spouse, till Swain's unwholesome spoiled the trade, for now the surgeon must be paid, to whom those perquisites are gone, in Christian justice due to John. When food and raiment now grew scarce, fate put a period to the farce, and with exact poetic justice, for John was landlord, Phyllis, hostess. They keep at stains. Section 34 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Horace, Book 4, Ode 9, Addressed to Archbishop King, 1718. Virtue concealed within our breast is inactivity at best, but never shall the muse endure to let your virtues lie obscure or suffer envy to conceal your labors for the public weal. Within your breast all wisdom lies, either to govern or advise. Your steady soul preserves her frame, in good and evil times the same. Pale avarice and lurking fraud stand in your sacred presence awed. Your hand alone from gold abstains, which drags the slavish world in chains. Him for a happy man I own, whose fortune is not overgrown, and happy he who wisely knows to use the gifts that heaven bestows, or if it please the powers divine, can suffer want and not repine. The man who infamy to shun, into the arms of death would run, that Section 35 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To Mr. Delaney, October 10th, 1718, 9 in the morning. To you whose virtues I must own, with shame I have too lately known, to you by art and nature taught, to be the man I long have sought, had not ill fate, perverse and blind, placed you in life too far behind, or what I should repine at more, placed me in life too far before. To you the muse this verse bestows, which might as well have been in prose, no thought, no fancy, no sublime, but simple topics told in rhyme. Three gifts for conversation fit, are humour, raillery, and wit. The last, as boundless as the wind, is well conceived, though not defined. For sure, by wit is only meant, applying what we first invent. What humour is, not all the tribe, of logic mongers can describe. Here only nature acts her part, unhelped by practice, books, or art. For wit and humour differ quite, that gives surprise and this delight. 
Humour is odd, grotesque, and wild, Only by affectation spoiled. Tis never by invention got, Men have it when they know it not. Our conversation to refine, True humour must with wit combine. From both we learn to rally well, Wherein French writers most excel. Voiture in various lights displays That irony which turns to praise. His genius first found out the rule For an obliging ridicule. He flatters with peculiar air The brave, the witty, and the fair, And fools would fancy he intends A satire where he most commends. But as a poor pretending beau, Because he fain would make a show, Nor can afford to buy gold lace, Takes up with copper in the place, So the pert dunces of mankind, Whene'er they would be thought refined, Because the difference lies abstruse Twixt raillery and gross abuse, To show their parts will scold and rail, Like porters o'er a pot of ale. Such is that clan of boisterous bears, always together by the ears, shrewd fellows and arch-wags a tribe that meet for nothing but to jibe, who first run one another down, and then fall foul on all the town, skilled in the horse laugh and dry rub, and called by excellence the club. I mean your butler, Dawson, Carr, all special friends, and always jar. The mettled and the vicious steed, do not more differ in their breed. Nay, voiture is like Tom Lay, as rudeness is to repartee. If what you said I wish unspoke, twill not suffice it was a joke. Reproach not, though in jest, a friend, for those defects he cannot mend. His lineage, calling, shape, or sense, if named with scorn, gives just offence. What use in life to make men fret? part in worse humour than they met. Thus all society is lost, men laugh at one another's cost, and half the company is teased that came together to be pleased. For all buffoons have most in view to please themselves by vexing you. When jests are carried on too far, and the loud laugh begins the war, you keep your countenance for shame, yet still you think your friend to blame. For though men cry they love a jest, tis but when others stand the test, and, would you have their meaning known, they love a jest when tis their own. You wonder now to see me write, so gravely where the subjects light, some part of what I here design regards a friend of yours and mine, who, full of humour, fire, and wit, not always judges what is fit, but loves to take prodigious rounds, and sometimes walks beyond his bounds. You must, although the point be nice, venture to give him some advice. Few hints from you will set him right, and teach him how to be polite. Bid him, like you, observe with care, Whom to be hard on, whom to spare, Nor indiscreetly to suppose All subjects like Dan Jackson's nose. To study the obliging jest By reading those who teach it best. For prose I recommend votures, For verse, I speak my judgment, yours. He'll find the secret out from thence, To rhyme all day without offence. And I no more shall then accuse the flirts of his ill-mannered mute. Section 36 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. An Elegy on the death of Demar, the usurer, who died on the 6th of July, 1720. Know all men by these presents, death the tamer, by mortgage has secured the corpse of Demar. Nor can four hundred thousand sterling pound redeem him from his prison underground. His heirs might well of all his wealth possessed, Bestow to bury him one iron chest. 
Plutus, the god of wealth, will joy to know his faithful steward in the shades below. He walked the streets and wore a threadbare cloak. He dined and supped at charge of other folk. And by his looks had he held out his palms. He might be thought an object fit for alms. But to the poor, if he refused his pelf, he used him full as kindly as himself. Where he went, he never saw his betters. Lords, knights, and squires were all his humble debtors. And under hand and seal, the Irish nation were forced to own to him their obligation. He that could once have half a kingdom bought, in half a minute is not worth a groat. His coffers from the coffin could not save, nor all his interest keep him from the grave. A golden monument would not be right, because we wish the earth upon him light. O London Tavern, thou hast lost a friend, though in thy walls he near did farthing spend. He touched the pence when others touched the pot. The hand that signed the mortgage paid the shot. Old as he was, no vulgar known disease. On him could ever boast a power to seize. But as the gold he weighed, grim death in spite, Cast in his dart which made three more doors light. And as he saw his darling money fail, Blew his last breath to sink the lighter scale. He who so long was current to be strange, If he should now be cried down since his change. The sexton shall green sods on thee bestow, Alas, the sexton is thy banker now. A dismal banker must that banker be, who gives no bills but of mortality. Epitaph on the Same Beneath this verdant hillock lies Damar the wealthy and the wise. His heirs, that he might safely rest, have put his carcass in a chest, the very chest in which, they say, his other self, his money, lay. And if his heirs continue kind, To that dear self he left behind, I dare believe that... Section 37 of the Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To Mrs. Houghton of Bormont, on praising her husband to Dr. Swift. You always are making a god of your spouse, but this neither reason nor conscience allows. Perhaps you will say, tis ingratitude due, and you adore him because he adores you. Your argument's weak, and so you will find, for you by this rule must adore all mankind. Verses written on a window at the Deanery House, St. Patrick's Are the guests of this house still doomed to be cheated? Sure the fates have decreed they by halves should be treated. In the days of good John, if you came here to dine, you had choice of good meat, but no choice of good wine. In Jonathan's reign, if you come here to eat, you have choice of good wine, but no choice of good meat. O oh, Jove, then how fully might all sides be blessed, which thou but agreed to this humble request. Put both deans in one, or, if that's too much trouble, instead of the deans, make the deanery double. On Another Window A bard on whom Phoebus his spirit bestowed, Resolving to acknowledge the bounty he owed, Found out a new method at once of confessing, And making the most of so mighty a blessing. 
To the god he'd be grateful, but mortals he'd chouse, By making his patron preside in his house, And wisely foresaw this advantage from thence, That the god would in honour bear most of the expense. So the bard he finds drink, and leaves Phoebus to treat, With the thoughts he inspires regardless of meat. Hence Section 38 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Apollo to the Dean, 1720 Right, trusty, and so forth, we let you know, We are very ill used by you mortals below. For first I have often by chemists been told, Though I know nothing on it, it is I that make gold which when you have got you so carefully hide it, that since I was born I hardly have spied it. Then it must be allowed that whenever I shine, I forward the grass and I ripen the vine. To me the good fellows apply for relief, without whom they could get neither claret nor beef. Yet their wine and their victuals, those cormons and blubbards, lock up from my sight in cellars and cupboards. That I have an ill eye, they wickedly think, And taint all their meat, and sour all their drink. But thirdly and lastly, it must be allowed, I alone can inspire the poetical crowd. This is gratefully owned by each boy in the college, Whom, if I inspire, it is not to my knowledge. This every pretender in rhyme will admit, Without troubling his head about judgment or wit. These gentlemen use me with kindness and freedom, and as for their works when I please I may read em. They lie open on purpose on counters and stalls, and the titles I view when I shine on the walls. But a comrade of yours, that traitor Delaney, whom I for your sake have used better than any, and of my mere motion and special good grace, intended in time to succeed in your place, on Tuesday the tenth seditiously came, with a certain false traitress, one Stella by name, to the deanery house and on the north glass, where for fear of the cold I never can pass, then and there viet armis with a certain utensil, of value five shillings in English a pencil, did maliciously, falsely, and traitorously write, while Stella aforesaid stood by with a light. My sister hath lately deposed upon oath, that she stopped in her course to look at them both that Stella was helping, abetting, and aiding, and still as he writ stood smiling and reading, that her eyes were as bright as myself at noonday, but her graceful black locks were all mingled with grey, and by the description I certainly know, tis the nymph that I courted some ten years ago, whom when I with the best of my talents endued, on her promise of yielding she acted the prude, that some verses were writ with felonious intent, direct to the north, where I never once went, that the letters appeared reversed through the pane, but in Stella's bright eyes were placed right again, wherein she distinctly could read every line, and presently guessed the fancy was mine. She can swear to the parson whom oft she has seen, at night between Cavan Street and College Green. Now you see why his verses so seldom are shown, the reason is plain, they are none of his own and observe while you live that no man is shy to discover the goods he came honestly by. If I light on a thought, he will certainly steal it, and when he has got it, find ways to conceal it. Of all the fine things he keeps in the dark, there's scarce one intent but what has my mark. And let them be seen by the world if he dare, I'll make it appear they are all stolen ware. But as for the poem he writ on your sash, I think I have now got him under my lash. My sister transcribed it last night to his sorrow, and the public shall see it if I live till to-morrow. Throw the zodiac around, it shall quickly be spread, in all parts of the globe where your language is read. He knows very well I near gave a refusal, when he asked for my aid in the forms that are usual. But the secret is this I did lately intend, to write a few verses on you as my friend. I studied a fortnight before I could find, as I rode in my chariot, a thought to my mind. 
and resolved the next winter, for that is my time, when the days are at shortest, to get it in rhyme. Till then it was locked in my box at Parnassus, when that subtle companion in hopes to surpass us, conveys out my paper of hints by a trick, for I think in my conscience he deals with old Nick. And from my own stock, provided with topics, he gets to a window beyond both the tropics. There, out of my sight, just against the north zone, writes down my conceits, and then calls them his own. And you, like a cully, the bubble can swallow. Now who but Delaney that writes like Apollo? High treason by statute, yet here you object. He only stole hints, but the verse is correct. Though the thoughts be Apollo's, tis finely expressed. So a thief steals my horse, and has him well dressed. Now whereas the said criminal seems past repentance, we Phoebus think fit to proceed to his sentence. Since Delaney hath dared, like Prometheus his sire, to climb to our region and thence to steal fire, we order a vulture in shape of the spleen, to prey on his liver but not to be seen, and we order our subjects in every degree to believe all his verses were written by me, and under the pain of our highest displeasure, to call nothing his but the rhyme and the measure. And lastly for Stella, just out of her prime, I'm too much revenged already by time. In return of her scorn I sent her diseases, but will now be her friend whenever she pleases. Section 39 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. News from Parnassus by Dr. Delaney, occasioned by Apollo to the Dean, 1720. Parnassus, February the 27th, the poets assembled here on the 11th, convened by Apollo, who gave them to know, he'd have a vice-regent in his empire below, but declared that no bard should this honour inherit, till the rest had agreed he surpassed them in merit. Now this, you'll allow, was a difficult case, for each bard believed he'd a right to the place. So finding the assembly grow warm in debate, he put them in mind of his Phython's fate. T'was urged to no purpose, disputes higher rose, scarce Phoebus himself could their quarrels compose till at length he determined that every bard should each in his turn be patiently heard. First one who believed he excelled in translation, founds his claim on the doctrine of man's transmigration. Since the soul of great Milton was given to me, I hope the convention will quickly agree. Agree, quoth Apollo, from whence is this fool? Is he just come from reading Pythagoras at school? Be gone, sir, you got your subscriptions in time, and give in return neither reason nor rhyme. To the next says the god, though now I won't choose you, I'll tell you the reason for which I refuse you. Love's goddess has oft to her parents complained, of my favouring a bard who her empire disdained, that at my instigation a poem you writ, which to beauty and youth preferred judgment and wit that to make you a laureate I gave the first voice, inspiring the Britons to prove of my choice. Jove sent her to me, her power to try, the goddess of beauty, what god can deny? She forbids your preferment, I grant her desire, appease the fair goddess, you then may rise higher. The next that appeared had good hopes of succeeding, for he merited much for his wit and his breeding. "'Twas wise in the Britons no favour to show him, "'he else might expect they should pay what they owe him, "'and therefore they prudently chose to discard "'the patriot whose merits they would not reward. "'The god with a smile bade his favourite advance. "'You were sent by Astraea, her envoy to France. "'You bend your ambition to rise in the state. "'I refuse you because you could stoop to be great. "'Then a bard who had been a successful translator, the convention allows me a versificator. Says Apollo, you mention the least of your merit. By your works it appears you have much of my spirit. I esteem you so well that, to tell you the truth, 
the greatest objection against you is your youth then be not concerned you are now laid aside if you live you shall certainly one day preside another low bending apollo thus greets twas i taught your subjects to walk through the streets you taught them to walk why they knew it before but give me the bard that can teach them to soar whenever he claims tis his right i'll confess who lately attempted my style with success who writes like apollo has most of his spirit and therefore tis just i distinguish his merit who makes it appear by all he has writ his judgment alone can set bounds to his wit like virgil correct with his own native ease but excels even virgil in elegant praise who admires the ancients and knows tis their due yet writes in a manner entirely new though none with more ease their depths can explore yet whatever he wants he takes from my store though i'm fond of his virtues his pride i can see in scorning to borrow from any but me it is owing to this that like cynthia his lays enlighten the world by reflecting my rays this said the whole audience Section 40 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Apollo's Edict, Occasioned by News from Parnassus Ireland is now our royal care. We lately fixed our viceroy there. How near she was to be undone, Till pious love inspired her son what cannot our vice-regent do as poet and as patriot too let his success our subjects sway our inspirations to obey and follow where he leads the way then study to correct your taste nor beaten paths be longer traced no simile shall be begun with rising or with setting sun and let the secret head of nile be ever banished from your isle when wretched lovers live on air, I beg you'll the chameleon spare. And when you'd make a hero grander, forget he's like a salamander. No son of mine shall dare to say, Aurora ushered in the day, or ever name the Milky Way. You all agree, I make no doubt, Elijah's mantle is worn out. The bird of Jove shall toil no more to teach the humble wren to soar. Your tragic heroes shall not rant, nor shepherds use poetic cant. Simplicity alone can grace the manners of the rural race. Theocritus and Philip's be your guides to true simplicity. When Damon's soul shall take its flight, though poets have the second sight, they shall not see a trail of light, nor shall the vapors upward rise, nor a new star adorn the skies. For who can hope to place one there, As glorious as Belinda's hair? Yet if his name you'd eternize, And must exalt him to the skies, Without a star this may be done, So Tickle mourned his Addison. If Anna's happy reign you praise, Pray not a word of halcyon days, Nor let my votaries show their skill In aping lines from Cooper's Hill. For know I cannot bear to hear The mimicry of deep yet clear. Whene'er my viceroy is addressed, Against the phoenix I protest. When poets soar in youthful strains, No phaethon to hold the reins. When you describe a lovely girl, No lips of coral, teeth of pearl. Cupid shall ne'er mistake another, Howe'er Buteus for his mother, Nor shall his darts at random fly From magazine in Celia's eye. With woman compounds I am cloyed, Which only pleased in Biddy Floyd. For foreign aid what need they roam, Whom fate has amply blessed at home? Unerring heaven with bounteous hand Has formed a model for your land whom Jove endued with every grace, the glory of the Granard race. Now destined by the powers divine, the blessing of another line. Then would you paint a matchless dame, whom you'd consign to endless fame? 
invoke not Cytheria's aid, nor borrow from the blue-eyed maid. Section 41 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Description of an Irish Feast, translated almost literally out of the original Irish, 1720. O'Rourke's noble fare will ne'er be forgot by those who were there or those who were not. His revels to keep, we sup and we dine on seven score sheep fat bullocks and swine, whose kebaw to our feast in pails was brought up, a hundred at least, and a madder our cup. Oh, there is the sport we rise with the light, in disorderly sort, from snoring all night. Oh, how I was tricked, my pipe it was broke, my pocket was picked, I lost my new cloak. I'm rifled, quoth Nell, of mantle and kercher, why then fare them well, the dale take the searcher. Come, Harper, strike up, but first, by your favour, boy, give us a cup. Ah, this hath some savour. O'Rourke's jolly boys ne'er dreamt of the matter, till roused by the noise and musical clatter. They bounce from their nest, no longer will tarry. They rise ready dressed, without one ave marry. They dance in a round, cutting capers and ramping. A mercy the ground did not burst with their stamping. The floor is all wet, with leaps and with jumps, while the water and sweat splish splash in their pumps. Bless you late and early, Laughlin, Oenagan, but my hand you dance rarely, Margery Grenagan. Bring straw for our bed, shake it down to the feet. Then over us spread the winnowing sheet. To show I don't flinch, fill the bowl up again. Then give us a pinch of your sneezing a yain. Good Lord, what a sight, after all their good cheer, For people to fight in the midst of their beer. They rise from the feast, and hot are their brains, A cubit at least the length of their skeins. What stabs and what cuts, what clattering of sticks, what strokes on the guts, what basting and kicks, with cudgels of oak, well hardened in flame, a hundred heads broke, a hundred struck lame. You churl, I'll maintain, my father built Lusk, the castle of Slain and Carrick Drumrusk, the Earl of Kildare and Moinalta his brother, as great as they are, I was nursed by their mother. Ask that of old madam, she'll tell you who's who. As far up as Adam, she knows it is true. Come down. Section 42 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. THE PROGRESS OF BEAUTY, 1719 When first Diana leaves her bed, Vapors and steams her looks disgrace, A frowsy, dirty-colored red Sits on her cloudy, wrinkled face. But by degrees, when mounted high, Her artificial face appears, Down from her window in the sky, Her spots are gone, her visage clears. Twixt earthly females and the moon, all parallels exactly run. If Celia should appear too soon, Alas, the nymph would be undone. To see her from her pillow rise, All reeking in a cloudy steam, Cracked lips, foul teeth, and gummy eyes, Poor Strephon, how would he blaspheme? The soot or powder which was wont To make her hair look black as jet, Falls from her tresses on her front, a mingled mass of dirt and sweat. Three colors, black and red and white, so graceful in their proper place, remove them to a different light, they form a frightful, hideous face. For instance, when the lily slips into the precincts of the rose, and takes possession of the lips, 
leaving the purple to the nose. So Celia went entire to bed, all her complexion safe and sound, but when she rose, the black and red, though still in sight, had changed their ground. The black which would not be confined, a more inferior station seeks, leaving the fiery red behind, and mingles in her muddy cheeks. The paint by perspiration cracks, and falls in rivulets of sweat. On either side you see the tracks, while at her chin the confluents meet. A skilful housewife thus her thumb, with spittle while she spins, anoints, and thus the brown meanders come, in trickling streams betwixt her joints. But Celia can with ease reduce, by help of pencil, paint, and brush, each colour to its place and use, and teach her cheeks again to blush. She knows her early self no more, but filled with admiration stands, as other painters oft adore the workmanship of their own hands. Thus after four important hours, Celia's the wonder of her sex, say which among the heavenly powers could cause such wonderful effects. Venus indulgent to her kind gave women all their hearts could wish, when first she taught them where to find white lead in Lusitanian dish. Love with white lead cements his wings, white lead was sent us to repair, to brightest, brittlest, earthly things, a lady's face, and china ware. She ventures now to lift the sash, the window is her proper sphere. Ah, lovely nymph, be not too rash, nor let the bow approach too near. Take pattern by your sister star, delude at once and bless our sight. When you are seen, be seen from far, and chiefly choose to shine by night. In the Pall Mall, when passing by, keep up the glasses of your chair. Then each transported fop will cry, God damn me, Jack, she's wondrous fair. But art no longer can prevail, when the materials all are gone. The best mechanic hand must fail, where nothing's left to work upon. Matter, as wise logicians say, cannot without a form subsist. And form, say I, as well as they, must fail if matter brings no grist. And this is fair Diana's case, for all astrologers maintain, each night a bit drops off her face, when mortals say she's in her wane. While Partridge wisely shows the cause, efficient of the moon's decay, that cancer with his poisonous claws attacks her in the milky way. But Gadbury in art profound, from her pale cheeks pretends to show, that Swain and Dymion is not sound, or else that Mercury's her foe. But let the cause be what it will, in half a month she looks so thin, that Flamsteed can, with all his skill, see but her forehead and her chin. Yet as she wastes she grows discreet, till midnight never shows her head, so rotting Celia strolls the street, when sober folks are all abed. For sure, if this be Luna's fate, poor Celia, but of mortal race, in vain expects a longer date to the materials of her face. When Mercury her tresses mows, to think of oil and soot is vain, no painting can restore a nose, nor will her teeth return again. Two balls of glass may serve for eyes, white lead can plaster up a cleft, but these, alas, are poor supplies, if neither cheeks nor lips be left. Ye powers who over love preside, since mortal beauties drop so soon, if ye would have us
Section 43 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Progress of Marriage Itatis Suai, 52, a reverend dean began to woo, a handsome, young, imperious girl, nearly related to an earl. Her parents and her friends consent, the couple to the temple went, they first invite the Cyprian queen. T'was answered, she would not be seen. But Cupid in disdain could scarce forbear to bid them kiss his arse. The graces next, and all the muses, were bid in form but sent excuses. Juno attended at the porch, with farthing candle for a torch, while mistress Iris held her train, the faded bow bedropped with rain. Then he became and took her place, but showed no more than half her face. What ere these dire forebodings meant, in joy the marriage day was spent. The marriage day, you take me right, I promise nothing for the night. The bridegroom, dressed to make a figure, assumes an artificial vigor, a flourished nightcap on, to grace, his ruddy, wrinkled, smirking face. Like the faint red upon a pippin, half withered by a winter's kipping. And thus set out this happy pair, the swain is rich, the nymph is fair. But what I gladly would forget, the swain is old, the nymph coquette. Both from the goal together start, scarce run a step before they part. No common ligament that binds the various textures of their minds, their thoughts and actions, hopes and fears, less corresponding than their years. The dean desires his coffee soon, she rises to her tea at noon. While the dean goes out to cheapen books, she at the glass consults her looks. While Betty's buzzing at her ear, Lord, what a dress these parsons wear! So odd a choice how could she make, wished him a colonel for her sake. Then on her finger ends she counts, exact to what his age amounts. The dean, she heard her uncle say, is sixty if he be a day. His ruddy cheeks are no disguise, you see the crow's feet round his eyes. At one she rambles to the shops, to cheapen tea and talk with fops, or calls a council of her maids, and tradesmen to compare brocades. Her weighty morning business o'er, sits down to dinner just at four. Minds nothing that is done or said, her evening work so fills her head. The dean, who used to dine at one, is mawkish and his stomach's gone. In threadbare gown would scarce a love's hold, looks like the chaplain of the household, beholds her from the chaplain's place, in French brocades and Flanders lace. He wonders what employs her brain, but never asks or asks in vain. His mind is full of other cares, and, in the sneaking parson's airs, computes that half a parish dues will hardly find his wife in shoes. Canst thou imagine, dull divine, twill gain her love to make her fine? Hath she no other wants beside? You feed her lust as well as pride, enticing coxcombs to adore, and teach her to despise thee more. If in her coach she'll condescend to place him at the hinder end, her hoop is hoist above his nose, his odious gown would soil her clothes. She drops him at the church to pray, while she drives on to see the play. He, like an orderly divine, comes home a quarter after nine, and meets her hasting to the ball. Her chairmen push him from the wall. The dean gets in and walks upstairs, and calls the family to prayers, then goes alone to take his rest in bed where he can spare her best. At five the footmen make a din, her ladyship is just come in. The masquerade began at two, she stole away with much ado, and shall be chid this afternoon for leaving company so soon. She'll say, and she may truly say it, she can't abide to stay out late. But now, though scarce a twelve-month married, poor Lady Jane has thrice miscarried. The cause, alas, is quickly guessed. 
the town has whispered round the jest. Think on some remedy in time, the dean, you see, is past his prime. Already dwindled to a lath, no other way but try the bath, for Venus, rising from the ocean, infused in strong prolific potion, that mixed with Achelous spring, the horned flood as poets sing, who with an English beauty smitten, ran underground from Greece to Britain. The genial virtue with him brought, and gave the nymph a plenteous draught, then fled and left his horn behind, for husbands passed their youth to find. The nymph, who still with passion burned, was to a boiling fountain turned, where childless wives crowd every morn to drink in Icaloa's horn, or bathe beneath the cross their limbs, where fruitful matter chiefly swims, and here the father often gains that title by another's pains. Hither, though much against his grain, the dean has carried Lady Jane. He, for a while, would not consent, but vowed his money all was spent. Was ever such a clownish reason, and must my lady slip her season? The doctor, with a double fee, was bribed to make the dean agree. Here all diversions of the place are proper in my lady's case, with which she patiently complies, merely because her friends advise. His money and her time employs in music, raffling rooms and toys, or in the cross-bath seeks an heir, since others oft have found one there, where if the dean by chance appears, it shames his cassock and his years. He keeps his distance in the gallery, till banished by some coxcomb's raillery, for twould his character expose to bathe among the bells and bows. So have I seen, within a pen, young ducklings fostered by a hen. But when let out, they run and muddle, as instinct leads them in a puddle. The sober hen, not born to swim, with mournful note clucks round the brim, the dean, with all his best endeavor, gets not an heir, but gets a fever, a victim to his last essays of vigor in declining days. He dies and leaves his mourning mate. What could he less? His whole estate. The widow goes through all her forms. New lovers now will come in swarms. Oh, may I see her soon dispensing her favors to some broken ensign. Him let her marry for his face, and only coat of tarnished lace, to turn her naked out of doors, and spend her jointure on his whore. Section 44 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Progress of Poetry The farmer's goose, who in the stubble, has fed without restraint or trouble, grown fat with corn and sitting still, can scarce get o'er the barn door sill, and hardly waddles forth to cool her belly in the neighboring pool, nor loudly cackles at the door, for cackling shows the goose is poor. But when she must be turned to graze, and round the barren common strays, hard exercise and harder fare, soon make my dame grow lank and spare. Her body light, she tries her wings, and scorns the ground and upward springs, while all the parish, as she flies, hears sounds harmonious from the skies. Such is the poet fresh in pay, the third night's profits of his play. His morning draughts till noon can swill Among his brethren of the quill. With good roast beef his belly full, Grown lazy, foggy, fat, and dull. Deep sunk in plenty and delight, What poor air could take his flight? Or stuffed with phlegm up to the throat, What poet air could sing a note? Nor Pegasus could bear the load Along the high celestial road, the steed oppressed would break his girth to raise the lumber from the earth. But view him in another scene, when
When all his drink is hippocrene, His money spent, his patrons fail, His credit out for cheese and ale, His two years' coat so smooth and bare, Through every thread it lets in air, With hungry meals his body pinned, His guts and belly full of wind, And like a jockey for a race, His flesh brought down to flying case. Now his exalted spirit loads encumbrances of food and clothes, and up he rises like a vapor, supported high on wings of paper. He singing flies. Section 45 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The South Sea Project, 1721 Ye wise philosophers explain what magic makes our money rise when dropped into the southern main, or do these jugglers cheat our eyes? Put in your money fairly told, presto be gone, tis here again, Ladies and gentlemen, behold, here's every piece as big as ten. Thus in a basin drop a shilling, then fill the vessel to the brim. You shall observe, as you are filling, the ponderous metal seem to swim. It rises both in bulk and height, behold it swelling like a sop. The liquid medium cheats your sight, behold it mounted to the top. In stock three hundred thousand pounds, I have in view a lord's estate, by manners all contiguous round, a coach and six, and served in plate. Thus the deluded bankrupt raves, puts all upon a desperate bet, then plunges in the southern waves, dipped over head and ears in debt. So by a calenture misled, the mariner with rapture sees, on the smooth ocean's azure bed, enameled fields and verdant trees. With eager haste he longs to rove in that fantastic scene, and thinks it must be some enchanted grove, and in he leaps, and down he sinks. Five hundred chariots just bespoke are sunk in these devouring waves, the horses drowned, the harness broke, and here the owners find their graves. Like Pharaoh by directors led, they with their spoils went safe before, His chariots tumbling out the dead, Lay shattered on the Red Sea shore. Raised up on hope's aspiring plumes, The young adventurer o'er the deep, An eagle's flight and state assumes, And scorns the middle way to keep. On paper wings he takes his flight, With wax the father bound them fast, The wax is melted by the height, and down the towering boy is cast. A moralist might here explain the rashness of the Cretan youth, describe his fall into the main, and from a fable form a truth. His wings are his paternal rent, he melts the wax at every flame, his credit sunk, his money spent, in southern seas he leaves his name. Inform us you that best can tell why in that dangerous gulf profound, Where hundreds and where thousands fell, Fools chiefly float, the wise are drowned. So have I seen from Severn's brink A flock of geese jump down together, Swim where the bird of Jove would sink, And swimming never wet a feather. But I affirm tis false in fact, Directors better knew their tools, we see the nation's credit cracked. Each knave has made a thousand fools. One fool may from another win, And then get off with money stored. But if a sharper once comes in, He throws it all and sweeps the board. As fishes on each other prey, The great ones swallowing up the small, So fares it in the southern sea, The whale directors eat up all. When stock is high, they come between, making by second hand their offers, then cunningly retire unseen, with each a million in his coffers. 
So when upon a moonshine night an ass was drinking at a stream, a cloud arose and stopped the light by intercepting every beam. The day of judgment will be soon, cries out a sage among the crowd. An ass has swallowed up the moon. The moon lay safe behind the cloud. Each poor subscriber to the sea sinks down at once and there he lies. Directors fall as well as they. Their fall is but a trick to rise. So fishes rising from the main can soar with moistened wings on high. The moisture dried, they sink again, and dip their fins again to fly. Undone at play, the female troops come here their losses to retrieve. Ride o'er the waves in spacious hoops, like Lapland witches in a sieve. Thus Venus to the sea descends, as poets feign, but where's the moral? It shows the queen of love intends to search the deep for pearl and coral. The sea is richer than the land. I heard it from my grandnam's mouth, which now I clearly understand, for by the sea she meant the south. Thus by directors we are told, Pray, gentlemen, believe your eyes, our ocean's covered o'er with gold. Look round and see how thick it lies. We gentlemen are your assisters. We'll come and hold you by the chin. Alas, all is not gold that glisters. Ten thousand sink by leaping in. Oh, would those patriots be so kind, Here in the deep to wash their hands? Then like Pactolus we should find, The sea indeed had golden sands. A shilling in the bath you fling, The silver takes a nobler hue, By magic virtue in the spring, And seems a guinea to your view. But as a guinea will not pass, At market for a farthing more, Shown through a multiplying glass, Than what it always did before. So cast it in the southern seas, Or view it through a jobber's bill, Put on what spectacles you please, Your guinea's but a guinea still. One night a fool into a brook, Thus from a hillock looking down, The golden stars for guineas took, And silver Cynthia for a crown. The point he could no longer doubt, He ran and leapt into the flood, There sprawled a while and scarce got out, All covered o'er with slime and mud. Upon the water cast thy bread, And after many days thou'lt find it. But gold upon this ocean spread Shall sink and leave no mark behind it. There is a gulf where thousands fell, Here all the bold adventurers came, A narrow sound though deep as hell, Change Alley is the dreadful name. Nine times a day it ebbs and flows, Yet he that on the surface lies, Without a pilot seldom knows The time it falls or when twill rise. Subscribers here by thousands float And jostle one another down, Each paddling in his leaky boat, And here they fish for gold and drown. Now buried in the depth below, Now mounted up to heaven again, They reel and stagger to and fro, at their wit's end like drunken men. Meantime secure on Garway cliffs, A savage race by shipwrecks fed, Lie waiting for the foundered skiffs, And strip the bodies of the dead. But these, you say, are factious lies From some malicious Tory's brain, For where directors get a prize, The Swiss and Dutch whole millions drain. Thus when by rooks a lord is plied, Some cully often wins a bet, By venturing on the cheating side, Though not into the secret let. While some build castles in the air, Directors build them in the seas, Subscribers plainly see them there, For fools will see as wise men please. Thus oft by mariners are shown, Unless the men of Kent are liars, Earl Godwin's castles overflown, 
and palace roofs and steeple spires mark where the sly directors creep nor to the shore approach too nigh the monsters nestle in the deep to seize you in your passing by then like the dogs of nile be wise who taught by instinct how to shun the crocodile that lurking lies run as they drink and drink and run Antaeus could by magic charms recover strength whene'er he fell alcides held him in his arms and sent him up in air to hell directors thrown into the sea recover strength and vigor there but may be tamed another way suspended for a while in air directors for tis you i warn by long experience we have found what planet ruled when you were born we see you never can be drowned beware nor over bulky grow nor come within your cully's reach for if the sea should sink so low to leave you dry upon the beach you'll owe your ruin to your bulk your foes already waiting stand to tear you like a foundered hulk while you lie helpless on the sand thus when a whale has lost the tide the coasters crowd to seize the spoil the monster into parts divide and strip the bones and melt the oil oh may some western tempest sweep these locusts whom our fruits have fed that plague directors to the deep driven from the south sea to the red may he whom nature's laws obey who lifts the poor and sinks the proud quiet the raging of the sea and still the madness of the crowd but never shall our isle have rest till those devouring swine run down the devils leaving thee possessed and headlong in the waters drown the nation then too late will find computing all their cost and trouble directors promises but Section 46 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Prologue Billet to a Company of Players Sent with the Prologue Our set of strollers, wandering up and down, hearing the house was empty, came to town, and with a license from our good Lord Mayor, went to one Griffith, formerly a player him we persuaded with a moderate bribe to speak to erlington and all the tribe to let our company supply their places and hire us out their scenes and clothes and faces is not the truth the truth look full on me i am not erlington nor griffith he when we perform look sharp among our crew there's not a creature here you ever knew the former folks were servants to the king we humble strollers always on the wing now for my part i think upon the whole rather than starve a better man would stroll stay let me see three hundred pounds a year for leave to act in town tis plaguey dear now here's a warrant gallants please to mark for three thirteens and sixpence to the clerk three hundred pounds were i the price to fix the public should bestow the actors six a score of guineas given underhand for a good word or so we understand to help an honest lad that's out of place may cost a crown or so a common case and in a crew tis no injustice thought to ship a rogue and pay him not a groat but in the chronicles of former ages who ever heard of servants paying wages i pity erlington with all my heart would he were here this night to act my part i told him what it was to be a stroller how free we acted and had no comptroller in every town we wait on mr mayor first we get a license 
then produce our ware. We sound a trumpet, or we beat a drum. Huzza! the schoolboys roar, the players are come. And then we cry, to spur the bumpkins on, Gallants by Tuesday, next we must be gone. I told him in the smoothest way I could, All this and more, yet it would do no good. But Erlington, tears falling from his cheeks, He that is shone with Betterton and Wilkes, To whom our country has been always dear, Who chose to leave his dearest pledges here, Owns all your favours, here intends to stay, and, as a stroller, act in every play. And the whole crew this resolution takes, To live and die all strollers, for your sakes. Not frighted with an ignominious name, For your displeasure is their only shame. A pox on Erling Tun's majestic tone, Now to a word, a business in our own. Gallants next Thursday night will be our last, then without fail we pack up for Belfast. Lose not Section forty seven of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume One by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epilogue to Mr. Hoppy's Benefit Night at Smock Alley Hold, hold, my good friends, for one moment pray stop ye. I return ye my thanks in the name of poor Hoppy. He's not the first person who never did right, and yet has been fed by a benefit night. The custom is frequent, on my word I assure ye, in our famed elder house of the hundreds of jury. But then you must know, those players still act on, some very good reasons for such benefaction. A deceased poet's widow, if pretty can't fail, from Sibber she holds as a tenant in tale. Your emerited actors, and actresses too, for what they have done, though no more they can do. And sitters, and songsters, and Chetwood, and G, and sometimes a poor sufferer in the South Sea, a machine man, a tire woman, a mute, and a sprite, have been all kept from starving by a benefit night. Thus for Hoppy's bright merits, at length we have found, that he must have of us ninety-nine and one pound, pay to him clear money, once every year, and however some think it a little too dear. Yet for reasons of state, this sum will allow, though we pay the good man with the sweat of our brow. First, because by the king to us he was sent, To guide the whole session of this parliament, To preside in our councils, both public and private, And so learn by the by what both houses do drive at. When bold B roars, and meek M raves, When ash prates by wholesale, or B H by halves, When Whigs become whims, or join with the Tories, And to himself constant when a member no more is, but changes his sides and votes and unvotes, as S. T. is dull and with S. D. who dotes. Then up must get Hoppy, and with voice very low, and with eloquent bow the house he must show, that that worthy member who spoke last must give, the freedom to him humbly most to conceive, that his sentiment on this affair isn't right, that he mightily wonders which way he came by it that for his part, God knows, he does such things disown, and so, having convinced him, he most humbly sits down. For these and more reasons, which perhaps you may hear, pounds hundred this night and one hundred this year. And so on we are forced, though we sweat out our blood, to make these walls pay for poor Hoppy's good, to supply with rare diet his pot and his spit, and with richest margot to wash down a tit bit to wash off his fine linen, so clean and so net, and to buy him much linen to fence against sweat, all which he deserves, for although all the day he oft times is heavy, yet all night he's gay, and if he rise early to watch for the state, to keep up his spirits, he'll sit up as late. 
thus for these and more reasons as before i did say hop has got Section 48 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Prologue to a Play for the Benefit of the Distressed Weavers, by Dr. Sheridan. Spoken by Mr. Erlington, 1721. Great cry and little wool is now become the plague and proverb of the weaver's loom no wool to work on neither weft nor warp their pockets empty and their stomachs sharp provoked in loud complaints to you they cry ladies relieve the weavers or they die forsake your silks for stuffs nor think it strange to shift your clothes since you delight in change one thing with freedom i'll presume to tell the men will like you every bit as well. See, I am dressed from top to toe in stuff, and by my troth I think I'm fine enough. My wife admires me more and swears she never in any dress beheld me look so clever. And if a man be better in such wear, what great advantage must it give the fair? Our wool from lambs of innocence proceeds, silk come from maggots calicoes from weeds hence tis by sad experience that we find ladies in silks to vapours much inclined and what are they but maggots in the mind for which i think it reason to conclude that clothes may change our temper like our food chintzes are gaudy and engage our eyes too much about the party-coloured dyes although the lustre is from you begun we see the rainbow and neglect the sun how sweet an innocence the country made with small expense in native wool arrayed who copies from the fields her homely green while by her shepherd with delight she's seen should our fair ladies dressed like her in wool how much more lovely and how beautiful without their indian drapery they'd prove while wool would help to warm us into love then like the famous Section 49 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epilogue to a Benefit Play, given in behalf of the Distressed Weavers by the Dean, spoken by Mr. Griffith. Who dares affirm this is no pious age, when charity begins to tread the stage, when actors who at best are hardly savers will give a night of benefit to weavers stay let me see how finely it will sound imprimis from his grace a hundred pound peers clergy gentry all are benefactors and then comes in the item of the actors item the actors freely give a day the poet had no more who made the play but whence this wondrous charity in players they learned it not at sermons or at prayers under the rose since here are none but friends to own the truth we have some private ends since waiting women like exacting jades hold up the prices of their old brocades will dress in manufactures made at home equip our kings and generals at the comb we'll rig from meath street egypt's haughty queen and antony shall court her in ratine in blue shalloon shall hannibal be clad and scipio trail an irish purple plaid in drugget dressed 
of thirteen pence a yard, see Philip's son amidst his Persian guard, and proud Roxana, fired with jealous rage, with fifty yards of crape shall sweep the stage. In short, our kings and princesses within are all resolved this project to begin. And you, our subjects, when you here resort, must imitate the fashion of the court. Oh, could I see this audience clad in stuff, though money's scarce, we should have trade enough. But chintz brocades and lace take all away, and scarce a crown is left to see the play. Perhaps you wonder whence this friendship springs between the weavers and us playhouse kings, but wit and weaving had the same beginning. Pallas first taught us poetry and spinning, and next observe how this alliance fits, for weavers now are just as poor as wits. Their brother Quillmen, workers for the stage, for sorry stuff can get a crown a page, but weavers will be kinder to the players, and sell for twenty pence a yard of theirs, and to your knowledge, Section 50 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Answer to Dr. Sheridan's prologue and to Dr. Swift's epilogue in behalf of the distressed weavers, by Dr. Delaney. Feminio generi tribuantur. The muses whom the richest silks array refused to fling their shining gowns away. The pencil closed the nine in bright brocades, and gives each color to the pictured maids. Far above mortal dress the sisters shine, pride in their Indian robes and must be fine, and shall two bards in concert rhyme and huff, and fret these muses with their playhouse stuff. The player in mimic Piety may storm, deplore the comb and bid her hero's arm. The arbitrary mob, in paltry rage, may curse the bells and chintzes of the age. Yet still the artist, worm her silk shall share, and spin her thread of life in service of the fair. The cotton plant, whom satire cannot blast, shall bloom the favorite of these realms and last. Like yours ye fair, her fame from censure grows, Prevails in charms, and glares above her foes. Your injured plant shall meet a loud defence, And be the emblem of your innocence. Some bard, perhaps, whose landlord was a weaver, Penned the low prologue to return a favour. Some neighbour wit, that would be in the vogue, Worked with his friend, and wove the epilogue. Who weaves the chaplet, or provides the bays, for such wool gathering sonneteers as these? Hence then ye homespun whittlings that persuade, Miss Chloe too the fashion of her maid. Shall the wide hoop, that standard of the town, thus act subservient to a poplin gown? Who'd smell of wool all over, tis enough, the under petticoat, be made of stuff, lord to be wrapped in flannel just in May, when the fields dressed in flowers appear so gay, and shall not miss be flowered as well as they? In what weak colours would the plaid appear, worked to a quilt or studded in a chair? The skin that vies with silk would fret with stuff, or who could bear in bed a thing so rough? Ye knowing fair how eminent that bed, Where the chintz diamonds with the silken thread, Where rustling curtains call the curious eye, And boast the streaks and paintings of the sky, Of flocks they'd have your milky ticking full, And all this for the benefit of wool. 
But where, they say, shall we bestow these weavers, that spread our streets and are such piteous cravers? The silkworms, brittle beings prone to fate, demand their care to make their webs complete. Section 51 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On Gullstown House, the Seat of George Rockfort, Esquire, by Dr. Delaney. Tis so old and so ugly, and yet so convenient, you're sometimes in pleasure, though often in pain in't. Tis so large you may lodge a few friends with ease in't, you may turn and stretch at your length if you please in't. "'Tis so little the family live in a present, "'and poor Lady Betty has scarce room to dress in it. "'Tis so cold in the winter you can't bear to lie in it, "'and so hot in the summer you're ready to fry in it. "'Tis so brittle twould scarce bear the weight of a ton, "'yet so staunch that it keeps out a great deal of sun. "'Tis so crazy the weather with ease beats quite through it, "'and you're forced every year in some part to renew it. "'Tis so ugly, so useful, so big, and so little. "'Tis so staunch, and so crazy, so strong, and so brittle. "'Tis at one time so hot, and another so cold. "'It is part of the new, and part of the old. "'It is just half a blessing. Section 52 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Country Life, Part of a Summer Spent at Gallstown House, the Seat of George Rockfort, Esquire. Thalia tell in sober lays how George and Imdandine passed their days, and should our Gallstown's wit grow fallow, yet neget quiz Carmina gallo. Here, by the way, by Gallus mean I, not Sheridan, but friend Delaney. Begin, my muse, first from our bowers, we sally forth at different hours. At seven the dean, in nightgown dressed, goes round the house to wake the rest. At nine grave Nim and George facetious go to the dean to read Lucretius. At ten my lady comes and hectors, and kisses George, and ends our lectures. And when she has him by the neck fast, hauls him and scolds us down to breakfast. We squander there an hour or more, and then all hands, boys, to the oar. All heteroclite, Dan except, who never time nor order kept, but by peculiar whimsies drawn, peeps in the ponds to look for spawn, or sees the work, or dragon rose, or mars a text, or mends his hose, or but proceed we in our journal, at to or after, we return all. From the four L laments assembling, warned by the bell, all folks come trembling. From airy garrets some descend, some from the lake's remotest end. My lord and dean the fire forsake, Dan leaves the earthy spade and rake. The loiterers quate, no corner hides them, and Lady Betty soundly chides them. Now water brought, and dinner done, with church and king the ladies gone. Not reckoning half an hour we pass, in taking o'er a moderate glass. Dan, growing drowsy like a thief, steals off to doze away his beef. And this must pass for reading Hammond, while George and Dean go to backgammon. George Nim and Dean set out at four, and then again boys to the oar. But when the sun goes to the deep, not to disturb him in his sleep, or make a rumbling o'er his head, his candle out, and he a bed. We watch his motions to a minute, and leave the flood when he goes in it. Now stinted in the shortening day, we go to prayers and then to play. Till supper comes, and after that, 
we set an hour to drink and chat. Tis late, the old and younger pairs, by Adam lighted, walk upstairs. The weary dean goes to his chamber, and Nim and Dan to garret clamber. So when the circle we have run, the curtain falls and all is done. I might have mentioned several facts, like episodes between the acts, and tell who loses and who wins, who gets a cold, who breaks his shins, how Dan caught nothing in his net, and how the boat was overset. For brevity I have retrenched, how in the lake the dean was drenched. It would be an exploit to brag on, how valiant George rode o'er the dragon, how steady in the storm he sat, and saved his oar, but lost his hat. How Nim, no hunter e'er could match him, still brings us hares when he can catch him. How skilfully Dan mends his nets, how fortune fails him when he sets, or how the dean delights to vex the ladies and lampoon their sex. I might have told how oft Dean Percival displays his pedantry unmerciful, how haughtily he cocks his nose to tell what every schoolboy knows, and with his finger and his thumb explaining strikes opposers dumb. But now there needs no more be said on't, nor how his wife, that female pedant, shews all her secrets of housekeeping, for candles how she trucks her dripping, was forced to send three miles for yeast, to brew her ale and raise her paste, tells everything that you can think of, how she cured Charlie of the chinkoff, what gave her brats and pigs the measles, and how her doves were killed by weasels, how Jowler howled, and what a fright she had with dreams the other night. But now since I have gone so far on, a word or two of Lord Chief Baron, and tell how little weight he sets, on all Whig papers and gazettes. But for the politics of Pew, thinks every syllable is true. And since he owns the King of Sweden, is dead at last without evading. Now all his hopes are in the Tsar. Why Muscovy is not so far, down the Black Sea and up the Straits, and in a month he's at your gates. Perhaps from what the packet brings, by Christmas we shall see strange things. Why should I tell of ponds and drains, what carps we met with for our pains, of sparrows tamed and nuts innumerable, to choke the girls and to consume a rabble? But you who are a scholar know how transient all things are below, how prone to change is human life. Last night arrived Clem and his wife, this grand event has broke our measures, their reign began with cruel seizures. The dean must with his quilt supply the bed in which those tyrants lie. Nim lost his wig-block, Dan his Jordan. My lady says she can't afford one. George is half scared, out of his wits, for Clem gets all the dainty bits. Henceforth expect a different survey. This house will soon turn topsy-turvy, Section 53 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dr. Delaney's Villa Would you that Del Ville I describe? Believe me, sir, I will not jibe. For who would be satirical upon a thing so very small? You scarce upon the borders enter, before you're at the very centre. A single crow can make it night, when o'er your farm she takes her flight. Yet in this narrow compass we observe a vast variety. Both walks, walls, meadows, and parterres, windows and doors, and rooms and stairs, and hills and dales, and woods and fields, and hay and grass, and corn it yields, all to your haggard brought so cheap in, without the mowing or the reaping. A razor, though, to say it I'm loath, would shave you and your meadows both. Though small's the farm, yet there's a house, 
full large to entertain a mouse but where a rat is dreaded more than savage caledonian boar for if it's entered by a rat there is no room to bring a cat a little rivulet seems to steal down through a thing you call a veil like tears adown a wrinkled cheek like rain along a blade of leek and this you call your sweet meander which might be sucked up by a gander could he but force his nether bill to scoop the channel of the rill for sure you'd make a mighty clutter were it as big as city gutter next come i to your kitchen garden where one poor mouse would fare but hard in and round this garden is a walk no longer than a tailor's chalk thus i compare what space is in it a snail creeps round it in a minute one lettuce makes a shift to squeeze up through a tuft you call your trees and once a year a single rose peeps from the bud but never blows in vain then you expect its bloom it cannot blow for want of room in short in all your boasted sate there's nothing but yourself that's great on one of the windows at delville a bard grown desirous of saving his pelf built a house he was sure would hold none but himself this enraged god apollo who mercury sent and bid him go ask what his votary meant some foe to my empire has been his adviser tis of dreadful portent when a poet turns miser tell him hermes from me tell that subject of mine i have sworn by the sticks to defeat his design Section 54 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Carberry Rocks, translated by Dr. Duncan. Lo, from the top of yonder cliff that shrouds, its airy head amid the azure clouds, hangs a huge fragment destitute of props, prone on the wave the rocky ruin drops. With hoarse rebuff the swelling seas rebound, From shore to shore the rocks return the sound. The dreadful murmur heaven's high convex claves, And Neptune shrinks beneath his subject waves. For long the whirling winds and beating tides Had scooped a vault into its nether sides. Now yields the base, the summits nod, now urge, their headlong course and lash the sounding surge not louder noise could shake the guilty world when jove heaped mountains upon mountains hurled retorting pelion from his dread abode to crush earth's rebel sons beneath the load oft too with hideous yawn the cavern wide presents an orifice on either side a dismal orifice from sea to sea, Extended pervious to the god of day. Uncouthly joined the rock's stupendous form, And arch the ruin of a future storm. High on the cliff their nests the woodquests make, And sea-calves stable in the oozy lake. But when bleak winter with his sullen train Awakes the winds to vex the watery plain. When o'er the craggy steep without control, Big with the blast the raging billows roll. Not towns beleaguered, not the flaming brand, Darted from heaven by Jove's avenging hand. Oft as on impious men his wrath he pours, Humbles their pride and blasts their gilded towers equal the tumult of this wild uproar waves rushed o'er waves rebellows shore to shore the neighboring race though wont to brave the shocks of angry seas and run along the rocks now pale with terror while the ocean foams fly far and wide nor trust their native homes 
the goats while pendant from the mountain top the withered herb improvident they crop washed down the precipice with sudden sweep leave their sweet lives beneath the unfathomed deep the frightened fisher with desponding eyes though safe yet trembling in the harbour lies nor hoping to behold the sky Section 55 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Copy of the Birthday Verses on Mr. Ford Come, be content, since out it must, for Stella has betrayed her trust, and whispering charged me not to say that Mr. Ford was born to-day, or, if at last I needs must blab it, according to my usual habit she bid me with a serious face be sure conceal the time and place and not my compliment to spoil by calling this your native soil or vex the ladies when they knew that you were turning forty-two but if these topics shall appear strong arguments to keep you here i think though you judge hardly of it good manners must give place to profit the nymphs with whom you first began are each become a haridan, and Montague so far decayed, her lovers now must all be paid, and every bell that since arose has her contemporary bow. Your former comrades, once so bright, with whom you toasted half the night, of rheumatism and pox complain, and bid adieu to dear champagne. Your great protectors, once in power, are now in exile o'er the tower, your foes triumphant o'er the laws, who hate your person and your cause. If once they get you on the spot, you must be guilty of the plot, for, true or false, they'll ne'er inquire, but use you ten times worse than prior. In London, what would you do there? Can you, my friend, with patience bear? Nay, would it not your passion raise, worse than a pun or irish phrase to see a scoundrel strut and hector a footboy to some rogue director to look on vice triumphant round and virtue trampled on the ground observe where bloody blank stands with torturing engines in his hands hear him blaspheme and swear and rail threatening the pillory and jail if this you think a pleasing scene to london straight return again where you have told us from experience are swarms of bugs and presbyterians i thought my very spleen would burst when fortune hither drove me first was full as hard to please as you nor persons names nor places knew but now i act as other folk like prisoners when their gale is broke if you have london still at heart We'll make a small one here by art. The difference is not much between St. James's Park and Stephen's Green, and Dawson Street will serve as well to lead you thither as Pall Mall, nor want a passage through the palace to choke your sight and raise your malice. The deanery house may well be matched under correction with the thatched, nor shall I, when you hither come, demand a crown a quart for stum then for a middle-aged charmer stella may vie with your mount hermer she's now as handsome every bit and has a thousand times her wit the dean and sheridan i hope will half supply a gay and pope corbett though yet i know his worth not no doubt will prove a good arbuthnot i throw into the bargain tim in london can you equal him what think you of my favourite clan robin and jack and jack and dan fellows of modest worth and parts with cheerful looks and honest hearts can you on dublin look with scorn yet here were you and ormond born o oh, were but you and i so wise to see with robert grattan's eyes robin adores that spot of earth that literal spot which gave him birth and swears bell camp is to his taste as fine as hampton court at least 
When to your friends you would enhance The praise of Italy or France. For grandeur, elegance, and wit, We gladly hear you and submit. But then to come and keep a clutter For this or that side of a gutter, To live in this or t'other isle, We cannot think it worth your while. For take it kindly or amiss, The difference but amounts to this, We bury on our side the channel, In linen, and on yours in flannel. For you the news are near to seek, While we, perhaps, may wait a week. You happy folks are sure to meet A hundred whores in every street, While we may trace all Dublin o'er Before we find out half a score. You see my arguments are strong, I wonder you held out so long, But since you are convinced at last, We'll pardon you for what has passed. Section 56 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On Dreams, an Imitation of Petronius Those dreams that on the silent night intrude, And with false flitting shades our minds delude, Jove never sends us downward from the skies, Nor can they from infernal mansions rise but are all mere productions of the brain, and fools consult interpreters in vain. For when in bed we rest our weary limbs, the mind unburdened sports in various whims. The busy head with mimic art runs o'er the scenes and actions of the day before. The drowsy tyrant by his minions led to regal rage devotes some patriot's head. With equal terrors, not with equal guilt, The murderer dreams of all the blood he spilt. The soldier, smiling, hears the widow's cries, And stabs the son before the mother's eyes. With like remorse his brother of the trade, The butcher fells the lamb beneath his blade. The statesman rakes the town to find a plot, and dreams of forfeitures by treason got. Nor less Tom Tiedman of true statesman mold collects the city filth in search of gold. Orphans around his bed the lawyer sees, and takes the plaintiff's and defendant's fees. His fellow pick nurse watching for a job fancies his fingers in the cully's fob. The kind physician grants the husband's prayers, Or gives relief to long-expecting heirs. The sleeping hangman ties the fatal noose, Nor unsuccessful waits for dead men's shoes. The grave divine with naughty points perplexed, As if he were awake nods o'er his text, While the sly mounty bank attends his trade, harangues the rabble and is better paid. The hireling senator of modern days bedaubs the guilty great with nauseous praise, and Dick the scavenger with equal Section 57 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sent by Dr. Delaney to Dr. Swift, in order to be admitted to speak to him when he was deaf. 1724 Dear sir, I think tis doubly hard. Your ears and doors should both be barred. Can anything be more unkind? Must I not see, cause you are blind? Methinks a friend at night should cheer you, A friend that loves to see and hear you. Why am I robbed of that delight, When you can be no loser by it? Nay, when tis plain, for what is plainer, That if you heard you'd be no gainer? 
For sure you are not yet to learn, That hearing is not your concern. Then be your doors no longer barred, Your business, sir, is to be heard. The Answer The wise pretend to make it clear, Tis no great loss to lose an ear. Why are we then so fond of two, When by experience one would do? Tis true, they say, cut off the head, And there is an end, the man is dead. Because among all human race, None ear was known to have a brace. But confidently they maintain, That where we find the members twain, The loss of one is no such trouble, Since t'other will in strength be double. The limb surviving, you may swear, Becomes his brother's lawful heir. Thus for a trial let me beg of, Your reverence but to cut one leg off, And you shall find by this device, The other will be stronger twice. For every day you shall be gaining, New vigour to the leg remaining. So when an eye has lost its brother, You see the better with the other. Cut off your hand, and you may do, With t'other hand the work of two, Because the soul her power contracts, And on the brother limb reacts. But yet the point is not so clear in, Another case the sense of hearing. For though the place of either air, Be distant as one head can bear, Yet Galen most acutely shows you, Consult his book, De Partium Usu, That from each ear, as he observes, There creep two auditory nerves, Not to be seen without a glass, Which near the os petrosum pass, Thence to the neck, and moving thorough there, One goes to this, and one to other ear, Which made my grandam always stuff her ears, both right and left, as fellow sufferers. You see my learning, but to shorten it, When my left ear was deaf a fortnight, To t'other ear I felt it coming on, And thus I solved this hard phenomenon. Tis true a glass will bring supplies, To weak or old or clouded eyes. Your arms, though both your eyes were lost, Would guard your nose against a post. Without your legs, two legs of wood Are stronger and almost as good. And as for hands, there have been those Who, wanting both, have used their toes. Section 58 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Quiet Life and a Good Name to a Friend who Married a Shrew, 1724. Nell scolded in so loud a din that Will durst hardly venture in. He marked the conjugal dispute. Nell roared incessant. Dick sat mute. But when he saw his friend appear, cried bravely, Patience, good, my dear. At sight of Will she bawled no more, but hurried out and clapped the door. Why, Dick, the devil's in thy knell, quoth Will, thy house is worse than hell. Why, what a peal the jade has rung. Damn her, why don't you slit her tongue? For nothing else will make it cease. Dear Will, I suffer this for peace. I never quarrel with my wife, I bear it for a quiet life. Scripture, you know, exhorts us to it, Bids us to seek peace and ensue it. Will went again to visit Dick, And entering in the very nick, He saw Virago Nell belabor With Dick's own staff his peaceful neighbor. Poor Will, who needs must interpose, Received a brace or two of blows. But now, to make my story short, Will drew out Dick to take a quart. Why, Dick, thy wife has devilish whims. Odds, buds, why don't you break her limbs? 
If she were mine and had such tricks, I'd teach her how to handle sticks. Zounds, I would ship her to Jamaica, or truck the carrion for tobacco. I'd send her far enough away, dear Will, but what would people say? Lord, I should get so ill a name, the neighbors round would cry out shame. Dick suffered for his peace and credit, but who believed him when he said it? Can he who makes himself a slave consult his peace or credit save? Dick founded by his ill success, his quiet small, his credit less. She served him at the usual rate. She stunned, and then she broke his pate. And what he thought the hardest case, the parish jeered him to his face. Those men who wore the breeches least called him a cuckold, fool, and beast. At home he was pursued with noise, abroad was pestered by the boys. Within his wife would break his bones, without they pelted him with stones. The prentices procured a riding to act his patience and her chiding, false patience and mistaken pride. There are ten thousand dicks beside, slaves to their quiet and good name, are used like dick, and bear the blame. Advice to the Grub Street Verse Writers, 1726 Ye poets ragged and forlorn, down from your garret's haste, ye rhymers dead as soon as born, not yet consigned to paste. I know a trick to make you thrive, O oh, tis a quaint device, your still-born poems shall revive, and scorn to wrap up spice. Get all your verses printed fair, then let them well be dried, and curl must have a special care to leave the margin wide. Lend these to paper-sparing Pope, and when he sets to write, no letter with an envelope could give him more delight. When Pope has filled the margins round, why then recall your loan. Section 59 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Pastoral Dialogue, written June 1727, just after the news of the death of George I, who died the 12th of that month in Germany. In spite of Pope, in spite of Gay, and all that he or they can say, Sing on I must, and sing I will, of Richmond Lodge and Marble Hill. Last Friday night, as neighbors use, this couple met to talk of news, for by old proverbs it appears that walls have tongues and hedges ears. Marble Hill Quoth Marble Hill, right well I ween, your mistress now is grown a queen. You'll find it soon by woeful proof. She'll come no more beneath your roof. Richmond Lodge The kingly prophet well evinces That we should put no trust in princes. My royal master promised me To raise me to a high degree. But now he's grown a king, God what, I fear I shall be soon forgot. You see, when folks have got their ends, How quickly they neglect their friends. Yet I may say, twixt me and you, Pray God they now may find as true. Marble Hill My house was built but for a show, My lady's empty pockets know, And now she will not have a shilling To raise the stairs or build the ceiling, For all the courtly madams round Now pay four shillings in the pound. Tis come to what I always thought, My dame is hardly worth a groat. Had you and I been courtiers born, we should not thus have lain forlorn, for those we dexterous courtiers call can rise upon their master's fall. But we, unlucky and unwise, must fall because our masters rise. Richmond Lodge My master, scarce a fortnight since, was grown as wealthy as a prince, but now it will be no such thing, for he'll be poor as any king and by his crown will nothing get, 
but like a king to run in debt. Marble Hill. No more the dean, that grave divine, shall keep the key of my no wine, my ice-house rob as heretofore, and steal my artichokes no more. Poor Patty Blount no more be seen, be draggled in my walks so green. Plump Johnny Gay will now elope, and here no more will dangle Pope. Richmond Lodge. Here wants the dean, when he's to seek, to sponge a breakfast once a week, to cry the bread with stale and mutter, complaints against the royal butter. But now I fear it will be said, no butter sticks upon his bread. We soon shall find him full of spleen, For want of tattling to the queen, Stunning her royal ears with talking, His reverence and her highness walking, While Lady Charlotte, like a stroller, Sits mounted on the garden roller, A goodly sight to see her ride, With ancient Mermont at her side. In velvet cap his head lies warm, His hat for show beneath his arm. Marble Hill some south sea broker from the city will purchase me the more's the pity lay all my fine plantations waste to fit them to his vulgar taste changed for the worse in every part my master pope will break his heart richmond lodge in my own thames may i be drowned if e'er i stoop beneath a crowned head except her majesty prevails to place me with the prince of wales and then i shall be free from fears for he'll be prince these fifty years i then will turn a courtier too and serve the times as others do plain loyalty not built on hope i leave to your contriver pope none loves his king and country better yet none was ever less their debtor marble hill then let him come and take a nap in summer on my verdant lap prefer our villas where the thames is to kensington or hot st james's nor shall i dull in silence sit for tis to me he owes his wit my groves my echoes and my birds have taught him his poetic words we gardens and you wildernesses assist all poets in distresses him twice a week i hear expect to rattle moody for neglect an idle rogue who spends his quartridge in tippling at the dog and partridge and i can hardly get him down three times a week to brush my gown richmond lodge i pity you dear marble hill but hope to see you flourish still all happiness and so Section 60 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Desire and Possession, 1727 Tis strange what different thoughts inspire in men possession and desire. Think what they wish so great a blessing, so disappointed when possessing. A moralist profoundly sage, I know not in what book or page, or whether or a pot of ale, related thus the following tale. Possession and desire, his brother, but still at variance with each other, were seen contending in a race, and kept at first an equal pace. Tis said their course continued long, for this was active, that was strong, till envy, slander, sloth, and doubt misled them many a league about seduced by some deceiving light they take the wrong way for the right through slippery by-roads dark and deep they often climb and often creep desire the swifter of the two along the plain like lightning flew till entering on a broad highway where power and title scattered lay he strove to pick up all he found and by excursions lost his ground no sooner got than with disdain he threw them on the ground again and hasted forward to pursue fresh objects fairer to his view in hope to spring some nobler game but all he took was just the same too scornful now to stop his pace he spurned them in his rival's face possession kept the beaten road and gathered all his brother strewed but overcharged and out of wind though strong in limbs he lagged behind desire had now the goal in sight 
It was a tower of monstrous height, Where on the summit fortune stands, A crown and sceptre in her hands, Beneath a chasm deep as hell, Where many a bold adventurer fell. Desire in rapture gazed a while, And saw the treacherous goddess smile, But as he climbed to grasp the crown, She knocked him with the sceptre down. He tumbled in the gulf profound, There doomed to whirl an endless round. Possession's load was grown so great, He sunk beneath the cumbrous weight, And as he now expiring lay, Flocks every ominous bird of prey, The raven, vulture, owl, and kite, At once upon his carcass light, And strip Section 61 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On Censure, 1727 Ye wise instruct me to endure an evil which admits no cure, or how this evil can be born, which breeds at once both hate and scorn. Bare innocence is no support when you are tried in scandal's court. Stand high in honour, wealth, or wit, All others who inferior sit, Conceive themselves in conscience bound To join and drag you to the ground. Your altitude offends the eyes Of those who want the power to rise. The world a willing stander by Inclines to aid a specious lie. Alas, they would not do you wrong, But all appearances are strong. Yet whence proceeds this weight we lay On what detracting people say? For let mankind discharge their tongues in venom till they burst their lungs. Their utmost malice cannot make your head or tooth or finger ache, nor spoil your shape, distort your face, or put one feature out of place. Nor will you find your fortune sink by what they speak or what they think, nor can ten hundred thousand lies make you less virtuous, learned or wise. Section 62 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Furniture of a Woman's Mind, 1727 A set of phrases learned by rote, a passion for a scarlet coat, when at a play to laugh or cry, yet cannot tell the reason why, never to hold her tongue a minute, while all she prates has nothing in it, Whole hours can with a coxcomb sit, And take his nonsense all for wit. Her learning mounts to read a song, But half the words pronouncing wrong, Has every repartee in store She spoke ten thousand times before. Can ready compliments supply, On all occasions cut and dry, Such hatred to a parson's goon, The sight would put her in a swoon. For conversation well endued, She calls it witty to be rude. And placing raillery in railing Will tell aloud your greatest failing, Nor make a scruple to expose Your bandy leg or crooked nose, Can at her morning tea run o'er The scandal of the day before, Improving hourly in her skill To cheat and wrangle at quadrille, In choosing lace a critic nice Knows to a groat the lowest price, Can in her female clubs dispute What linen best the silk will suit, what colors each complexion match, and where with art to place a patch, if chance a mouse creeps in her sight, can finally counterfeit a fright. So sweetly screams if it comes near her, she ravishes all hearts to hear her, can dexterously her husband tease by taking fits whene'er she please, by frequent practice learns the trick at proper seasons to be sick, thinks nothing gives one airs so pretty, at once creating love and pity. If Molly happens to be careless, And but neglects to warm her hair lace, She gets a cold as sure as death, And vows she scarce can catch her breath, Admires how modest women can Be so robustious like a man, In party furious to her power, A better Whig or Tory sour, Her arguments directly tend Against the side she would defend, 
will prove herself a Tory plain, from principles the Whigs maintain, and to defend the Whiggish cause, her topics from the Tories draws. Oh yes, if any man can find more virtues in a woman's mind, let them be sent to Mrs. Harding, she'll pay the charges to a farthing. Take notice she has my commission to add them in the next edition. Section 63 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Clever Tom Clinch, Going to be Hanged, 1727 As clever Tom Clinch, while the rabble was bawling, rode stately through Holborn to die in his calling, he stopped at the George for a bottle of sack, and promised to pay for it when he came back. His waistcoat and stockings and breeches were white, his cap had a new cherry ribbon to tie it. The maids to the doors and the balconies ran, and said, Lack a day, he's a proper young man. But as from the windows the ladies he spied, like a bow in the box, he bowed low on each side. And when his last speech the loud hawkers did cry, he swore from his cart, It was all a damned lie. The hangman for pardon fell down on his knee. Tom gave him a kick in the guts for his fee, then said, I must speak to the people a little but I'll see you all damned before I will whittle. My honest friend Wilde, may he long hold his place, he lengthened my life with a whole year of grace. Take courage, dear comrades, and be not afraid, nor slip this occasion to follow your trade. My conscience is clear, and my spirits are calm, and thus I go off without prayer book or psalm. Section 64 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dr. Swift to Mr. Pope, while he was writing The Dunciad, 1727. Pope has the talent well to speak, but not to reach the ear. His loudest voice is low and weak, the dean too deaf to hear. A while they on each other look, then different studies choose. The dean sits plodding on a book. Pope walks and courts the muse. Now backs of letters, though designed for those who more will need em, are filled with hints and interlined, himself can hardly read em. Each atom by some other struck, all turns and motions tries, till in a lump together stuck, behold a poem rise. Yet to the dean, his share a lot, he claims it by a canon, that without which a thing is not, is causa sine qua non. Thus, Pope, in vain you boast your wit, for had our deaf divine been for your conversation fit, you had not writ a line. Of Sherlock, thus for preaching, Section 65 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Love Poem from a Physician to His Mistress, Written at London By poets we are well assured that love, alas, can ne'er be cured. A complicated heap of ills, despising boluses and pills, Ah, Chloe, this I find is true, since first I gave my heart to you. Now by your cruelty hard bound, I strain my guts, my colon wound. Now jealousy, my grumbling tripes, assaults with grating, grinding gripes. When pity in those eyes I view, my bowels wombling make me spew. When I an amorous kiss designed, I belched a hurricane of wind. Once you a gentle sigh let fall, Remember how I sucked it all. What colic pangs from thence I felt, Had you but known your heart would melt, Like ruffling winds in cavern pent, Till nature pointed out a vent. 
How have you torn my heart to pieces With maggots, humours, and caprices, By which I got the hemorrhoids, And loathsome worms my anus voids? When ere I hear a rival named, I feel my body all inflamed, Which, breaking out in boils and blains, With yellow filth my linen stains, Or, parched with unextinguished thirst, Small beer I guzzle till I burst, And then I drag a bloated corpus, Swelled with a dropsy like a porpoise. Section 66 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bouts Rimes on Signora Domitilla Our schoolmaster may roareth fit of classic beauty heic et illa. Not all as birch inspire such wit as thoggling beams of Domitilla. Let nobles toast in bright champagne, nymphs higher born than Domitilla. I'll drink her health again, again, in Berkeley's tar or Sars Parilla. At Goodman's fields I've much admired the postures strange of Monsieur Brilla, but what are they to the soft step, the gliding air of Domitilla? Virgil has eternized in song the flying footsteps of Camilla. Sure as a prophet he was wrong, he might have dreamed of Domitilla. Great Theodose condemned a town, for thinking ill of his placilla, and deuce take London if some night, or the city wed not Domitilla. Wheeler Sir George in travels wise gives us a medal of plantilla, but oh, the empress has not eyes, nor lips nor breast like Domitilla. Not all the wealth of plundered Italy piled on the mules of King Attila is worth one glove, I'll not tell a bit a lie, or garter snatched from Domitilla. Five years a nymph at certain hamlet, why cleaped harrow of the hill, ah, bused much my heart and was a damned let to verse, but now for Domitilla. Dan Pope consigns Belinda's watch to the Section 67 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Helter Skelter, or the Hue and Cry After the Attorneys Upon Their Riding the Circuit Now the active young attorneys briskly travel on their journeys, looking big as any giants on the horses of their clients, like so many little marses with their tilters at their arses, brazen-hilted lately burnished, and with harness buckles furnished, and with whips and spurs so neat, and with jockey coats complete, and with boots so very greasy, and with saddles eke so easy, and with bridles fine and gay, bridles borrowed for a day, bridles destined far to roam, ah, never, never to come home. And with hats so very big, sir, and with powdered caps and wigs, sir, and with ruffles to be shown, cambric ruffles not their own. And with holland shirts so white, shirts becoming to the sight, shirts be wrought with different letters as belonging to their betters. With their pretty tinseled boxes, gotten from their dainty doxies, and with rings so very trim, lately taken out of limb, and with very little pence, and as very little sense with some law but little justice having stolen from my hostess from the barber and the cutler like the soldier from the sutler from the vintner and the tailor like the felon from the jailer into this and t'other county living on the public bounty thorough town and thorough village all to plunder and to pillage thorough mountains thorough valleys thorough stinking lanes and alleys some to kiss with farmers' spouses, and make merry in their houses, some to tumble country wenches on their rushy beds and benches, and if they begin afraid, draw their swords and run away, all to murder equity, and to take a double fee, till the people are all quiet, and forget to broil and riot, low in pocket, cowed in courage, safely glad to
Section 68 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Puppet Show The life of man to represent, and turn it all to ridicule, wit did a puppet show invent, where the chief actor is a fool. The gods of old were logs of wood, and worship was to puppets paid. In antic dress the idol stood, and priest and people bowed the head. No wonder, then, if art began, the simple votaries to frame, to shape in timber foolish man, and consecrate the block to fame. From hence poetic fancy learned, that trees might rise from human forms, the body to a trunk be turned, and branches issue from the arms. Thus Daedalus and Ovid too, that man's a blockhead, have confessed, Powell and Stretch the hint pursue, Life is a farce, the world a jest. The same great truth South Sea has proved, On that famed theatre the alley, Where thousands by directors moved, Are now sad monuments of folly. What Momus was of old to Jove, The same a harlequin is no, The former was buffoon above, The latter is a punch below. This fleeting scene is but a stage, where various images appear, in different parts of youth and age, alike the prince and peasant share. Some draw our eyes by being great, false pomp conceals mere wood within, and legislators ranged in state, are oft but wisdom in machine. A stock may chance to wear a crown, and timber as a lord take place, a statue may put on a frown, and cheat us with a thinking face. Others are blindly led away, and made to act for ends unknown. By the mere spring of wires they play, and speak in language not their own. Too oft, alas, a scolding wife usurps a jolly fellow's throne, and many drink the cup of life, mixed and embittered by a joan. In short, whatever men pursue, of pleasure, folly, war, or love, this mimic race brings all to view, Alike they dress, they talk, they move. Go on, great stretch, with artful hand, Mortals to please and to deride, And when death breaks thy vital band, Thou shalt put on a puppet's pride. Thou shalt in puny wood be shown, Thy image shall preserve thy fame. Ages to come thy worth shall own, Point at thy limbs, and tell thy name. Tell Tom he draws a farce in vain, Before he looks in nature's glass. Puns cannot form a witty scene, Nor pedantry for humour pass. To make men act as senseless wood, And chatter in a mystic strain, Is a mere force of flesh and blood, And shows some error in the brain. He that would thus refine on thee, and turn thy stage into a school, the Section 69 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Journal of a Modern Lady in a letter to a person of quality, 1728. Sir, t'was a most unfriendly part, in you who ought to know my heart, are well acquainted with my zeal for all the female commonweal. How could it come into your mind to pitch on me of all mankind, against the sex to write a satyr, and brand me for a woman-hater? On me, who think them all so fair, they rival Venus to a hair, their virtues never ceased to sing, since first I learned to tune a string. Methinks I hear the ladies cry, Will he his character belie? Must never our misfortunes end, and have we lost our only friend? Ah, lovely nymphs, remove your fears, no more let fall those precious tears. The hound be hunted by the hare, then I turn rebel to the fair. "'Twas you engaged me first to write, then gave the subject out of spite. 
The journal of a modern dame Is by my promise what you claim. My word is past, I must submit, And yet perhaps you may be bit. I but transcribe, for not a line Of all the satire shall be mine. Compelled by you to tag in rhymes The common slanders of the times, Of modern times the guilt is yours, And me my innocence secures. Unwilling muse, begin thy lay, The annals of a female day. By nature turned to play the rake well, As we shall show you in the sequel, The modern dame is waked by noon, Some authors say not quite so soon. Because, though sore against her will, she sat all night up at quadrille, she stretches, gapes, unglues her eyes, and asks if it be time to rise, of headache and the spleen complains, and then to cool her heated brains, her nightgown and her slippers brought her, takes a large dram of citron water, then to her glass, and, Betty, pray, don't I look frightfully to-day? But was it not confounded hard? Well, if I ever touch a card, Four matadors and lose Cordille, Depend upon't, I never will. But run to Tom and bid him fix The ladies here to-night by six. Madame the goldsmith waits below, He says his business is to know If you'll redeem the silver cup He keeps in pawn. Why, show him up. Your dressing-plate he'll be content To take for interest cent per cent. And, madam, there's my lady spade, Has sent this letter by her maid. Well, I remember what she won, And has she sent so soon to done? Here, carry down these ten pistoles, My husband left to pay for coals. I thank my stars they all are light, And I may have revenge to-night. Now loitering o'er her tea and cream, She enters on her usual theme, her last night's ill success repeats, Calls Lady Spade a hundred cheats. She slipped spadillo in her breast, Then thought to turn it to a jest. There's Mrs. Cut and she combine, And to each other give the sign. Through every game pursues her tale, Like hunters o'er their evening ale. Now to another scene give place, Enter the folks with silks and lace. Fresh matter for a world of chat, Right Indian this, right Mechlin that. Observe this pattern, there's a stuff, I can have customers enough. Dear madam, you are grown so hard, this lace is worth twelve pounds a yard. Madam, if there be truth in man, I never sold so cheap a fan. This business of importance o'er, and madam almost dressed by four, the footman, in his usual phrase, comes up with, Madam, dinner stays. She answers in her usual style, The cook must keep it back a while, I never can have time to dress, No woman breathing takes up less, I'm hurried so it makes me sick, I wish the dinner at old Nick. At table now she acts her part, As all the dinner can't by heart. I thought we were to dine alone, My dear, for sure, if I'd known, This company would come to-day, But really tis my spouse's way. He's so unkind, he never sends, To tell when he invites his friends, I wish he may but have enough. And while with all this paltry stuff, She sits tormenting every guest, Nor gives her tongue one moment's rest, In phrases battered, stale, and trite, Which modern ladies call polite, You see the booby husband sit In admiration at her wit. But let me now a while survey our madam o'er her evening tea, surrounded with her noisy clans of prudes, coquettes, and harridans, when frighted at the clamorous crew, away the god of silence flew, and fair discretion left the place, and modesty with blushing face, now enters overweening pride, and scandal ever gaping wide, hypocrisy with frown severe, scurrility with jibing air, rude laughter seeming like to burst, and malice always judging worst, and vanity with pocket-glass, and impudence with front of brass, and studied affectation came, each limb and feature out of frame, while ignorance with brain of lead flew hovering o'er each female head. Why should I ask of thee, my muse, a hundred tongues as poets use, when to give every dame her due a hundred thousand were too few? Or how should I, alas, relate The sum of all their senseless prate, Their innuendos, hints, and slanders, Their meanings lewd and double entendres? Now come the general scandal charge, What some invent the rest enlarge? And, 
Madam, if it be a lie, you have the tale as cheap as I. I must conceal my author's name, but now 'tis known to common fame. Say, foolish females, bold and blind, say by what fatal turn of mind are you on vices most severe, wherein yourselves have greatest share? Thus every fool herself deludes, the prude condemns the absent prudes. Mopsa, who stinks her spouse to death, accuses Chloe's tainted breath. Her kin of rank with sweat presumes to censure Phyllis for perfumes, while crooked Cynthia sneering says that Florimel wears iron stays. Chloe, of every coxcomb jealous, admires how girls can talk with fellows, and full of indignation frets that women should be such coquettes. Iris, for scandal most notorious, cries, Lord, the world is so censorious, and Rufa, with her combs of lead, whispers that Sappho's hair is red. Ora, whose tongue you hear a mile hence, talks half a day in praise of silence. And Sylvia, full of inward guilt, calls Amoret an arrant jilt. Now voices over voices rise, while each to be the loudest vies. They contradict a firm dispute, no single tongue one moment mute. All mad to speak and none to hearken, they set the very lapdog barking. Their chattering makes a louder din than fishwives o'er a cup of gin. Not schoolboys at a barring out raised ever such incessant rout. The jumbling particles of matter in chaos made not such a clatter, far less the rabble roar and rail when drunk with sour election ale. Nor do they trust their tongues alone, but speak a language of their own. Can read a nod, a shrug, a look, far better than a printed book. Convey a libel in a frown, and wink a reputation down. Or by the tossing of the fan, describe the lady and the man. But see, the female club disbands, each twenty visits on her hands. Now all alone poor madam sits, in vapours and hysteric fits. It was not Tom this morning sent, I'd lay my life he never went, past six and not a living soul, I might by this have won a vol. A dreadful interval of spleen, how shall we pass the time between? Here, Betty, let me take my drops, and feel my pulse, I know it stops. This head of mine, Lord, how it swims, and such a pain in all my limbs. Dear madam, try to take a nap, but now they hear a footman's rap. Go, run and light the ladies up, it must be one before we sup. The table cards and counters set, and all the gamester ladies met. Her spleen and fits recovered quite, our madam can sit up all night. Whoever comes, I'm not within. Quadrilles the word, and so begin. How can the muse her aid impart, unskilled in all the terms of art, or in harmonious numbers put, the deal, the shuffle, and the cut? The superstitious whims relate that fill a female gamester's pate. What agony of soul she feels to see a knave's inverted heels. She draws up card by card to find good fortune peeping from behind. With panting heart and earnest eyes in hope to see Spadillo rise, in vain, alas, her hope is fed. She draws an ace and sees it red. And ready counters never pays, but pawns her snuff-box rings in K's. Ever with some new fancy struck, tries twenty charms to mend her luck. This morning, when the parson came, I said I should not win a game. This odious chair, how came I stuck in't? I think I never had good luck in't. I'm so uneasy in my stays. Your fan a moment, if you please. Stand farther, girl, or get you gone. I always lose when you look on. Lord, madam, you've lost Cadil. I never saw you play so ill. Nay, madam, give me leave to say, Twas you that threw the game away. When Lady Trixie played afore, You took it with a matador. I saw you touch your wedding ring Before my lady called a king. You spoke a word, began with H, And I know whom you meant to teach. Because you held the king of hearts, Fie, madam, leave these little arts. That's not so bad as one that rubs Her chair to call the king of clubs, And makes her partner understand A matador is in her hand. Madam, you have no cause to flounce, I swear I saw you thrice renounce. And truly, madam, I know when, instead of five, you scored me ten. Spadillo here has got a mark, a child may know it in the dark. I guess the hand, it seldom fails, I wish some folk would pare their nails. While thus they rail and scold and storm, it passes but for common form. But conscious that they all speak true, and give each other but their due, it never interrupts the game or makes them sensible of shame. The time too precious now to waste, the supper gobbled up in haste, 
Again afresh to cards they run, As if they had but just begun. But I shall not again repeat How oft they squabble, snarl, and cheat. At last they hear the watchman knock, A frosty morn past four o'clock. The chairmen are not to be found, Come, let us play the other round. Now all in haste they huddle on, Their hoods, their cloaks, and get them gone. But first the winner must invite The company to-morrow night. Unlucky madam, left in tears, Who now again quadrille for swift. Section 70 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Logicians Refuted Logicians have but ill-defined as rational the human kind. Reason, they say, belongs to man, but let them prove it if they can. Wise Aristotle and Smiglicius, by ratiocination specious, have strove to prove with great precision, with definition and division, homo est rationi preditum, but for my soul I cannot credit him, and must in spite of them maintain that man and all his ways are vain, and that this boasted lord of nature is both a weak and erring creature, that instinct is a surer guide than reason boasting mortal's pride and that brute beasts are far before him deus est anima brutorum whoever knew an honest brute at law his neighbour prosecute bring action for assault or battery or friend beguile with lies and flattery or plains they ramble unconfined no politics disturb their mind they eat their meals and take their sport, nor know who's in or out at court. They never to the levy go to treat as dearest friend a foe. They never importune his grace, nor ever cringe to men in place, nor undertake a dirty job, nor draw the quill to write for Bob. Fraught with invective they near go to folks at Paternoster Row, no judges, fiddlers, dancing masters, no pickpockets or poet-tasters are known to honest quadrupeds, no single brute his fellow leads. Brutes never meet in bloody fray, nor cut each other's throats for pay. Of beasts it is confessed the ape comes nearest us in human shape. Like man he imitates each fashion, and malice is his lurking passion. But both in malice and grimaces a courtier any ape surpasses. Behold him humbly cringing wait upon the minister of state. View him soon after to inferiors, aping the conduct of superiors. He promises with equal air, and to perform takes equal care. He in his turn finds imitators, at court the porters, lackeys, waiters. Their master's manners still contract, and footmen, lords, and duke. Section 71 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Elephant, or The Parliament Man Ere bribes convince you whom to choose, the precepts of Lord Coke peruse. Observe an elephant, says he, and let him like your member be. First take a man that's free from gall, for elephants have none at all. In flocks or parties he must keep, for elephants live just like sheep. Stubborn in honour he must be, for elephants near bend the knee. Last let his memory be sound, in which your elephants profound, that old examples from the wise may prompt him in his nose and eyes. Thus the Lord Coke hath gravely writ in all the forms of lawyer's wit, and then with Latin and all that, shows the comparison is pat. Yet in some points my lord is wrong, one's teeth are sold and t'other's tongue. Now men of parliament, God knows, are more like elephants of shows, whose docile memory and sense are turned to trick to gather pence. To get their master half a crown, they spread the flag, or lay it down, 
those who wore bulwarks on their backs and guarded nations from attacks now practice every pliant gesture opening their trunk for every tester siam for elephants so famed is not with england to be named their elephants by men are sold Section 72 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Paulus, an Epigram, by Mr. Lindsay, Dublin, September 7th, 1728. A slave to crowds, scorched with the summer's hets, In courts the wretched, lawyer toils and sweats, While smiling nature, in her best attire, regales each sense and vernal's joys inspire can he who knows that real good should please barter for gold his liberty and ease this paulus preached when entering at the door upon his board the client pours the ore he grasps the shining gift pours o'er the cause forgets the sun and dozes on the laws the Answer by Dr. Swift Lindsay mistakes the matter quite, and honest Paulus judges right. Then why these quarrels to the sun, without whose aid you're all undone? Did Paulus e'er complain of sweat? Did Paulus e'er the sun forget? The influence of whose golden beam soon licks up all unsavory steams. The sun, you say, his face has kissed. It has, but then it greased his fist. True lawyers for the wisest ends have always been Apollo's friends. Not for his superficial powers of ripening fruits and gilding flowers, not for inspiring poets' brains with penny less and starveling strains, not for his boasted healing art, not for his skill to shoot the dart, nor yet because he sweetly fiddles, nor for his prophecies in riddles, but for a more substantial cause, Apollo's patron of the laws whom Paulus ever must adore as parent of the golden ore, by Phoebus an incestuous birth begot upon his grandam earth, by Phoebus first produced to light, by Vulcan formed so round and bright, then offered at the shrine of justice by clients to her priests and trustees. Nor when we see Astraea stand with even balance in her hand, must we suppose she has in view how to give every man his due. Her scales you see her only hold, to weigh her priests the lawyer's gold. Now should I own your case was grievous, poor sweaty Paulus, who'd believe us? Tis very true, and none denies, at least that such complaints are wise. Tis wise, no doubt, as clients fat you more, to cry, like statesmen, quanta patamur. But since the truth must needs be stretched, to prove that lawyers are so wretched, this paradox I'll undertake for Paulus's and Lindsay's sake. By topics which, though I abomine, may serve as arguments ad hominem, yet I disdain to offer those made use of by detracting foes. I own the curses of mankind sit light upon a lawyer's mind. The clamours of ten thousand tongues break not his rest nor hurt his lungs. I own his conscience always free, provided he has got his fee. Secure of constant peace within, he knows no guilt who knows no sin. Yet well they merit to be pitied by clients always overwitted. And though the gospel seems to say what heavy burdens lawyers lay upon the shoulders of their neighbor, nor lend a finger to their labor, always for saving their own bacon, no doubt the text is here mistaken. The copy's false, the sense is racked, to prove it I appeal to fact. And thus by demonstration show what burdens lawyers undergo. With early clients at his door, though he was drunk the night before, and cropsick with unclubbed for wine, the wretch must be at court by nine, half sunk beneath his briefs and bag, as ridden by a midnight hag, then from the bar harangues the bench, in English vile and viler French, and Latin vilest of the three, and all for poor ten moidor's fee. Of paper how is he profuse, with periods long and terms abstruse, what pains he takes to be prolix, a thousand lines to stand for six! 
of common sense without a word in, and is not this a grievous burden? The lawyer is a common drudge to fight our cause before the judge, and what is yet a greater curse, condemned to bear his client's purse, while he at ease, secure and light, walks boldly home at dead of night, when term is ended, leaves the town, trots to his country mansion down, and disencumbered of his load, no danger dreads upon the road despises rapparees and rides safe through the newry mountain sides lindsay says you have set me on to state this question pro and con my satire may offend tis true however it concerns not you i own there may in every clan perhaps be found one honest man yet link them close in this they jump to be but rascals in the lump imagine lindsay at the bar he's much the same his brethren are well taught by practice to imbibe the fundamentals of his tribe, and in his client's just defence must deviate oft from common sense, and make his ignorance discerns to get the name of counsel learned, as Lucas comes a non lucendu and wisely do as other men do. But shift him to a better scene, among his crew of rogues in grain, surrounded with companions fit to taste his humour, sense, and wit, You'd swear he never took a fee, nor knew in law his A, B, C. Tis hard where dullness overrules to keep good sense in crowds of fools. And we admire the man who saves his honesty in crowds of knaves, nor yields up virtue at discretion to villains of his own profession. Lindsay, you know what pains you take, in both yet hardly save your stake. And will you venture both anew to sit among that venal crew, that pack of mimic legislators, abandoned stupid slavish praters? For as the rabble daub and rifle, the fool who scrambles for a trifle, who for his pains is cuffed and kicked, draws through the dirt his pockets picked, you must expect the like disgrace, scrambling with rogues to get a place, must lose the honour you have gained, your numerous virtues foully stained. Disclaim for ever all pretence to common. Section seventy three of the Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume One by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A dialogue. Between an eminent lawyer and Dr. Jonathan Swift, in allusion to Horace, Book Two, Satire One, written by Mr. Lindsay in 1729. Dr. Swift, since there are persons who complain there's too much satire in my vein, that I am often found exceeding the rules of raillery and breeding, with too much freedom treat my betters, not sparing even men of letters. You who are skilled in lawyers' lore, what's your advice? Shall I give o'er? Nor ever fools or knaves expose, either in verse or humorous prose, and to avoid all future ill in my scrutoire lock up my quill? Lawyer, since you are pleased to condescend to ask the judgment of a friend, your case considered, I must think, you should withdraw from pen and ink. Forbear your poetry and jokes, and live like other Christian folks. Or, if the muses must inspire your fancy with their pleasing fire, take subjects safer for your wit than those on which you lately writ. Commend the times your thoughts correct, and follow the prevailing sect. Assert that Hyde in writing story shows all the malice of a Tory, while Burnet in his deathless page discovers freedom without rage. To Woolston recommend our youth for learning, probity, and truth. That noble genius who unbinds the chains which fetter free-born minds redeems us from the slavish fears which lasted near two thousand years. He can alone the priesthood humble, make gilded spires and altars tumble. Dr. Swift must I commend against my conscience such stupid blasphemy and nonsense? To such a subject tune my lyre and sing like one of Milton's choir, where devils to a veil retreat and call the laws of wisdom fate, lament upon their hapless fall that force free virtue should enthrall? Or shall the charms of wealth and power make me pollute the muse's bower? Lawyer 
as from the tripod of apollo hear from my desk the words that follow some by philosophers misled must honour you alive and dead and such as know what greece has writ must taste your irony and wit while most that are or would be great must dread your pen your person hate Section 74 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On Burning a Dull Poem, 1729 An ass's hoof alone can hold That poisonous juice which kills by cold. Methought when I this poem read, No vessel but an ass's head Such frigid fustian could contain, I mean the head without the brain. The cold conceits, the chilling thoughts, went down like stupefying draughts. I found my head begin to swim, a numbness crept through every limb. In haste with eprecations dire, I threw the volume in the fire, when, who could think, though cold as ice, it burnt to ashes in a trice. Section 75 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. An Excellent New Ballad, or The True English Dean, to be Hanged for a Rape, 1730. Our brethren of England, who love us so dear, and in all they do for us so kindly do mean, a blessing upon them have sent us this year. For the good of our church, a true English dean. A holier priest near was wrapped up in crape. The worst you can say, he committed a rape. In his journey to Dublin he lighted at Chester, and there he grew fond of another man's wife, burst into her chamber and would have caressed her, but she valued her honour much more than her life. She bustled and struggled and made her escape to a room full of guests for fear of a rape. The dean he pursued to recover his game, and now to attack her again he prepares. But the company stood in defense of the dame. They cudgeled and cuffed him and kicked him downstairs. His deanship was now in a damnable scrape, and this was no time for committing a rape. To Dublin he comes, to the bango he goes, and orders the landlord to bring him a whore. No scruple came on him his gown to expose. "'Twas what all his life he had practised before. "'He made himself drunk with the juice of the grape, "'and got a good clap, but committed no rape. "'The dean and his landlord, a jolly comrade, "'resolved for a fortnight to swim in delight, "'for why they had both been brought up to the trade, "'of drinking all day and of whoring all night. "'His landlord was ready his deanship to ape "'in every debauch but committing a rape.' This Protestant zealot, this English divine, in church and in state was of principle sound, was truer than steel to the Hanover line, and grieved that a Tory should live above ground. Shall a subject so loyal be hanged by the nape for no other crime but committing a rape? By old popish canons as wise men have penned them, each priest had a concubine jury ecclesi, who'd be dean of Fernese without a commendum? and precedence we can produce if it please ye then why should the dean when whores are so chape be put to the peril and toil of a rape if fortune should please but to take such a crotchet to thee i apply great smedley's successor to give thee launce leaves a mitre and rochet whom wouldst thou resemble i leave thee a guesser but i only behold thee in atherton's shape for sodomy hanged as thou for a rape Ah, dost thou not envy the brave Colonel Charters, condemned for thy crime at threescore and ten? To hang him all England would lend him their garters. Yet he lives and is ready to ravish again. Then throttle thyself with an L of strong tape, for thou hast not a groat to atone for a rape. The dean he was vexed that his whores were so willing. He longed for a girl that would struggle and squall, 
He ravished her fairly and saved a good shilling, but here was to pay the devil and all. His troubles and sorrows now come in a hape, and hanged he must be for committing a rape. If maidens are ravished, it is their own choice. Why are they so wilful to struggle with men? If they would but lie quiet and stifle their voice, no devil nor dean could ravish them then. Nor would there be need of a strong hempen cape tied round the dean's neck for committing a rape. Our church and our state dear England maintains, for which all true Protestant hearts should be glad, she sends us our bishops, our judges, and deans, and better would give us if better she had. Section 76 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On Stephen Duck, the Thresher, and Favorite Poet. A Quibbling Epigram, 1730. The Thresher Duck could o'er the Queen prevail. The proverb says, no fence against a flail. From threshing corn he turns to thresh his brains, for which her majesty allows him grains though tis confessed that those who ever saw his poems think them all not worth a straw thrice happy duck Section 77 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Ladies' Dressing Room, 1730 Five hours, and who can do it less in, by haughty Celia spent in dressing? The goddess from her chamber issues, arrayed in lace, brocades, and tissues. Strephon, who found the room was void, and Betty otherwise employed, stole in and took a strict survey of all the litter as it lay whereof to make the matter clear an inventory follows here and first a dirty smock appeared beneath the armpits well besmeared strephon the rogue displayed it wide and turned it round on every side on such a point few words are best and strephon bids us guess the rest but swears how damnably the men lie in calling celia sweet and clanly now listen while he next produces the various combs for various uses. Filled up with dirt so closely fixed, no brush could force a way betwixt. A paste of composition rare, sweat dandruff powder, lead, and hair. A forehead cloth with oil upon't to smooth the wrinkles on her front. Here alum flower to stop the steams exhaled from sour unsavory streams. There night gloves made of Tripsy's hide bequeathed by Tripsy when she died with puppy water beauty's help, distilled from Tripsy's darling whelp. Here gallipots and vials placed, some filled with washes, some with paste, some with pomatums, paints, and slops, and ointments good for scabby chops. Hard by a filthy basin stands, fouled with the scouring of her hands. The basin takes whatever comes, the scrapings from her teeth and gums, a nasty compound of all hues, for here she spits and here she spews. But, oh, it turned poor Strephon's bowels when he beheld and smelt the towels. Be gummed, be mattered, and be slimed with dirt and sweat and earwax grimed. No object Strephon's eye escapes, here petticoats in frowsy hapes. Nor be the handkerchiefs forgot, all varnished o'er with snuff and snot. The stockings, why should I expose, stained with the moisture of her toes? Or greasy coifs and pinners reeking, which Celia slept at least a week in? A pair of tweezers next he found, to pluck her brows in arches round, or hairs that sink the forehead low, or on her chin like bristles grow. The virtues we must not let pass of Celia's magnifying glass. When frighted Strephon cast his eye on, it showed the visage of a giant, a glass that can to sight disclose the smallest worm in Celia's nose, and faithfully direct her nail to squeeze it out from head to tail. For catch it nicely by the head, it must come out alive or dead. 
why strephon will you tell the rest and must you needs describe the chest that careless wench no creature warn her to move it out from yonder corner but leave it standing full in sight for you to exercise your spite in vain the workman shewed his wit with rings and hinges counterfeit to make it seem in this disguise a cabinet to vulgar eyes which strephon ventured to look in resolved to go through thick and thin he lifts the lid there needs no more he smelt it all the time before as from within pandora's box when epimetheus oped the locks a sudden universal crew of human evils upward flew he still was comforted to find that hope at last remained behind so strephon lifting up the lid to view what in the chest was hid the vapours flew from up the vent but strephon cautious never meant the bottom of the pan to grope and foul his hands in search of hope O oh, near may such a vile machine be once in Celia's chamber seen! O oh, may she better learn to keep those secrets of the hoary deep, as mutton cutlets prime of meat, which though with art you salt and beat, as laws of cookery require, and toast them at the clearest fire. If from upon the hopeful chops the fat upon a cinder drops, to stinking smoke it turns the flame, poisoning the flesh from whence it came and up exhales a greasy stench for which you curse the careless wench so things which must not be expressed when dropped into the reeking chest sent up an excremental smell to taint the part from whence they fell the petticoats and gown perfume and waft a stink round every room thus finishing his grand survey disgusted strephon slunk away repeating in his amorous fits o oh, celia 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 shits but vengeance goddess never sleeping soon punished strephon for his peeping his foul imagination links each dame he sees with all her stinks and if unsavoury odours fly conceives a lady standing by all women his deception fits and both ideas jump like wits by vicious fancy coupled fast and still appearing in contrast i pity wretched strephon blind to all the charms of womankind should i the queen of love refuse because she rose from stinking ooze to him that looks behind the scene statir is but some pocky queen when celia in her glory shoes if strephon would but stop his nose who now so impiously blasphemes her ointments daubs and paints and creams her washes slops and every clout with which he makes so foul a rout he soon would learn to think like me and bless his ravished sight to see such Section 78 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Power of Time, 1730 If neither brass nor marble can withstand The mortal force of time's destructive hand, If mountains sink to vales, if cities die, And lessening rivers mourn their fountains dry, when my old cassock section seventy nine of the poems of jonathan swift volume one by jonathan swift this librivox recording is in the public domain cassinus and peter a tragical elegy 1731. Two college sophs of Cambridge growth, both special wits and lovers both, conferring as they used to meet on love and books in rapture sweet. Muse, find me names to fit my meter, Cassinus this and t'other Peter. Friend Peter to Cassinus goes to chat a while and warm his nose, but such a sight was never seen, the lad lay swallowed up in spleen. He seemed as just crept out of bed, one greasy stocking round his head, the other he sat down to darn with threads of different coloured yarn, his breeches torn, exposing wide, a ragged shirt and tawny hide. Scorched were his shins, his legs were bare, but well embrowned with dirt and hair. 
A rug was o'er his shoulders thrown, A rug for nightgown he had none. His Jordan stood in manner fitting Between his legs to spew or spit in. His ancient pipe in sable dyed, And half unsmoked, lay by his side. Him thus accoutred Peter found, With eyes in smoke and weeping drowned. The leavings of his last night's pot On embers placed to drink it hot. Why, Cassie, thou wilt dose thy pate, What makes thee lie abed so late? The finch, the linnet, and the thrush, Their matins chant in every bush. And I have heard thee oft salute Aurora with thy early flute. Heaven send thou hast not got the hips, How, not a word come from thy lips? Then gave him some familiar thumps, A college joke to cure the dumps. The swain at last, with grief oppressed, Cried, Celia, thrice, and sighed the rest. Dear Cassie, though to ask I dread, Yet ask I must, is Celia dead? How happy I were that the worst, But I was fated to be cursed. Come tell us, has she played the whore? Oh, Peter, would it were no more. Why plague confound her sandy locks? Say, has the small or greater pox Sunk down her nose or seamed her face? Be easy, tis a common case. O oh, Peter, beauty's but a varnish, Which time and accidents will tarnish. But Celia has contrived to blast Those beauties that might ever last. Nor can imagination guess, Nor eloquence divine express, How that ungrateful charming maid My purest passion has betrayed. Conceive the most envenomed dart To pierce an injured lover's heart. Why hang her, though she seemed so coy? I know she loves the barber's boy. Friend Peter, this I could excuse, For every nymph has leave to choose. Nor have I reason to complain, She loves a more deserving swain. But, oh, how ill hast thou divined, A crime that shocks all humankind, A deed unknown to female race, At which the sun should hide his face. Advice in vain you would apply, Then leave me to despair and die. Ye kind Arcadians on my urn, These elegies and sonnets burn, And on the marble grave these rhymes, A monument to after times. Here Cassie lies, by Celia slain, And dying never told his pain. Vain empty world, farewell, but hark, The loud Serberian triple bark, And there, behold, Electo stand, a whip of scorpions in her hand. Lo, Charon from his leaky wary, beckoning to waft me o'er the fairy. I come, I come, Medusa, see, her serpents hiss direct at me. Be gone, unhand me, hellish fry. Avaunt, ye cannot say, twas I. Dear Cassie, thou must purge and bleed, I fear thou wilt be mad indeed. But now, my friendship's sacred laws, I here conjure thee, tell the cause. And Celia's horrid fact relate, Thy friend would gladly share thy fate. To force it out my heart must rend, Yet when conjured by such a friend, Think, Peter, how my soul is racked. These eyes, these eyes beheld the fact. Now bend thine ear, since out it must, But when thou seest me laid in dust, the secret thou shalt near impart, Not to the nymph that keeps thy heart. How would her virgin soul bemoan A crime to all her sex unknown? Nor whisper to the tattling reeds The blackest of all female deeds, Nor blab it on the lonely rocks Where Echo sits and listening mocks. Nor let the zephyr's treacherous gale Through Cambridge waft the direful tale, Nor to the chattering feathered race Discover Celia's foul disgrace. But if you fail, my spectre dread, Attending nightly round your bed, And yet I dare confide in you, So take my secret and adieu. Nor one Section 80 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Beautiful Young Nymph Going to Bed Written for the Honor of the Fair Sex, 1731 
Corinna, pride of Drury Lane, For whom no shepherd sighs in vain, Never did Covent Garden boast So bright a battered strolling toast. No drunken rake to pick her up, No cellar where on tick to sup, Returning at the midnight hour, Four stories climbing to her bower. Then, seated on a three-legged chair, Takes off her artificial hair. Now, picking out a crystal eye, She wipes it clean and lays it by. Her eyebrows from a mouse's hide, Stuck on with art on either side, Pulls off with care, and first displays em, Then in a playbook smoothly lays em. Now dexterously her plumpers draws, that serve to fill her hollow jaws, untwists a wire and from her gums a set of teeth completely comes, pulls out the rags contrived to prop her flabby dugs and down they drop, proceeding on the lovely goddess unlaces next her steel-ribbed bodice, which by the operator's skill press down the lumps the hollows fill. Up goes her hand, and off she slips, The bolsters that supply her hips. With gentlest touch she next explores, Her chankers, issues, running sores, Effects of many a sad disaster, And then to each applies a plaster. But must, before she goes to bed, Rub off the daubs of white and red, And smooth the furrows in her front, with greasy paper stuck upon it. She takes a bolus ere she sleeps, And then between two blankets creeps, With pains of love tormented lies, Or, if she chance to close her eyes, Of Bridewell and the Compter dreams, And feels the lash and faintly screams, Or by a faithless bully drawn, at some hedge tavern lies in pawn, Or to Jamaica seems transported, Alone, and by no planter courted. Or near fleet ditches, oozy brinks, Surrounded with a hundred stinks, Belated seems on watch to lie, And snap some cully passing by. Or struck with fear her fancy runs On watchmen, constables, and duns, for whom she meets with frequent rubs, but never from religious clubs, whose favor she is sure to find, because she pays them all in kind. Corinna wakes, a dreadful sight, behold the ruins of the night, a wicked rat her plaster stole, half eat and dragged it to his hole, the crystal eye, alas, was missed, and Puss had on her plumpers pissed. A pigeon picked her issue peas, And shock her tresses filled with fleas. The nymph, though in this mangled plight, Must every morn her limbs unite. But how shall I describe her arts To recollect the scattered parts, Or show the anguish, toil, and pain Of gathering up herself again? The bashful muse will never bear In such a scene to interfere. Corinna in the morning Section 81 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1 by Jonathan Swift this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strephon and Chloe, 1731 Of Chloe all the town has rung, By every size of poets sung. So beautiful a nymph appears But once in twenty thousand years, By nature formed with nicest care, And faultless to a single hair. Her graceful mien, her shape and face, Confessed her of no mortal race, And then so nice and so genteel, Such cleanliness from head to heel, 
No humours gross or frowsy steams, No noisome whiffs or sweaty streams, Before, behind, above, below, Could from her taintless body flow. Would so discreetly things dispose, None ever saw her pluck a rose. Her dearest comrades never caught her Squat on her hams to make maids water. You'd swear that so divine a creature Felt no necessities of nature. In summer, had she walked the town, Her armpits would not stain her gown. At country dances not a nose Could in the dog days smell her toes. Her milk-white hands, both palms and backs, Like ivory dry and soft as wax, her hands the softest ever felt, Though cold would burn, though dry would melt. Dear Venus, hide this wondrous maid, Nor let her loose to spoil your trade. While she engrosses every swain, You but o'er half the world can reign. Think what a case all men are now in, What ogling, sighing, toasting, vowing, What powdered wigs, what flames and darts, What hampers full of bleeding hearts. What sword knots, what poetic strains, what billet dew and clouded canes, but Strephon sighed so loud and strong, he blew a settlement along, and bravely drove his rivals down with coach and six and house in town. The bashful nymph no more withstands, because her dear papa commands. The charming couple now unites, proceed we to the marriage rites. Imprimis at the temple porch, Stood Hymen with a flaming torch, The smiling Cyprian goddess brings Her infant loves with purple wings, And pigeons billing, sparrows treading, Fair emblems of a fruitful wedding. The muses next in order follow, Conducted by their squire Apollo, Then Mercury with silver tongue, And he be goddess ever young. Behold the bridegroom and his bride, Walk hand in hand, side by side, She by the tender graces dressed, But he by Mars in scarlet vest. The nymph was covered with her flamium, And Phoebus sung the epithalamium. And last, to make the matter sure, Dame Juno brought a priest demure. Luna was absent on pretense, Her time was not till nine months hence. The rites performed, the parson paid, in state returned the grand parade, With loud huzzas from all the boys, That now the pair must crown their joys. But still the hardest part remains. Strephon had long perplexed his brains, How, with so high a nymph he might, Demean himself the wedding night. For, as he viewed his person round, Mere mortal flesh was all he found. His hand, his neck, his mouth, and feet, were duly washed to keep them sweet, with other parts that shall be nameless, the ladies else might think me shameless. The weather and his love were hot, and should he struggle, I know what, why let it go, if I must tell it? He'll sweat, and then the nymph may smell it. While she, a goddess, died in grain, was unsusceptible of stain, and Venus-like her fragrant skin, Exhaled ambrosia from within. Can such a deity endure, A mortal human touch impure? How did the humbled swain detest His prickly beard and hairy breast? His nightcap bordered round with lace Could give no softness to his face. Yet if the goddess could be kind, What endless raptures must he find? And goddesses have now and then come down to visit mortal men, to visit and to court them too. A certain goddess, God knows who, as in a book he heard it read, took Colonel Peleus to her bed. But what if he should lose his life by venturing on his heavenly wife? For Strephon could remember well that once he heard a schoolboy tell how Semele of mortal race by thunder died in Jove's embrace. And what if daring Strephon dies by lightning shot from Chloe's eyes? While these reflections filled his head, the bride was put in form to bed. He followed, stripped, and in he crept, but awfully his distance kept. 
Now ponder well, ye parents dear, Forbid your daughters guzzling beer, And make them every afternoon Forbear their tea, or drink it soon, That ere to bed they venture up, They may discharge it every sup. If not, they must in evil plight Be often forced to rise at night. Keep them to wholesome food confined, Nor let them taste what causes wind. Tis this the sage of Samos means, Forbidding his disciples beans. Oh, think what evils must ensue, Miss Mole the jade will burn it blue. And when she once has got the art, She cannot help it for her heart. But out it flies, even when she meets Her bridegroom in the wedding sheets. Carminative and diuretic Will damp all passion sympathetic. And love such nicety requires, One blast will put out all his fires. Since husbands get behind the scene, The wife should study to be clean, Nor give the smallest room to guess The time when wants of nature press. But after marriage practice more decorum Than she did before, To keep her spouse deluded still, And make him fancy what she will. In bed we left the married pair, "'Tis time to show how things went there. "'Strephon, who had been often told "'that fortune still assists the bold, "'resolved to make the first attack, "'but Chloe drove him fiercely back. "'How could a nymph so chaste as Chloe, "'with constitution cold and snowy, "'permit a brutish man to touch her? "'Even lambs by instinct fly the butcher.' Resistance on the wedding night is what our maidens claim by right. And Chloe, tis by all agreed, was made in thought, in word, and deed. Yet some assign a different reason, that Strephon chose no proper season. Say, fair ones, must I make a pause, or freely tell the secret cause? Twelve cups of tea, with grief I speak, had now constrained the nymph to leak. This point must needs be settled first. The bride must either void or burst. Then see the dire effects of peas. Think what can give the colic ease. The nymph oppressed before, behind, as ships are tossed by waves and wind, steals out her hand by nature led, and brings a vessel into bed. Fair utensil as smooth and white as Chloe's skin, almost as bright. Strephon, who heard the fuming rill, as from a mossy cliff distill, cried out, Ye gods, what sound is this? Can Chloe, heavenly Chloe, piss? But when he smelt a noisome steam, which oft attends that lukewarm stream, Salerno both together joins, as sovereign medicines for the loins, and though contrived, we may suppose, to slip his ears, yet struck his nose. He found her, while the scent increased, as mortal as himself, at least. But soon, with like occasions pressed, he boldly sent his hand in quest, inspired with courage from his bride, to reach the pot on t'other side. And as he filled the reeking vase, let fly a rouser in her face. The little cupids hovering round, as pictures prove, with garlands crowned, abashed at what they saw and heard, flew off nor ever more appeared. Adieu to ravishing delights, high raptures and romantic flights, to goddesses so heavenly sweet, expiring shepherds at their feet, to silver meads and shady bowers dressed up with amaranthine flowers. How great a change, how quickly made! They learned to call a spade a spade. They soon from all constraint are freed, Can see each other do their deed. On box of cedar sits the wife, And makes it warm for dearest life, And by the beastly way of thinking Find great society in stinking. Now Strephon daily entertains His Chloe in the homeliest strains, And Chloe, more experienced grown, With interest pays him back his own. No maid at court is less ashamed Howe'er for selling bargains famed, Than she to name her parts behind, Or, when abed, to let out wind. Fair decency, celestial maid, 
descend from heaven to beauty's aid. Though beauty may beget desire, tis thou must fan the lover's fire. For beauty, like supreme dominion, is best supported by opinion. If decency bring no supplies, opinion falls, and beauty dies. To see some radiant nymph appear in all her glittering birthday gear, you think some goddess from the sky descended ready cut and dry. But ere you sell yourself to laughter, consider well what may come after. For fine ideas vanish fast, while all the gross and filthy last. O oh, Strephon, ere that fatal day, when Chloe stole your heart away, had you but through a cranny spied, on house of ease your future bride, in all the postures of her face, which nature gives in such a case, distortions, groanings, strainings, heavings, twere better you had licked her leavings, than from experience find too late your goddess grown a filthy mate. Your fancy then had always dwelt on what you saw and what you smelt, would still the same ideas give ye as when you spied her on the privy. And, spite of Chloe's charms divine, your heart had been as whole as mine. Authorities both old and recent direct that women must be decent, and from the spouse each blemish hide, more than from all the world beside. Unjustly all our nymphs complain their empire holds so short a reign. Is after marriage lost so soon it hardly lasts the honeymoon? For if they keep not what they caught, it is entirely their own fault. They take possession of the crown, and then throw all their weapons down. Though by the politician's scheme, whoe'er arrives at power supreme, those arts by which at first they gain it, they still must practice to maintain it. What various ways our females take to pass for wits before a rake, and in the fruitless search pursue all other methods but the true? Some try to learn polite behavior by reading books against their savior. Some call it witty to reflect on every natural defect. Some shoe they never want explaining to comprehend a double meaning. But sure a tell-tale out of school is of all which the greatest fool, whose rank imagination fills her heart and from her lips distills. You'd think she uttered from behind or at her mouth was breaking wind. Why is a handsome wife adored by every coxcomb but her lord? From yonder puppet-man inquire, who wisely hides his wood and wire, shows Sheba's queen completely dressed, and Solomon in royal vest. But view them littered on the floor, or strung on pegs behind the door, Punch is exactly of a piece with Lorraine's duke and prince of Greece. A prudent builder should forecast how long the stuff is like to last, and carefully observe the ground to build on some foundation sound. What house, when its materials crumble, must not inevitably tumble? What edifice can long endure, raised on a basis unsecure? Rash mortals, ere you take a wife, contrive your pile to last for life. Since beauty scarce endures a day, and youth so swiftly glides away, why will you make yourself a bubble to build on sand with hay and stubble? On sense and wit your passion found, by decency cemented round, let prudence with good nature strive to keep esteem and love alive. Then come old age, whene'er it will, your friendship shall continue still. And thus a mutual gentle Section eighty two of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume One by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Apollo or a Problem Solved. 1731. Apollo, god of light and wit, could verse inspire but seldom writ, refined all metals with his looks, as well as chemists by their books, as handsome as my lady's page, sweet five-and-twenty was his age. His wig was made of sunny rays, he crowned his youthful head with bays. 
Not all the court of heaven could show So nice and so complete a beau. No heir upon his first appearance With twenty thousand pounds a year rents, E'er drove before he sold his land So fine a coach along the strand. The spokes, we are by Ovid told, Were silver and the axle gold. I own twas but a coach and four, For Jupiter allows no more. Yet with his beauty, wealth, and parts, Enough to win ten thousand hearts, No vulgar deity above Was so unfortunate in love. Three weighty causes were assigned That moved the nymphs to be unkind. Nine muses always waiting round him, He left them virgins as he found them. His singing was another fault, For he could reach to be in alt. And by the sentiments of Pliny, Such singers are like Nicolini. At last, Section 83 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Place of the Damned, 1731. All folks who pretend to religion and grace allow there's a hell but dispute of the place. But if hell may by logical rules be defined, the place of the damned, I'll tell you my mind. Wherever the damned do chiefly abound, most certainly there is hell to be found. Damned poets, damned critics, damned blockheads, damned knaves, damned senators bribed, damned prostitute slaves, damned lawyers and judges, damned lords and damned squires, damned spies and informers, damned friends and damned liars, damned villains corrupted in every station, damned time-serving priests all over the nation, and into the bargain I'll readily give ye damned ignorant prelates and counsellors privy. Then let us no longer by parsons be flammed, for we know by these marks the place of the damned. Section 84 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Day of Judgment With a whirl of thought oppressed, I sunk from reverie to rest. An horrid vision seized my head, I saw the graves give up their dead. Jove armed with terrors bursts the skies, And thunder roars and lightning flies. Amazed, confused, its fate unknown, the world stands trembling at his throne. While each pale sinner hung his head, Jove nodding shook the heavens and said, Offending race of humankind, by nature, reason, learning, blind, you who through frailty stepped aside, and you who never fell through pride, you who in different sects were shammed, And come to see each other damned. So some folk told you, but they knew No more of Jove's designs than you. The world's mad business now is o'er, And I resent these pranks no more. I to such blockheads set my wit, I Section 85 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Judas, 1731 By the just vengeance of incensed skies, Poor Bishop Judas late repenting dies. The Jews engaged him with a paltry bribe, Amounting hardly to a crown a tribe, Which, though his conscience forced him to restore, and parsons tell us no man can do more, yet through despair of God and man accursed, he lost his bishopric and hanged or burst. Those former ages differed much from this. Judas betrayed his master with a kiss. But some have kissed the gospel fifty times, whose perjury's the least of all their crimes. Some who can perjure through a two-inch board, 
yet keep their bisher bricks and scape the cord like hemp which by a skilful spinster drawn to slender threads may sometimes pass for lawn as ancient judas by transgression fell and burst asunder ere he went to hell so could we see a set of new ice cariots come headlong tumbling from their mitred chariots each modern judas perish like the first drop from the tree with all his bowels burst who could forbear that viewed each guilty face to cry lo judas gone to his own place Section 86 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. An Epistle to Mr. Gay, 1731 How could you, Gay, disgrace the Muse's train, To serve a tasteless court twelve years in vain? Fain would I think our female friend sincere, Till Bob, the poet's foe, possessed her ear. Did female virtue e'er so high ascend to lose an inch of favor for a friend? Say, had the court no better place to choose for Trii than make a dry nurse of thy muse? How cheaply had thy liberty been sold to squire a royal girl of two years old, in leading strings her infant steps to guide, or with her go cart amble side by side? But princely Douglas and his glorious dame advanced thy fortune and preserved thy fame. Nor will your nobler gifts be misapplied when o'er your patron's treasure you preside. The world shall own his choice was wise and just, for sons of Phoebus never break their trust. Not love of beauty less the heart inflames of guardian eunuchs to the sultan's dames their passions not more impotent and cold than those of poets to the lust of gold with paean's purest fire his favorites glow the dregs will serve to ripen or below his meanest work for had he thought it fit that wealth should be the appanage of wit the god of light could ne'er have been so blind to deal it to the worst of humankind. But let me now, for I can do it well, your conduct in this new employ foretell. And first, to make my observation right, I place a statesman full before my sight, a bloated minister in all his gear, with shameless visage and perfidious leer. Two rows of teeth arm each devouring jaw, An ostrich like his all digesting maw. My fancy drags this monster to my view, To shew the world his chief reverse in you. Of loud unmeaning sounds a rapid flood Rolls from his mouth in plenteous streams of mud. With these the court and senate house he plies, made up of noise and impudence and lies. Now let me show how Bob and you agree. You serve a potent prince as well as he. The ducal coffers trusted to your charge. Your honest care may fill, perhaps enlarge. His vassals easy and the owner blessed. They pay a trifle and enjoy the rest. Not so a nation's revenues are paid. The servants' faults are on their master laid. The people with a sigh their taxes bring, And cursing Bob forget to bless the king. Next here can gay to what thy charge requires, With servants, tenants, and the neighboring squires. Let all domestics feel your gentle sway, Nor bribe, insult, nor flatter, nor betray. Let due reward to merit be allowed, nor with your kindred half the palace crowd, nor think yourself secure in doing wrong, by telling noses with a party strong, be rich, but of your wealth make no parade, at least before your master's debts are paid, 
nor in a palace built with charge immense, presume to treat him at his own expense. Each farmer in the neighborhood can count to what your lawful perquisites amount. The tenants poor the hardness of the times are ill excuses for a servant's crimes. With interest and a premium paid beside, the master's pressing wants must be supplied. With hasty zeal behold the steward come, by his own credit to advance the sum, who, while the unrighteous mammum is his friend, may well conclude his power will never end. A faithful treasurer, what could he do more? He lends my lord what was my lord's before. The law so strictly guards the monarch's health, that no physician dares prescribe by stealth. The council sit approve the doctor's skill, and give advice before he gives the pill. But the state empiric acts a safer part, and while he poisons, wins the royal heart. But how can I describe the ravenous breed? Then let me now by negatives proceed. Suppose your lord a trusty servant send, on weighty business to some neighboring friend, Presume not gay unless you serve a drone to countermand his orders by your own. Should some imperious neighbor sink the boats and drain the fish ponds while your master dotes, shall he upon the ducal rights entrench because he bribed you with a brace of tench? Nor from your lord his bad condition hide to feed his luxury or soothe his pride, nor at an underrate his timber sell, and with an oath assure him all is well, or swear it rotten and with humble airs, request it of him to complete your stairs, nor when a mortgage lies on half his lands, come with a purse of guineas in your hands, have Peter Waters always in your mind, that rogue of genuine ministerial kind, can half the peerage by his arts bewitch, starve twenty lords to make one scoundrel rich? And when he gravely has undone a score, is humbly prayed to ruin twenty more. A dexterous steward, when his tricks are found, Hush money sends to all the neighbors round. His master, unsuspicious of his pranks, Pays all the cost and gives the villain thanks. And should a friend attempt to set him right, His lordship would impute it all to spite, Would love his favorite better than before, And trust his honesty just so much more. Thus families like realms with equal fate, are sunk by premier ministers of state. Some, when an heir succeeds, go bodily on, and, as they rob the father, rob the son. A knave who deep embroils his lord's affairs will soon grow necessary to his heirs. His policy consists in setting traps, in finding ways and means and stopping gaps. He knows a thousand tricks when e'er he please, though not to cure, yet palliate each disease. In either case an equal chance is run, for keep or turn him out, my lord's undone. You want a hand to clear a filthy sink, no cleanly workman can endure the stink. A strong dilemma in a desperate case, to act with infamy or quit the place. A bungler thus who scarce the nail can hit, with driving wrong will make the panel split. Nor dares an abler workman undertake to drive a second lest the whole should break. In every court the parallel will hold, and kings like private folks are bought and sold. The ruling rogue who dreads to be cashiered Contrives as he is hated to be feared, confounds accounts, perplexes all affairs, 
For vengeance more embroils than skill repairs. So robbers and their ends are just the same. To scape inquiries leave the house in flame. I knew a brazen minister of state who bore for twice ten years the public hate. In every mouth the question most in vogue was, when will they turn out this odious rogue? A juncture happened in his highest pride. While he went robbing on, his master died. We thought there now remained no room to doubt. The work is done, the minister must out. The court invited more than one or two. Will you, Sir Spencer, or will you, or you? But not a soul his office durst accept. The subtle knave had all the plunder swept. And such was then the temper of the times. He owed his preservation to his crimes. The candidates observed his dirty paws, Nor found it difficult to guess the cause. But when they smelt such foul corruptions round him, Away they fled and left him as they found him. Thus when a greedy sloven Section 87 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To a lady who desired the author to write some verses upon her in the heroic style. After venting all my spite, tell me, what have I to write? Every error I could find through the mazes of your mind have my busy muse employed till the company was cloyed. Are you positive and fretful, heedless, ignorant, forgetful? Those in twenty follies more I have often told before. Here can what my lady says, have I nothing then to praise? Ill it fits you to be witty, where a fault should move your pity. If you think me too conceited, or to passion quickly heated, if my wandering head be less set on reading than on dress, if I always seem too dull to ye, I can solve the difficulty. You would teach me to be wise, truth and honour, how to prize, how to shine in conversation, and with credit fill my station, how to relish notions high, how to live, and how to die. But it was decreed by fate, Mr. Dean, you come too late. Well, I know you can discern, I am now too old to learn. Follies from my youth instilled have my soul entirely filled. In my head and heart they centre, nor will let your lessons enter. Bred a fondling and an heiress, dressed like any lady mares, cockered by the servants round, was too good to touch the ground. Thought the life of every lady should be one continued play-day, balls and masquerades and shows, visits, plays, and powdered bows. Thus you have my case at large, and may now perform your charge. Those materials I have furnished, when by you refined and burnished, must, that all the world may know him, be reduced into a poem. But I beg, suspend a while, that same paltry burlesque style, drop for once your constant rule, turning all to ridicule, teaching others how to ape you, court nor parliament can scape you, treat the public and your friends both alike while neither mends. Sing my praise in strain sublime, treat me not with doggerel rhyme, "'Tis but just you should produce, with each fault, each fault's excuse. "'Not to publish every trifle, and my few perfections stifle. "'With some gifts at least endow me, which my very foes allow me. "'Am I spiteful, proud, unjust? Did I ever break my trust? "'Which of all our modern dames censures less or less defames? "'In good manners am I faulty? Can you call me rude or haughty?' Did I ear my might withhold from the impotent and old? When did ever I omit due regard for men of wit? When have I esteem expressed for a coxcomb gaily dressed? Do I, like the female tribe, think it wit to fleer and jibe? Who with less designing ends kindlier entertains her friends? With good words and countenance sprightly strives to treat them more politely? 
Think not cards my chief diversion, 'tis a wrong, unjust aspersion. Never knew I any good in them, but to douse my head like laudanum. We by play, as men by drinking, pass our nights to drive out thinking. From my ailments give me leisure, I shall read and think with pleasure. Conversation learn to relish, and with books my mind embellish. Now methinks I hear you cry, Mr. Dean, you must reply. Madame, I allow tis true, all these praises are your due. You, like some acute philosopher, every fault have drawn a gloss over. Placing in the strongest light all your virtues to my sight, though you lead a blameless life, are an humble, prudent wife. Answer all domestic ends. What is this to us, your friends? Though your children, by a nod, stand in awe without a rod, though by your obliging sway servants love you and obey, though you treat us with a smile, clear your looks and smooth your style, load our plates from every dish, this is not the thing we wish. Colonel Blank may be your debtor, we expect employment better. You must learn, if you would gain us, with good sense to entertain us. Scholars, when good sense describing, call it tasting and imbibing. Metaphoric meat and drink is to understand and think. We may carve for others thus, and let others carve for us. To discourse and to attend is to help yourself and friend. Conversation is but carving. Carve for all, yourself is starving. Give no more to every guest than he's able to digest. Give him always of the prime, and but little at a time. Carve to all but just enough. Let them neither starve nor stuff. And that you may have your due, let your neighbors carve for you. This comparison will hold, could it well in rhyme be told. How conversing, listening, thinking, justly may resemble drinking. For a friend a glass you fill, what is this but to instill? To conclude this long essay, pardon if I disobey, nor against my natural vein treat you in heroic strain. I, as all the parish knows, hardly can be grave in prose. Still to lash and lashing smile ill befits a lofty style. From the planet of my birth I encounter vice with mirth. Wicked ministers of state I can easier scorn than hate. And I find it answers right. Scorn torments them more than spite. All the vices of a court do but serve to make me sport. Were I in some foreign realm which all vices overwhelm, should a monkey wear a crown, must I tremble at his frown? Could I not, through all his ermine, spy the strutting, chattering vermin, safely write a smart lampoon to expose the brisk baboon? When my muse officious ventures on the nation's representers, teaching by what golden rules into knaves they turn their fools, how the helm is ruled by Walpole, at whose oars like slaves they all pull, let the vessels split on shelves with the freight enrich themselves. Safe within my little wherry, all their madness makes me merry. Like the waterman of Thames, I row by and call them names. Like the ever-laughing sage, in a jest I spend my rage. Though it must be understood, I would hang them if I could. If I can but fill my niche, I attempt no higher pitch. Leave to Danvers and his mate maxims wise to rule the state. Pulteney deep accomplished St. John scourge the villains with a vengeance. Let me, though the smell be noisome, strip their bums, let Caleb hoisem. Then apply Electo's whip till they wriggle, howl, and skip. Deuce is in you, Mr. Dean. What can all this passion mean? Mention courts, you'll ne'er be quiet on corruption's running riot. And as it befits your station, come to use and application, nor with senates keep a fuss. I submit an answer thus. If the machinations brewing to compete the public ruin never once could have the power to affect me half an hour, sooner would I write in buskins mournful elegies on blueskins. If I laugh at Whig and Tory, I conclude a fortiori. All your eloquence will scarce drive me from my favorite farce. This I must insist on for as it is well observed by Horace. Ridicule has greater power to reform the world than sour. Horses thus let jockeys judge else, switching better guides than cudgels. 
bastings heavy, dry, obtuse, only dullness can produce, while a little gentle jerking sets the spirits all a-working. Thus I find it by experiment, scolding moves you less than merriment. I may storm and rage in vain, it but stupefies your brain, but with raillery to nettle, sets your thoughts upon their metal, gives imagination scope, never lets your mind elope, drives out brangling and contention, brings in reason and invention. For your sake as well as mine, I the lofty style decline. I should make a figure scurvy, and your head turn topsy-turvy. I who love to have a fling, both at Senate House and King, that they might some better way tread to avoid the public hatred, thought no method more commodious than to show their vices odious, which I chose to make appear not by anger but by sneer. As my method of reforming is by laughing, not by storming, for my friends have always thought tenderness my greatest fault. Would you have me change my style, on your faults no longer smile, but to patch up all our quarrels, quote your texts from Plutarch's morals, or from Solomon produce maxims teaching wisdom's use? If I treat you like a crowned head, you have cheap enough compounded. Can you put in higher claims than the owners of St. James? You are not so great a grievance as the hirelings of St. Stephen's. You are of a lower class than my friend Sir Robert Brass. None of these have mercy found. I have laughed and lashed them round. Have you seen a rocket fly? You would swear it pierced the sky. It but reached the middle air, bursting into pieces there. Thousand sparkles falling down, light on many a coxcomb's crown. See what mirth the sport creates, singes hair but breaks no pates. Thus should I attempt to climb, treat you in a style sublime, such a rocket is my muse, should I lofty numbers choose. Ere I reached Parnassus's top, I should burst and bursting drop. All my fire would fall in scraps, give your head some gentle raps. Only make it smart a while, then could I forbear to smile. When I found the tingling pain entering warm your frigid brain, make you able upon sight to decide of wrong and right. Talk with sense whate'er you please on, learn to relish truth and reason. Section 88 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epigram on the Busts in Richmond Hermitage, 1732 With honour thus by Carolina placed, How are these venerable bustos graced? O queen with more than regal title crowned, For love of arts and piety renowned. How do the friends of virtue joy to see Her darling sons exalted thus by thee? Not to their fame can now be added more, Revered by her whom all mankind adore. Another Louis the living learned fed And raised the scientific head, Our frugal queen to save her meat, Exalts the heads that cannot eat. A conclusion. Since Anna, whose bounty thy merits had fed, ere her own was laid low, had exalted thy head, and since our good queen to the wise is so just, to raise heads for such as are humbled in dust, I wonder, good man, that you are not invaulted. Prithee go and be dead, and be doubly exalted. Dr. Swift's Answer Section 89 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To the Reverend Dr. Swift, with a present of a paper book, finally bound on his birthday, November 30th, 1732, by John, Earl of Orrery. 
To thee, dear Swift, these spotless leaves I send, Small is the present, but sincere the friend. Think not so poor, a book below thy care, Who knows the price that thou canst make it bear? Though tawdry now, and like Tyrilla's face, The specious front shines out with borrowed grace, Though pasteboard's glittering like a tinseled coat, A rasa tabula within denote. Yet if a venal and corrupted age, And modern vices should provoke thy rage, If warned once more by their impending fate, A sinking country and an injured state, Thy great assistance should again demand, And call forth reason to defend the land. Then shall we view these sheets with glad surprise, Inspired with thought and speaking to our eyes. Each vacant space shall then enriched dispense True force of eloquence and nervous sense. Inform the judgment, animate the heart, And sacred rules of policy impart. The spangled covering, bright with splendid ore, Shall cheat the sight with empty show no more. But lead us inward to those golden mines, where all thy soul in native lustre shines. So when the eye surveys some lovely fair, With bloom of beauty graced, with shape and air, How is the rapture heightened when we find Her form excelled by her celestial mind? Verses left with a silver standish On the dean of St. Patrick's desk on his birthday by Dr. Delaney. Hither from Mexico I came to serve a proud Ironian dame, was long submitted to her will, at length she lost me at quadrille. Through various shapes I often passed, still hoping to have rest at last, and still ambitious to obtain admittance to the patriot Dane, and sometimes got within his door, but soon turned out to serve the poor, not strolling idleness to aid, but honest industry decayed. At length an artist purchased me, and wrought me to the shape you see. This done, to Hermes I applied. O oh, Hermes, gratify my pride. Be it my fate to serve a sage, the greatest genius of his age. That matchless pen let me supply, whose living lines will never die. I grant your suit, the god replied, and here he left me to reside. Verses occasioned by the foregoing presence. A paper book is sent by Boyle, too neatly gilt for me to soil. Delaney sends a silver standish, when I no more a pen can brandish. Let both around my tomb be placed, as trophies of amused desaste, and let the friendly lines they writ, in praise of long-departed wit, be graved on either side in columns, more to my praise than all my volumes, to burst with envy, spite, and rage the vandals of the present age. Verses sent to the dean with an eagle quill, on hearing of the presents sent by Earl of Orrery and Dr. Delaney, by Mrs. Pilkington. Shall then my kindred all my glory claim, and boldly rob me of eternal fame? To every art my generous aid I lend, to music, painting, poetry a friend. Tis I celestial harmony inspire, when fixed to strike the sweetly warbling wire. I to the faithful canvas have consigned each bright idea of the painter's mind. Behold from Raphael's sky-dipped pencils rise such heavenly scenes as charm the gazer's eyes. Oh, let me now aspire to higher praise, ambitious to describe your deathless lays. Nor thou, immortal bard, my aid refuse. Accept me as the servant of your muse. Then shall Section 90 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. An Invitation by Dr. Delaney in the Name of Dr. Swift Mighty Thomas, a solemn senatus I call, 
to consult for Sapphira, so come one and all. Quit books and quit business, your cure in your care, for a long winding walk and a short bill of fare. I've mutton for you, sir, and as for the ladies, as friend Virgil has it, I've alluid Mercatus. For Letty, one filbert whereon to regale, and a peach for pale Constance to make a full male. And for your cruel part who take pleasure in blood, I have that of the grape which is ten times as good. Flow wit to her honour, flow wine to her health. Section 91 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Beast's Confession to the Priest, on Observing How Most Men Mistake Their Own Talents, 1732. When beasts could speak, the learned say they still can do so every day, it seems they had religion then, as much as now we find in men. It happened when a plague broke out, which therefore made them more devout. The king of brutes, to make it plain, of quadrupeds I only main, by proclamation gave command that every subject in the land should to the priest confess their sins, and thus the pious wolf begins. Good father, I must own with shame that often I have been to blame. I must confess on Friday last, wretch that I was, I broke my fast. But I defy the basest tongue to prove I did my neighbor wrong, or ever went to seek my food by rapine theft or thirst of blood. The ass approaching next confessed that in his heart he loved a jest. A wag he was, he needs must own, and could not let a dunce alone. Sometimes his friends he would not spare, and might perhaps be too severe. But yet the worst that could be said, he was a wit both born and bred. And if it be a sin and shame, nature alone must bear the blame. One fault he has is sorry for it, his ears are half a foot too short, which, could he to the standard bring, he'd show his face before the king. Then for his voice there's none disputes that he's the nightingale of brutes. The swine with contrite heart allowed, his shape and beauty made him proud. In diet was perhaps too nice, but gluttony was near his vice in every turn of life content, and meekly took what fortune sent. Inquire through all the parish round, a better neighbour near was found. His vigilance might some displease, tis true he hated sloth like peas. The mimic ape began his chatter, how evil tongues his life bespatter. Much of the censoring world complained, who said his gravity was feigned. Indeed the strictness of his morals engaged him in a hundred quarrels, he saw, and he was grieved to seat, his zeal was sometimes indiscreet. He found his virtues too severe for our corrupted times to bear. Yet such a lewd licentious age might well excuse a stoic's rage. The goat advanced with decent pace, and first excused his youthful face. Forgiveness begged that he appeared, t'was nature's fault, without a beard. Tis true he was not much inclined to fondness for the female kind, not as his enemies object from chance or natural defect, not by his frigid constitution, but through a pious resolution, for he had made a holy vow of chastity as monks do now, which he resolved to keep for ever hence and strictly too as doth his reverence. Apply the tale and you shall find how just it suits with humankind. Some faults we own, but can you guess why virtues carried to excess? Wherewith our vanity endows us, though neither foe nor friend allows us. The lawyer swears, you may rely on't, he never squeezed a needy client. And this he makes his constant rule, for which his brethren call him fool. His conscience always was so nice, he freely gave the poor advice, by which he lost, he may affirm, a hundred fees last Easter term. While others of the learned robe would break the patience of a job, no pleader at the bar could match his diligence and quick dispatch. Near kept a cause, he well may boast, above a term or two at most. The cringing knave who seeks a place without success thus tells his case. Why should he longer mince the matter? He failed because he could not flatter. 
He had not learned to turn his coat, Nor for a party give his vote. His crime he quickly understood, Too zealous for the nation's good. He found the ministers resent it, Yet could not for his heart repent it. The chaplain vows he cannot fawn, Though it would raise him to the lawn. He passed his hours among his books, You find it in his meagre looks. He might, if he were worldly wise, Preferment get and spare his eyes but owns he had a stubborn spirit that made him trust alone to merit. Would rise by merit to promotion, alas, a mere chimeric notion. The doctor, if you will believe him, confessed a sin, and God forgive him, called up at midnight, ran to save a blind old beggar from the grave. But see how Satan spreads his snares, he quick forgot to say his prayers. He cannot help it for his heart sometimes to act the parson's part. Quotes from the Bible many a sentence that moves his patients to repentance, and when his medicines do no good, supports their minds with heavenly food. At which, however well intended, he hears the clergy are offended, and grown so bold behind his back to call him hypocrite and quack. In his own church he keeps a seat, says grace before and after meat, and calls without affecting airs his household twice a day to prayers. He shuns apothecaries' shops, and hates to cram the sick with slops. He scorns to make his art a trade, nor bribes my lady's favourite maid. Old nurse-keepers would never hire to recommend him to the squire, which others whom he will not name have often practised to their shame. The statesman tells you with a sneer his fault is to be too sincere, and having no sinister ends is apt to disoblige his friends. The nation's good, his master's glory, without regard to Whig or Tory, were all the schemes he had in view, yet he was seconded by few. Though some had spread a thousand lies, t'was he defeated the excise. T'was known, though he had borne aspersion, that standing troops were his aversion. His practice was, in every station, to serve the king and please the nation. Though hard to find, in every case, the fittest man to fill a place, his promises he ne'er forgot, but took memorials on the spot. His enemies, for want of charity, said he affected popularity. Tis true the people understood that all he did was for their good. Their kind affections he has tried, no love is lost on either side. He came to court with fortune clear, which now he runs out every year, must at the rate that he goes on inevitably be undone. Oh, if his majesty would please to give him but a writ of ease, would grant him license to retire, as it has long been his desire. By fair accounts it would be found he's poorer by ten thousand pound. He owns and hopes it is no sin, he ne'er was partial to his kin. He thought it base for men in stations to crown the court with their relations. His country was his dearest mother, and every virtuous man his brother. Through modesty or awkward shame, for which he owns himself to blame, he found the wisest man he could, without respect to friends or blood. Nor ever acts on private views when he has liberty to choose. The sharper swore he hated play, except to pass an hour away, and well he might, for to his cost, by want of skill he always lost. He heard there was a club of cheats who had contrived a thousand feats, could change the stock or cog a die, and thus deceive the sharpest eye. Nor wonder how his fortune sunk, his brothers fleece him when he's drunk. I own the moral not exact, besides the tale is false, in fact, and so absurd that I could raise up from Fields' Elysian fabling Aesop. I would accuse him to his face for libeling the four-foot race. Creatures of every kind but ours well comprehend their natural powers while we whom reason ought to sway mistake our talents every day. The ass was never known so stupid to act the part of Trey or Cupid, nor leaps upon his master's lap there to be stroked and fed with pap. As Aesop would the world persuade, he better understands his trade, nor comes when near his lady whistles, but carries loads and feeds on thistles. Our author's meaning, I presume, is a creature bipes et iplumis wherein the moralist designed a compliment on humankind.
Section 92 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Parson's Case That you, friend Marcus, like a Stoic, can wish to die in strains heroic, no real fortitude implies, yet all must own thy wish is wise. Thy curate's place, thy fruitful wife, thy busy, drudging scene of life, thy insolent, illiterate vicar, thy want of all consoling liquor, thy threadbare gown, thy cassock rent, thy credit sunk, thy money spent, thy week made up of fasting days, thy great unconscious of a blaze. And to complete thy other curses, the quarterly demands of nurses, are ills you wisely wish to leave, and fly for refuge to the grave. And, oh, what virtue you express in wishing such afflictions less! But now should fortune shift the scene, and make thy curateship a dean, or some rich benefice provide to pamper luxury and pride, with labor small and income great, with chariot less for use than state, with swelling scarf and glossy gown, and license to reside in town, to shine where all the gay resort, at concerts, coffee-house, or court, and weakly persecute his grace with visits, or to beg a place, with underlings thy flock to teach, with no desire to pray or preach, with haughty spouse in vesture fine, with plenteous meals and generous wine, wouldst Section 93 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Hardship Upon the Ladies, 1733 Poor ladies, though their business be to play, Tis hard they must be busy night and day. Why should they want the privilege of men, Nor take some small diversions now and then? Had women been the makers of our laws, and why they were not, I can see no cause. The men should... Section 94 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Love Song in the Modern Taste, 1733 Fluttering spread thy purple pinions, Gentle Cupid, o'er my heart. I a slave in thy dominions, Nature must give way to art. Mild Arcadians ever blooming, Nightly nodding o'er your flocks, See my weary days consuming, All beneath yon flowery rocks. Thus the Cyprian goddess weeping, Mourned Adonis, darling youth, Him the boar in silence creeping, Gored with unrelenting tooth. Cynthia, tune harmonious numbers, Fair discretion string the lyre, Soothe my ever-waking slumbers, Bright Apollo, lend thy choir. Gloomy Pluto, king of terrors, Armed in adamantine chains, Lead me to the crystal mirrors, Watering soft Elysian plains. Mournful cypress, verdant willow, Gilding my Aurelia's brows, Morpheus hovering o'er my pillow, Hear me pay my dying vows. Melancholy smooth meander, Swiftly purling in a round, On thy margins lovers wander, With thy flowery chaplets crowned. Thus when Philomena drooping softly seeks her silent mate, Section 95 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Storm Minerva's Petition Pallas, a goddess chaste and wise, Descending lately from the skies, 
To Neptune went, and begged in form He'd give his orders for a storm, A storm to drown that rascal Hort, And she would kindly thank him for't. A wretch whom English roads, to spite her, Had lately honoured with a mitre. The god who favoured her request Assured her he would do his best. But Venus had been there before, Pleaded the bishop loved a whore, And had enlarged her empire wide, He owned no deity beside. At sea or land, if e'er you found him, Without a mistress hang or drown him. Since Burnet's death, the bishop's bench, Till Hort arrived, near kept a wench. If Hort must sink, she grieves to tell it, She'll not have left one single prelate. For to say truth, she did intend him, Elective Cyprus in commandum. And since her birth the ocean gave her, She could not doubt her uncle's favour. Then Proteus urged the same request, But half in earnest, half in jest. Said he, Great sovereign of the main, To drown him all attempts are vain. Hort can assume more forms than I, A rake, a bully, pimp, or spy can creep or run or fly or swim all motions are alike to him turn him adrift and you shall find he knows to sail with every wind or throw him overboard he'll ride as well against as with the tide but pallas you've applied too late for tis decreed by jove and fate that ireland must be soon destroyed and who but hort can be employed you need not then have been so pert in sending bolton to clonfert I found you did it by your grinning, your business is to mind your spinning. But how you came to interpose in making bishops no one knows, or who regarded your report, for never were you seen at court. And if you must have your petition, there's Berkeley in the same condition. Look, there he stands, and tis but just, if one must drown, the other must. But if you leave us bishop, Judas, we'll give you Berkeley for Bermudas. Now, if twill gratify your spite to put him in a plaguy fright, although tis hardly worth the cost, you soon shall see him soundly tossed. You'll find him swear, blaspheme, and damn, and every moment take a dram, his ghastly visage with an air of reprobation and despair, or else some hiding hole he seeks for fear the rest should say he squeaks, or as Fitzpatrick did before, resolve to perish with his whore, or else he raves and roars and swears, And, but for shame, would say his prayers. Or would you see his spirit sink, Relaxing downwards in a stink? If such a sight as this can please ye, Good Madam Pallas, pray be easy. To Neptune speak, and he'll consent, But he'll come back the knave he went. The goddess, who conceived a hope That Hort was destined to a rope, Believed it best to condescend to spare a foe to save. Section ninety six of the Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume One by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Ode on Science O heavenly born in deepest dells, In fairest science ever dwells, Beneath the mossy cave, Indulge the verdure of the woods, With azure beauty gild the floods, And flowery carpets lave. For melancholy ever reigns, Delighted in the sylvan scenes, With scientific light, while Diane, huntress of the vales, Seeks lulling sounds and fanning gales, Though wrapped from mortal sight. Yet goddess yet the way explore, With magic rites and heathen lore, Obstructed and depressed, Till wisdom give the sacred nine, Untaught not uninspired to shine, By reason's power redressed. When soul on end Lycurgus taught To moralize the human thought, of mad opinion's maze, To erring zeal they gave new laws, Thy charms, O liberty, the cause, That blends congenial rays. Bid bright Astrea gild the morn, Or bid a hundred sons be born, To hecatomb the year, 
Without thy aid, in vain the poles, in vain the zodiac system rolls, in vain the lunar sphere. Come, fairest princess of the throng, bring sweet philosophy along, in metaphysic dreams, while raptured bards no more behold a vernal age of purer gold, in heliconian streams. Drive thraldom with malignant hand to curse some other destined land, by folly led astray, Ierne bear on azure wing, Energic let her soar and sing, Thy universal sway. So when Amphion bade the lyre To more majestic sound aspire, Behold the madding throng, In wonder and oblivion drown. Section 97 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Young Lady's Complaint for the Stay of the Dean in England Blow ye Zephyr's gentle gales, gently fill the swelling sails. Neptune with thy trident long, trident three-forked, trident strong. And ye narrates fair and gay, fairer than the rose in May. Nereids living in deep caves, gently washed with gentle waves. Nereids Neptune lull asleep, ruffling storms and ruffled deep. All around in pompous state, on this richer Argo wait. Argo, bring my golden fleece, Argo, bring him to his Greece. Will Cadenus longer stay? Come, Cadenus, come away. Come with all the haste of love, come unto thy turtle dove. The ripened cherry on the tree hangs and only hangs for thee. Luscious peaches, mellow pears, carries with her yellow ears, and the grape both red and white, grape-inspiring just delight. All are ripe and courting sue to be plucked and pressed by you. Pinks have lost their blooming red, morning hang their drooping head. Every flower languid seems, wants the color of thy beams. Beams of wondrous force and power, Beams reviving every flower. Come, Cadenus, bless once more, Bless again thy native shore, Bless again this drooping isle, Make its weeping beauties smile. Beauties that thine absence mourn, Beauties wishing thy return. Come, Cadenus, come with haste, Come before the winter's blazed, Swifter, Section 98 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On the Death of Dr. Swift, written in November 1731. As Rochefoucauld his maxims drew, from nature I believe him true. They argue no corrupted mind in him, the fault is in mankind. This maxim, more than all the rest, is thought too base for human breast. In all distresses of our friends we first consult our private ends, while nature, kindly bent to ease us, points out some circumstance to please us. If this perhaps your patience move, let reason and experience prove. We all behold with envious eyes our equal raised above our size. Who would not at a crowded show stand high himself, keep others low? I love my friend as well as you, but why should he obstruct my view? Then let me have the higher post, suppose it but an inch at most. If in battle you should find one whom you love of all mankind, had some heroic action done, a champion killed or trophy won, rather than thus be overtopped, would you not wish his laurels cropped? Dear honest Ned is in the gout, lies racked with pain, and you without. How patiently you hear him groan, how glad the case is not your own. What poet would not grieve to see his brethren write as well as he? 
But rather than they should excel, He'd wish his rivals all in hell. Her end, when emulation misses, She turns to envy, stings, and hisses. The strongest friendship yields to pride, Unless the odds be on our side. Vain humankind, fantastic race, Thy various follies who can trace? Self-love, ambition, envy, pride, Their empire in our hearts divide. Give others riches, power, and station, Tis all on me an usurpation. I have no title to aspire, Yet when you sink, I seem the higher. In Pope I cannot read a line, But with a sigh I wish it mine. When he can in one couplet fix More sense than I can do in six, It gives me such a jealous fit, I cry, Pox take him and his wit! I grieve to be outdone by gay In my own humorous biting way. Arbuthnot is no more my friend Who dares to irony pretend, Which I was born to introduce, Refined it first and shewed its use. St. John, as well as Pulteney, knows That I had some repute for prose, And till they drove me out of date Could maul a minister of state. If they have mortified my pride And made me throw my pen aside, if with such talents heaven has blessed em, have I not reason to detest em? To all my foes, dear fortune, send thy gifts, but never to my friend. I tamely can endure the first, but this with envy makes me burst. This much may serve by way of proem. Proceed we therefore to our poem. The time is not remote when I must, by the course of nature, die. When, I foresee, my special friends Will try to find their private ends. Though it is hardly understood Which way my death can do them good, Yet thus, methinks, I hear em speak. See how the dean begins to break? Poor gentleman, he droops apace, You plainly find it in his face. That old vertigo in his head Will never leave him till he's dead. Besides his memory decays, He recollects not what he says. He cannot call his friends to mind, Forgets the place where last he dined, Plies you with stories o'er and o'er he told them fifty times before. How does he fancy we can sit To hear his out-of-fashioned wit? But he takes up with younger folks Who for his wine will bear his jokes. Faith, he must make his stories shorter Or change his comrades once a quarter. In half the time he talks them round, There must another set be found. For poetry he's past his prime, He takes an hour to find a rhyme. His fire is out, his wit decayed, His fancy sunk, his muse a jade. I'd have him throw away his pen, But there's no talking to some men. And then their tenderness appears By adding largely to my ears, He's older than he would be reckoned, And well remembers Charles the Second. He hardly drinks a pint of wine, And that, I doubt, is no good sign. His stomach, too, begins to fail. Last year we thought him strong and hale, But now he's quite another thing. I wish he may hold out till spring. Then hug themselves and reason thus. It is not yet so bad with us. In such a case they talk in tropes and by their fears express their hopes. Some great misfortune to portend, no enemy can match a friend. With all the kindness they profess, the merit of a lucky guess, when daily how ye's come, of course, and servants answer, worse and worse. Would please him better than to tell that God be praised, the dean is well. Then he who prophesied the best approves his foresight to the rest. You know I always feared the worst, and often told you so at first. He'd rather choose that I should die than his prediction prove a lie. No one foretells I shall recover, but all agree to give me over. Yet should some neighbor feel a pain just in the parts where I complain, how many a message would he send, what hearty prayers that I should mend, inquire what regimen I kept, what gave me ease and how I slept and more lament when I was dead than all the snivellers round my bed. My good companions, never fear, for though you may mistake a year, though your prognostics run too fast, they must be verified at last. Behold the fatal day arrive. How is the dean? 
he's just alive. Now the departing prayer is read, he hardly breathes, the dean is dead. Before the passing bell begun, the news through half the town has run. Oh, may we all for death prepare, what has he left, and who's his heir? I know no more than what the news is, tis all bequeathed to public uses. To public use a perfect whim, what had the public done for him? Mere envy, avarice, and pride, he gave it all, but first he died. And had the dean in all the nation no worthy friend, no poor relation? So ready to do strangers good, forgetting his own flesh and blood. Now Grub Street wits are all employed with elegies the town is cloyed. Some paragraph in every paper to curse the dean or bless the drapier. The doctors tender of their fame wisely on me lay all the blame. We must confess his case was nice, but he would never take advice. Had he been ruled for aught appears, he might have lived these twenty years. For when we opened him, we found that all his vital parts were sound. From Dublin soon to London spread, tis told at court, the dean is dead. Kind Lady Suffolk in the spleen runs laughing up to tell the queen. The queen, so gracious, mild, and good, cries, is he gone? Tis time he should. He's dead, you say. Why, let him rot. I'm glad the medals were forgot. I promised him I own, but when? I only was a princess then. But now, as consort of a king, you know, tis quite a different thing. Now charters at Sir Robert's levy tells with a sneer the tidings heavy. Why, he is dead without his shoes, cries Bob. I'm sorry for the news. Oh, were the wretch but living still, and in his place my good friend will. Or had a mitre on his head, provided Bolingbroke were dead. Now curl his shop from rubbish drains three genuine tomes of Swift's remains. And then to make them pass the glibber revised by Tybalt's moor and kibber. He'll treat me as he does my betters, publish my will, my life, my letters. Revive the libels born to die, which Pope must bear as well as I. Here shift the scene to represent how those I love my death lament. Poor Pope will grieve a month, and gay a week, and Arbuthnot a day. St. John himself will scarce forbear to bite his pen and drop a tear. The rest will give a shrug and cry, I'm sorry, but we all must die. Indifference clad in wisdom's guise all fortitude of mind supplies, for how can stony bowels melt in those who never pity felt? When we are lashed, they kiss the rod, resigning to the will of God. The fools, my juniors, by a year, are tortured with suspense and fear, who wisely thought my age a screen when death approached to stand between. The screen removed, their hearts are trembling, they mourn for me without dissembling. My female friends, whose tender hearts have better learned to act their parts, receive the news in doleful dumps. The dean is dead, and what is trumps? Then Lord have mercy on his soul, ladies, I'll venture for the vole. Six deans, they say, must bear the pall. I wish I knew what king to call. Madame, your husband will attend the funeral of so good a friend. No, madam, tis a shocking sight, and he's engaged to-morrow night. My lady club would take it ill if he should fail her at quadrille. He loved the dean, I lead a heart. But dearest friends, they say, must part. His time was come, he ran his race. We hope he's in a better place. Why do we grieve that friends should die? No loss more easy to supply. One year is past, a different scene. No further mention of the dean. Who now, alas, no more is missed than if he never did exist. Where's now this favorite of Apollo, departed and his works must follow? Must undergo the common fate, his kind of wit is out of date. Some country squire to Lintot goes, inquires for swift in verse and prose. Says Lintot, I have heard the name, he died a year ago. The same. He searches all the shop in vain. Sir, you may find them in Duck Lane. I sent them with a load of books last Monday to the pastry cooks, to fancy they could live a year. I find you but a stranger here. 
the dean was famous in his time he had a kind of knack at rhyme his way of writing now is past the town has got a better test i keep no antiquated stuff but spick and span i have enough pray do but give me leave to show em here's collie's kipper's birthday poem this ode you never yet have seen by stephen duck upon the queen then here's a letter finely penned against the craftsman and his friend it clearly shows that all reflection on ministers is disaffection next here's sir robert's vindication and mr henley's last oration the hawkers have not got them yet your honour please to buy a set here's woolston's tracts the twelfth edition tis read by every politician the country members when in town to all their boroughs send them down you never met a thing so smart the courtiers have them all by heart those maids of honour who can read are taught to use them for their creed the reverend author's good intention has been rewarded with a pension he does an honour to his gown by bravely running priestcraft down he shows as sure as gods in gloucester that moses was a grand impostor that all his miracles were cheats performed as jugglers do their feats the church had never such a writer a shame he has not got a mitre suppose me dead and then suppose a club assembled at the rose where from discourse of this and that i grow the subject of their chat and while they toss my name about with favour some and some without one quite indifferent in the cause my character impartial draws the dean if we believe report was never ill received at court as for his works in verse and prose i own myself no judge of those nor can i tell what critics thought him but this i know all people bought him as with a moral view designed to cure the vices of mankind and if he often missed his aim the world must own it to their shame the praise is his and there's the blame sir i have heard another story he was a most confounded tory and grew or he is much belied extremely dull before he died can we the drapier then forget is not our nation in his debt twas he that writ the drapier's letters he should have left them for his betters we had a hundred abler men nor need depend upon his pen say what you will about his reading you never can defend his breeding who in his satires running riot could never leave the world in quiet attacking when he took the whim court city cap all one to him but why should he except the slobbert offend our patriot great sir robert whose counsels aid the sovereign power to save the nation every hour what scenes of evil he unravels in satires libels lying travels not sparing his own clergy cloth but eats into it like a moth his vein ironically grave exposed the fool and lashed the knave to steal a hint was never known but what he writ was all his own he never thought an honour done him because a duke was proud to own him would rather slip aside and choose to talk with wits in dirty shoes despise the fools with stars and garters so often seen caressing charters he never courted men in station nor persons held in admiration of no man's greatness was afraid because he sought for no man's aid though trusted long in great affairs he gave himself no haughty airs without regarding private ends spent all his credit for his friends and only chose the wise and good no flatterers no allies in blood but succoured virtue in distress and seldom failed of good success as numbers in their hearts must own who but for him had been unknown with princes kept a due decorum but never stood in awe before him he followed david's lesson just in princes never put thy trust and would you make him truly sour provoke him with a slave in power the irish senate if you named with what impatience he declaimed fair liberty was all his cry for her he stood prepared to die for her he boldly stood alone for her he oft exposed his own two kingdoms just as faction led had set a prince upon his head but not a traitor could be found to sell him for six hundred pound had he but spared his tongue and pen he might have rose like other men but power was never in his thought and wealth he valued not a grot 
In gratitude he often found, And pitied those who meant the wound, But kept the tenor of his mind To merit well of human kind, Nor made a sacrifice of those Who still were true to please his foes. He laboured many a fruitless hour To reconcile his friends in power, Saw mischief by a faction brewing While they pursued each other's ruin. But finding vain was all his care, He left the court in mere despair. And oh, how short are human schemes! Here ended all our golden dreams. What St. John's skill in state affairs, What Ormond's valour, Oxford's cares, To save their sinking country lent, Was all destroyed by one event. Too soon that precious life was ended, On which alone our wheel depended, When up a dangerous faction starts With wrath and vengeance in their hearts, By solemn league and covenant bound, To ruin, slaughter, and confound, To turn religion to a fable, And make the government a babel, Pervert the laws, disgrace the gown, Corrupt the senate, rob the crown, To sacrifice old England's glory, And make her infamous in story. When such a tempest shook the land, How could unguarded virtue stand? With horror, grief, despair, the dean Beheld the dire destructive scene. His friends in exile o'er the tower, Himself within the frown of power, Pursued by base envenomed pens Far to the land of slaves and fens, A servile race in folly nursed, Who truckle most when treated worst. By innocence and resolution He bore continual persecution, while numbers to preferment rose, whose merits were to be his foes, when even his own familiar friends intent upon their private ends, like renegados now he feels against him lifting up their heels. The dean did by his pen defeat an infamous destructive cheat, taught fools their interest how to know, and gave them arms toward the blow. Envy has owned it was his doing to save that hapless land from ruin. While they who at the steerage stood And reaped the prophets sought his blood To save them from their evil fate, In him was held a crime of state. A wicked monster on the bench, Whose fury blood could never quench, As vile and profligate a villain As modern Scroggs or old Tressilian, Who long all justice had discarded, Nor feared the god nor man regarded, Vowed on the dean his rage to vent And make him of his zeal repent, but heaven his innocence defends, the grateful people stand his friends. Not strains of law, nor judges frown, nor topics brought to please the crown, nor witness hired, nor jury picked, prevail to bring him in convict. In exile with a steady heart, he spent his life's declining part, where folly, pride, and faction sway, remote from St. John, Pope, and Gay. Alas, poor Dean, his only scope, was to be held a misanthrope. This into general odium drew him, which, if he liked, much good may do him. His zeal was not to lash our crimes, but discontent against the times. For had we made him timely offers to raise his post or fill his coffers, perhaps he might have truckled down like other brethren of his gown. For party he would scarce have bled, I say no more, because he's dead." What writings has he left behind? I hear they're of a different kind. A few in verse, but most in prose. Some high-flown pamphlets, I suppose. All scribbled in the worst of times To palliate his friend Oxford's crimes. To praise Queen Anne, nay more defend her, As never favouring the pretender. Or libels yet concealed from sight Against the court to show his spite. Perhaps his travels part the third, A lie at every second word offensive to a loyal ear, but not one sermon, you may swear. His friendships there, to few confined, were always of the middling kind, no fools of rank, a mongrel breed, who fain would pass for lords indeed. Where titles give no right or power, and peerage is a withered flower, he would have held it a disgrace if such a wretch had known his face. On rural squires that kingdom's bane, He vented oft his wrath in vain. Biennial squires to market brought, Who sell their souls and votes for naught. The nation stripped go joyful back, To blank the church their tenants rack. Go snacks with rogues and rapparees, And keep the peace to pick up fees. In every job to have a share, 
a gaol or barrack to repair, and turn the tax for public roads commodious to their own abodes. Perhaps I may allow the dean had too much satire in his vein, and seemed determined not to starve it, because no age could more deserve it. Yet malice never was his aim, he lashed the vice, but spared the name. No individual could resent, where thousands equally were meant. His satire points at no defect, but what all mortals may correct. For he abhorred that senseless tribe, who called it humour when they jibe. He spared a hump or crooked nose, whose owners set not up for bows. True genuine dullness moved his pity, unless it offered to be witty. Those who their ignorance confessed, he near offended with a jest, but laughed to hear an idiot quote, a verse from Horace learned by rote. Vice, if it ear can be a bash, must be ridiculed or lashed. If you resent it, who's to blame? He neither knew you nor your name. Should vice expect to scape rebuke because its owner is a duke? He knew an hundred pleasant stories with all the turns of Whigs and Tories, was cheerful to his dying day, and friends would let him have his way. He gave the little wealth he had to build a house for fools and mad, and showed by one satiric touch no nation wanted it so much. That kingdom he hath left his debtor, I wish it soon may have a better. And since you dread no... Section 99 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On Poetry, a Rhapsody, 1733 All human race would fain be wits, and millions miss for one that hits. Young's universal passion, pride, was never known to spread so wide. Say, Britain, could you ever boast three poets in an age at most? Our chilling climate hardly bears a sprig of bays in fifty years, while every fool his claim alleges as if it grew in common hedges. What reason can there be assigned for this perverseness in the mind? Brutes find out where their talents lie. A bear will not attempt to fly. A foundered horse will oft debate before he tries a five-barred gate. A dog by instinct turns aside who sees the ditch too deep and wide. But man we find the only creature who led by folly combats nature, who when she loudly cries forbear with obstinacy fixes there, and where his genius least inclines absurdly bends his whole designs. Not empire to the rising sun, by valor, conduct, fortune won, not highest wisdom in debates for framing laws to govern states, not skill in sciences profound, so large to grasp the circle round, such heavenly influence require as how to strike the muse's lyre, not beggar's brat on bulk begot, not bastard of a peddler scot, not boy brought up to cleaning shoes, the spawn of bridewell or the stews, not infants dropped the spurious pledges of gypsies littered under hedges, are so disqualified by fate to rise in church or law or state, as he whom Phoebus in his ire has blasted with poetic fire. What hope of custom in the fair, while not a soul demands your ware, where you have nothing to produce for private life or public use? Court, city, country want you not, you cannot bribe, betray, or plot. For poets, law makes no provision, the wealthy have you in derision. Of state affairs you cannot smatter, are awkward when you try to flatter. Your portion taking Britain round was just one annual hundred pound. Now not so much as in remainder, since Kibber brought in an attainder. For ever fixed by right divine, a monarch's right, on Grub Street line. Poor starveling bard, how small thy gains, how unproportioned to thy pains. And here a simile comes pat in, though chickens take a month to fatten, the guests in less than half an hour will more than half a score devour. 
So, after toiling twenty days to earn a stock of pence and praise, thy labours, grown the critics prey, are swallowed o'er a dish of tay. Gone to be never heard of more, gone where the chickens went before. How shall a new attempter learn of different spirits to discern? And how distinguish which is which, the poet's vein or scribbling itch? Then hear an old experienced sinner, instructing thus a young beginner. Consult yourself, and if you find a powerful impulse urge your mind, impartial judge within your breast what subject you can manage best. Whether your genius most inclines to satire, praise, or humorous lines, to elegies in mournful tone, or prologue sent from hand unknown. Then, rising with Aurora's light, the muse invoked, sit down to write. Blot out, correct, insert, refine, enlarge, diminish, interline. Be mindful when invention fails to scratch your head and bite your nails. Your poem finished, next your care, is needful to transcribe it fair. In modern wit all printed trash is set off with numerous breaks and dashes. To statesmen would you give a wipe, you print it in italic type. When letters are in vulgar shapes, tis ten to one the wit escapes. But when in capitals expressed, the dullest reader smokes the jest. Or else perhaps he may invent a better than the poet meant. As learned commentators view in Homer more than Homer knew. Your poem in its modish dress, correctly fitted for the press, convey by penny post to Lintot, but let no friend alive look into it. If Lintot thinks twill quit the cost, you need not fear your labour lost. And how agreeably surprised are you to see it advertised! The hawker shows you one in print, as fresh as farthings from the mint. The product of your toil and sweating, a bastard of your own begetting. Be sure it wills the following day, lie snug and hear what critics say. And if you find the general vogue pronounces you a stupid rogue, damns all your thoughts as low and little, sit still and swallow down your spittle. Be silent as a politician, for talking may beget suspicion, or praise the judgment of the town and help yourself to run it down. Give up your fond paternal pride, nor argue on the weaker side. For poems read without a name we justly praise or justly blame, and critics have no partial views except they know whom they abuse. And since you ne'er provoke their spite, depend upon their judgments right. But if you blab, you are undone. Consider what a risk you run. You lose your credit all at once, the town will mark you for a dunce. The vilest dog roll Grub Street sends will pass for yours with foes and friends. And you must bear the whole disgrace till some fresh blockhead takes your place. Your secret kept, your poem sunk, and sent in choirs to line a trunk. If still you be disposed to rhyme, go try your hand a second time. Again you fail, yet safe's the word. Take courage and attempt a third. But first with care employ your thoughts where critics marked your former faults. The trivial turns, the borrowed wit, the similes that nothing fit, the cant which every fool repeats, town jests and coffee-house conceits, descriptions tedious, flat and dry, and introduce the lords know why, or where we find your fury set against the harmless alphabet, on A's and B's your malice vent, while readers wonder whom you meant. A public or a private robber, a statesman or a South Sea jobber, a prelate who no god believes, a parliament or den of thieves, a pickpurse at the bar or bench, a duchess or a suburb wench. Or oft when epithets you link in gaping lines to fill a chink, like stepping stones to save a stride in streets where kennels are too wide or like a heel-piece to support a cripple with one foot too short, or like a bridge that joins a marish to moorlands of a different parish. So have I seen ill-coupled hounds drag different ways in miry grounds. So geographers in Afric maps with savage pictures fill their gaps, and o'er unhabitable downs place elephants for want of towns. But though you miss your third essay, you need not throw your pen away. 
lay now aside all thoughts of fame to spring more profitable game. From party merit seek support, the vilest verse thrives best at court. And may you ever have the luck to rhyme almost as ill as duck. And though you never learned to scan verse, come out with some lampoon on Danvers. A pamphlet in Sir Bob's defence will never fail to bring in pence, nor be concerned about the sale he pays his workmen on the nail. Display the blessings of the nation, and praise the whole administration. Extol the bench of bishops round, who at them rail, bid God confound. To bishop haters answer thus, the only logic used by us, what though they don't believe in Christ, deny them Protestants, thou liest. A prince, the moment he is crowned, inherits every virtue round, as emblems of the sovereign power, like other baubles in the tower, is generous, valiant, just, and wise, and so continues till he dies. His humble senate this professes, in all their speeches votes addresses. But once you fix him in a tomb, his virtues fade, his vices bloom, and each perfection wrong imputed is fully at his death confuted. The loads of poems in his praise ascending make one funeral blaze. His panegyrics then are ceased, he grows a tyrant, dunce, or beast. As soon as you can hear his knell, this god on earth turns devil in hell, and lo, his ministers of state transformed to imps his levy weight, wherein the scenes of endless woe they ply their former arts below, and as they sail in Charon's boat, contrive to bribe the judge's vote. To Cerberus they give a sop, his triple barking mouth to stop, or in the ivory gate of dreams project excise and south sea schemes, or hire their party pamphleteers to set Elysium by the ears. Then, poet, if you mean to thrive, employ your muse on kings alive, with prudence gathering up a cluster of all the virtues you can muster, which formed into a garland sweet, lay humbly at your monarch's feet who, as the odors reach his throne, will smile and think them all his own. For law and gospel both determine all virtues lodge in royal ermine. I mean the oracles of both who shall depose it upon oath. Your garland in the following reign, change but the names, will do again. But if you think this trade too base, which seldom is the dunce's case, Put on the critic's brow, and sit at wills the puny judge of wit. A nod, a shrug, a scornful smile, with caution used, may serve a while. Proceed no further in your part, before you learn the terms of art. For you can never be too far gone in all our modern critics' jargon. Then talk with more authentic face of unities in time and place. Get scraps of Horace from your friends, and have them at your fingers' ends. Learn Aristotle's rules by rote, and at all hazards boldly quote. Judicious rhymer oft review, wise Dennis and profound Bossu. Read all the prefaces of Dryden, for these are critics much confide in. Though merely writ at first for filling, to raise the volume's price a shilling. A forward critic often dupes us with sham quotations peri hoops us, and if we have not read Longinus, will magisterially outshine us. Then lest with Greek he overrun ye, procure the book for love or money, translated from Boileau's translation, and quote quotation on quotation. At wills you hear a poem read, where Bat is from the table head, reclining on his elbow chair, gives judgment with decisive air, to whom the tribe of circling wits as to an oracle submits. He gives directions to the town to cry it up or run it down like courtiers when they send a note instructing members how to vote. He sets the stamp of bad and good, though not a word be understood. Your lesson learned, you'll be secure to get the name of connoisseur, and when your merits once are known, procure disciples of your own. For poets, you can never want em, spread through Augusta Trinobantum, computing by their pecks of coals amount to just nine thousand souls. These o'er their proper districts govern, of wit and humour judges sovereign. In every street a city bard rules like an alderman his ward, 
His undisputed rights extend Through all the lane from end to end. The neighbours round admire his shrewdness For songs of loyalty and lewdness. Outdone by none in rhyming well, Although he never learned to spell. Two bordering wits contend for glory, And one is Whig and one is Tory. And this for epics claims the bays, And that for elegiac lays. Some famed for numbers soft and smooth, By lovers spoke in Punch's booth. And some as justly fame extols For lofty lines in Smithfield drolls. Bavius in Wapping gains renown, And Mavius reigns o'er Kentish town. Tegilius placed in Phoebus's car From Ludgate shines to Temple Bar. Harmonious Kibber entertains The court with annual birthday strains. Whence Gay was banished in disgrace, Where Pope will never show his face. Where Young must torture his invention To flatter knaves or lose his pension. But these are not a thousandth part Of jobbers in the poet's art. Attending each his proper station, And all in due subordination, Through every alley to be found, In garrets high or underground, And when they join their paracranies, Out skips a book of miscellanies. Hobbes clearly proves that every creature Lives in a state of war by nature, The greater for the smaller watch, But meddle seldom with their match. A whale of moderate size will draw A shoal of herrings down his maw, a fox with geese his belly crams, A wolf destroys a thousand lambs. But search among the rhyming race, The brave are worried by the base. If on Parnassus's top you sit, You rarely bite, are always bit. Each poet of inferior size On you shall rail and criticize, And strive to tear you limb from limb, While others do as much for him. The vermin only tease and pinch their foes superior by an inch. So naturalists observe a flea has smaller fleas that on him prey, and these have smaller still to bite him, and so proceed ad infinitum. Thus every poet in his kind is bit by him that comes behind, who, though too little to be seen, can tease and gall and give the spleen. Call dunces, fools, and sons of whores, Lay Grub Street at each other's doors, Extol the Greek and Roman masters, And curse our modern poet-tasters, Complain, as many an ancient bard did, How genius is no more rewarded, How wrong a taste prevails among us, How much our ancestors outsung us, Can personate an awkward scorn For those who are not poets born. And all their brother dunces lash, Who crowd the press with hourly trash. O oh, Grub Street, how I do bemoan thee, Whose graceless children scorn to own thee. Their filial piety forgot, Deny their country like a Scot, Though by their idiom and grimace They soon betray their native place. Yet thou hast greater cause to be Ashamed of them than they of thee. Degenerate from their ancient brood, Since first the court allowed them food. Remains a difficulty still To purchase fame by writing ill. From Flecno down to Howard's time, How few have reached the low sublime. For when our high-born Howard died, Blackmore alone his place supplied. And lest a chasm should intervene When death had finished Blackmore's reign, The leaden crown devolved to thee, Great poet of the hollow tree. But, ah, how unsecure thy throne, A thousand barge thy right disown. They plot to turn in factious zeal Duncinia to a common weal, And with rebellious arms pretend An equal privilege to descend. In bulk there are not more degrees From elephants to mites in cheese Than what a curious eye may trace In creatures of the rhyming race. From bad to worse and worse they fall, but who can reach the worst of all? For though in nature depth and height Are equally held infinite, In poetry the height we know, Tis only infinite below. For instance, when you rashly think No rhymer can like Wellstead sink, His merits balanced you shall find The laureate leaves him far behind. Concanon, more aspiring bard, Soars downward deeper by a yard. Smart Jemmy Moore with vigor drops, The rest pursue as thick as hops. With heads to point the gulf they enter, Linked perpendicular to the center. And as their heels elated rise, Their heads attempt the nether skies. 
O oh, what indignity and shame To prostitute the Muses' name, By flattering kings whom heaven design'd The plagues and scourges of mankind, Bred up in ignorance and sloth, And every vice that nurses both. Perhaps, you say, Augustus shines, Immortal made in Virgil's lines, And Horace brought the tuneful choir To sing his virtues on the lyre without reproach for flattery true, because their praises were his due. For in those ages kings, we find, were animals of human kind. But now go search all Europe round, among the savage monsters crowned, with vice polluting every throne, I mean all thrones except our own. In vain you make the strictest view to find a king in all the crew, with whom a footman out of place would not conceive a high disgrace a burning shame, a crying sin, to make his morning's cup of gin. Thus all are destined to obey some beast of burthen or of prey. Tis sung Prometheus, forming man, through all the brutal species ran, each proper quality to find adapted to a human mind. A mingled mass of good and bad, the best of worst that could be had. Then from a clay of mixture base he shaped a king to rule the race endowed with gifts from every brute that best the regal nature suit thus think on kings the name denotes hogs asses wolves baboons and goats to represent in figure just sloth folly rapine mischief lust oh were they all but nebuchadnezzars what herds of kings would turn to grazers fair britain in thy monarch blest whose virtues bear the strictest test whom never faction could bespatter, nor minister, nor poet flatter. What justice in rewarding merit, what magnanimity of spirit, what lineaments divine we trace through all his figure, mien, and face. Though peace with olive binds his hands, confessed the conquering hero stands. Hydaspes Indus end the ganges, dread from his hand impending changes. From him the Tartar and Chinese, short by the knees, entreat for peace the consort of his throne and bed, a perfect goddess born and bred, appointed sovereign judge to sit on learning eloquence and wit. Our eldest hope, divine Lulus, late, very late, O oh, may he rule us. What early manhood has he shown before his downy beard was grown? Then think what wonders will be done by going on as he begun, an heir for Britain to secure as long as sun and moon endure, the remnant of the royal blood comes pouring on me like a flood. Bright goddesses in number five, Duke William, sweetest prince alive. Now sing the minister of state, who shines alone without a mate. Observe with what majestic port this atlas stands to prop the court. Intent the public debts to pay, like prudent Fabius by delay. Thou great vice-regent of the king, thy praises every muse shall sing. In all affairs thou sole director of wit and learning, chief protector. Though small the time thou hast to spare, the church is thy peculiar care. Of pious prelates what a stock you choose to rule the sable flock. You raise the honour of the peerage, proud to attend you at the steerage. You dignify the noble race, content yourself with humbler place. Now learning valour virtue sense, to titles give the sole pretence. St. George beheld thee with delight, vouchsafe to be an azure knight. When on thy breast and sides Herculean he fixed the star and string cerulean. Say, poet, in what other nation shone ever such a constellation? Attend ye popes and youngs in gaze, and tune your harps and strew your bays. Your panegyrics here provide, you cannot err on flattery's side. Above the stars exalt your style, you still are low ten thousand mile. On Lewis all his bards bestowed, of incense many a thousand blowed. But Europe mortified his pride, and swore the fawning rascals lied. Yet what the world refused to Lewis, applied to George exactly true is. Exactly true, invidious poet, tis fifty thousand times below it. Translate me now some lines, if you can, from Virgil, Marshall, Ovid, Lucan. They would all power in heaven divide, and do no wrong on either side. They teach you how to split a hair, give George and Jove an equal share. Yet why should we be laced so straight? 
I'll give my monarch butter weight, And reason good for many a year, Jove never intermeddled here. Nor though his priests be duly paid, Did ever we desire his aid. Section 100 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Verses sent to the Dean on his birthday, with Pines Horace finely bound, by Dr. J. Sickham. Horace speaking. You've read, sir, in poetic strain, how Varus and the Mantuan swain have on my birthday been invited, but I was forced in verse to write it. Upon a plain repast to dine, and taste my old companion wine, but I who all punctilios hate, though long familiar with the great, nor glory in my reputation, am come without an invitation. And though I'm used to write Falernian, I'll deign for once to taste Iernian. But fearing that you might dispute, had I put on my common suit, my breeding and my politesse, I visit in my birthday dress. My coat of purest turkey red, with gold embroidery richly spread, to which I've sure as good pretensions as Irish lords who starve on pensions. What though proud ministers of state did at your antechamber wait, what though your Oxfords and your St. John's have at your levy paid attendance, and Peterborough and Great Ormond, with many chiefs who now are dormant, have laid aside the general staff and public cares with you to laugh. Yet I some friends as good can name, nor less the darling sons of fame, for sure my polio and Machinas were as good statesmen Mr. Dean as. Either your Bolingbroke or Harley, though they made Lewis beg a parley, and as for Mordaunt, your loved hero, I'll match him with my Drusus Nero. You'll boast, perhaps, your favorite Pope, but Virgil is as good, I hope. I own, indeed, I can't get any to equal Helsham and Delaney, since Athens brought forth Socrates, a Grecian isle Hippocrates, since Tully lived before my time, and Galen blessed another clime, you'll plead, perhaps, at my request, to be admitted as a guest. Your hearing's bad, but why such fears? I speak to eyes and not to ears, and for that reason wisely took the form you see me in a book, attacked by slow devouring moths, by rage of barbarous Huns and Goths. By Bentley's notes my deadliest foes, By Creech's rhymes and Dunster's prose. I found my boasted wit and fire In their rude hands almost expire. Yet still they but in vain assailed, For had their violence prevailed, And in a blast destroyed my frame, They would have partly missed their aim, Since all my spirit in thy page Defies the vandals of this age. Tis yours to save these small remains from future pedants' muddy brains, and fix my Section 101 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1 by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epigram by Mr. Bower intended to be placed under the head of Gulliver, 1733. Here learn from moral truth and wit refined, how vice and folly have debased mankind. Strong sense and humor arm in virtue's cause, thus her great votary vindicates her laws. Section 102 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On Psyche At two afternoon for our Psyche inquire, Her tea kettles on and her smock at the fire. So loitering, so active, so busy, so idle, Which has she most need of, a spur or a bridle? Thus a greyhound outruns the whole pack in a race, yet would rather be hanged than he'd leave a warm place. She gives you such plenty, it puts you in pain, but ever with prudence takes care of the main. 
To please you she knows how to choose a nice bit, For her taste is almost as refined as her wit. To oblige a good friend she will trace every market, It would do your heart good to see how she will cark it. Yet be well. Section 103 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Dean and the Duke, 1734 James Bridges and the Dean had long been friends. James is beduked, of course their friendship ends. But sure the Dean deserves a sharp rebuke, for, knowing James, to boast he knows the Duke. Yet since just heaven the duke's ambition mocks, Since all he got by fraud is lost by stocks, His wings are clipped, he tries no more in vain, With bands of fiddlers to extend his train. Since he no more can build and plant and revel, The duke and dean seem near upon a level. Oh, wert thou not, a duke, my good duke Humphrey, from bailiff's claws thou scarce couldst keep thy bum free. A duke to know, a dean, go smooth thy crown. Thy brother, far thy better, wore a gown. Well, but a duke thou art, so... Section 104 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Written by Dr. Swift on his own deafness, in September 1734. The Dean's Complaint, Translated and Answered. Doctor, deaf, giddy, helpless, left alone. Answer, except the first, the fault's your own, Doctor. To all my friends a burden grown, Answer, because to few you will be shewn. Give them good wine and meat to stuff, You may have company enough. Doctor, no more I hear my church's bell Than if it rang out for my knell. Answer, then write and read, Twill do as well. Doctor, at thunder now no more I start, than at the rumbling of a cart. Answer, think then of thunder when you fart. Doctor, nay, what's incredible, alack, no more I hear a woman's clack. Answer, a woman's clack, if I have skill, sounds somewhat like a throuster's mill, but louder than a bell or th Section 105 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Dean's Manner of Living On rainy days alone I dine, Upon a chick and pint of wine. On rainy days I dine alone, And pick my chicken to the bone. But this my servants much enrages, no scraps remain to save board wages. In weather fine I nothing spend, But often sponge upon a friend. Section 106 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Verses made for fruit women. Apples. Come buy my fine wares, plums, apples, and pears, a hundred a penny, in conscience too many. Come, will you have any? 
my children are seven i wish them in heaven my husband has sought with his pipe and his pot not a farthing will gain them and i must maintain them asparagus ripe sprara grass fit for lad or lass to make their water pass oh tis pretty pickin with the tender chicken onions come follow me by the smell here are delicate onions to sell i promise to use you well they make the blood warmer you'll feed like a farmer for this is every cook's opinion no savoury dish without an onion but lest your kissing should be spoiled your onions must be thoroughly boiled or else you may spare your mistress a share the secret will never be known she cannot discover the breath of her lover but think it as sweet as her own oysters charming oysters i cry my masters come by so plump and so fresh so sweet is their flesh no colchester oyster is sweeter in moister your stomach they settle and rouse up your metal they'll make you a dad of a lass or a lad and madam your wife they'll please to the life be she barren be she old be she slut or be she scold eat my oysters and lie near her she'll be fruitful never fear her herrings be not sparing leave off swearing buy my herring fresh from allahide better never was tried come eat them with pure fresh butter and mustard their bellies are soft as white as a custard come sixpence a dozen to get me some bread or like my own herrings i soon shall be dead oranges come buy my fine oranges sauce for your veal and charming when squeeze in a pot of brown ale Section 107 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On Rover, a Lady Spaniel. Instructions to a Painter. Happiest of the Spaniel race, painter with thy colors grace. Draw his forehead large and high, draw his blue and humid eye. Draw his neck so smooth and round little neck with ribbons bound and the muscly swelling breast where the loves and graces rest and the spreading even back soft and sleek and glossy black and the tail that gently twines like the tendrils of the vines and the silky twisted hair shadowing thick the velvet ear velvet ears which hanging low o'er the veiny temples flow with a proper light and shade, let the winding hoop be laid, and within that arching bower, secret circle, mystic power, in a downy slumber place, happiest of the spaniel race. While the soft respiring dame, glowing with the softest flame, on the ravished favorite pours balmy dews, ambrosial showers. With thy utmost skill express, nature in her richest dress limpid rivers smoothly flowing orchards by those rivers blowing curling woodbine myrtle shade and the gay enameled maid where the linnets sit and sing little sportlings of the spring where the breathing field and grove soothe the heart and kindle love here for me and for the muse colors of resemblance choose make of lineaments divine daply female spaniels shine pretty fondlings of the fair gentle damsels gentle care but to one alone impart all the flattery of thy art crowd each feature crowd each grace which complete the desperate face let the spotted wanton dame feel a new resistless flame let the happiest of his race win the fair to his embrace but in shade the rest conceal nor to sight their joys reveal lest
Section 108 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epigrams on Windows, several of them written in 1726. 1. On a Window at an Inn We fly from luxury and wealth to hardships in pursuit of health from generous wines and costly fare, and dozing in an easy chair. Pursue the goddess health in vain to find her in a country sane, and everywhere her footsteps trace, and see her marks in every face, and still her favorites we meet, crowding the roads with naked feet. But, oh, so faintly we pursue, we near can have her full in view. 2 at an inn in england the glass by lovers nonsense blurred dims and obscures our sight so when our passions love has stirred it darkens reason's light three on a window at the four crosses in the watling street road warwickshire fool to put up four crosses at your door put up your wife she's crosser than all four Four, another at Chester. The church and clergy here, no doubt, are very near akin. Both weather-beaten are without, and empty both within. Five, another at Chester. My landlord is civil, but dear as the devil. Your pockets grown empty with nothing to tempt ye. The wine is so sour, it will give you a scour. The beer and the ale are mingled with stale. The veal is such carrion a dog would be wary on. All this I have felt, for I live on a smelt. 6. Another at Chester The walls of this town are full of renown, and strangers delight to walk round em. But as for the dwellers, both buyers and sellers, for me you may hang em or drown em. 7. Another, written upon a window, where there was no writing before. Thanks to my stars I once can see, a window here from scribbling free. Here no conceited coxcombs pass, to scratch their paltry drabs on glass nor paltry fool is calling names or dealing crowns to george and james eight on seeing verses written upon windows at inns the sage who said he should be proud of windows in his breast because he near a thought aloud that might not be confessed his window scrawled by every rake his breast again would cover and fairly bid the devil take the diamond and the lover. 8. On seeing verses written upon windows at inns. The sage who said he should be proud of windows in his breast, because he near a thought aloud that might not be confessed, his window scrawled by every rake his breast again would cover, and fairly bid the devil take the diamond and the lover. 9. Another. By Satan taught, all conjurers know, your mistress in a glass to show, and you can do as much. In this the devil and you agree, none made verses worse than he, and thine, I swear, are such. 10. Another. That love is the devil I'll prove when required, those rhymers abundantly show it. They swear that they all by love are inspired, and the devil's a damnable poet. 11. Another at Holyhead O Neptune, Neptune, must I still be here detained against my will? Is this your justice when I'm come above two hundred miles from home? Or mountain steep, or dusty plains, half choked with dust, half drowned with rains, only your godship to implore to let me kiss your other shore. A boon.
Section 109 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To Janus on New Year's Day, 1726 Two-faced Janus, god of time, be my Phoebus while I rhyme. To oblige your crony Swift, bring our dame a New Year's gift. She has got but half a face, Janus, since thou hast a brace. To my lady, once be kind, give her half thy face behind. God of time, if you be wise, look not with your future eyes. What imports thy forward sight? Well, if you could lose it quite, can you take delight in viewing this poor isle's approaching ruin? When thy retrospection vast sees the glorious ages past? Happy nation, were we blind, or had only eyes behind? Drown you morals, madam cries, I'll have none but forward eyes. Prudes decayed about may tack, strain their necks with looking back. Give me time when coming on, who regards him when he's gone? By the dean, though gravely told, New Year's help to make me old. Yet I find a New Year's lace burnishes an old year's face. Section 110 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A motto for Mr. Jason Hassard, woolen draper in Dublin, whose sign was the Golden Fleece. Jason, the valiant prince of Greece, from colches brought the Golden Fleece. We comb the wool, refine the stuff. For modern Jasons, that's enough. Oh, could we tame yon watchful dragon, old Jason would have less to brag on. To a friend who had been much abused in many inveterate libels. The greatest monarch may be stabbed by night, and fortune help the murderer in his flight. The vilest ruffian may commit a rape, yet safe from injured innocence escape. And calumny by working underground Can unrevenged the greatest merit wound. What's to be done? Shall wit and learning choose To live obscure and have no fame to lose? By censure frighted out of honor's road, Nor dare to use the gifts by heaven bestowed? Or fearless enter in through virtue's gate And buy distinction at the dearest rate? Catullus de Lesbia Lesbia forever on me rails, To talk of me she never fails. Now hang me but for all her art, I find that I have gained her heart. My proof is this, I plainly see, The case is just the same with me. I curse her every hour sincerely, Yet hang me but I love her dearly. On a curate's complaint of hard duty. I marched three miles through scorching sand, With zeal in heart and notes in hand. I rode four more to great St. Mary, Using four legs when two were wary. To three fair virgins I did tie men, In the close bands of pleasing hymen. I dipped two babes in holy water, And purified their mother after. Within an hour and eke a half, I preached three congregations deaf. Their thundering out with lungs long winded, I chopped so fast that few there minded. My emblem, the laborious son, saw all these mighty labors done. Before one race of his was run, all this performed by Robert Hewitt, what mortal else could ere go through it? To Betty the Grisette Queen of wit and beauty, Betty, Never may the muse forget ye, How thy face charms every shepherd, Spotted over like a leopard, And thy freckled neck displayed, Envy breeds in every maid, Like a fly-blown cake of tallow, Or on parchment ink turned yellow, Or a tawny speckled pippin, Shriveled with a winter's keeping, 
and thy beauty thus dispatched, let me praise thy wit unmatched. Sets of phrases cut and dry, evermore thy tongue supply, and thy memory is loaded with old scraps from plays exploded, stocked with repartees and jokes suited to all Christian folks, shreds of wit and senseless rhymes blundered out a thousand times, nor wilt thou of gifts be sparing which can ne'er be worse for wearing. Picking wit among collegians in the playhouse upper regions, where in the eighteen penny gallery Irish nymphs learn Irish raillery, but thy merit is thy failing, and thy raillery is railing. Thus with talents well endued, to be scurrilous and rude, when you pertly raise your snout, fleer and jibe and laugh and flout. This among Hiberian asses, for sheer wit and humour passes. Thus indulgent Chloe bit, swears you have a world of wit. Epigram from the French Who can believe with common sense A bacon slice gives God offence, Or how a herring has a charm Almighty vengeance to disarm? Wrapped up in majesty divine, Does he regard on what we dine? Epigram As Thomas was cudgelled one day by his wife, He took to the street and fled for his life, Tom's three dearest friends came by in the squabble, and saved him at once from the shrew and the rabble, then ventured to give him some sober advice. But Tom is a person of honour so nice, too wise to take counsel, too proud to take warning, that he sent to all three a challenge next morning. Three duels he fought, thrice ventured his life, went home, and was cudgelled again by his wife. Epigram, added by Stella when Marjorie chastises Ned, she calls it combing of his head. A kinder wife was never born. She combs his head and finds him horn. Joan Cudgels Ned Joan Cudgels Ned, yet Ned's a bully. Will Cudgels Bess, yet Will's a cully. Die, Ned and Bess, give Will to Joan. She dares not say her life's her own. Die, Joan and Will, give best to Ned, and every day she combs his head. Verses on Two Celebrated Modern Poets Behold those monarch oaks that rise with lofty branches to the skies, have large proportioned roots that grow with equal longitude below. Two bards that now in fashion reign, most aptly this device explain. If this to clouds and stars will venture, that creeps as far to reach the centre. Or more to show the thing I mean, have you not o'er a saw-pit seen? A skilled mechanic that has stood high on a length of prostrate wood, who hired a subterraneous friend to take his iron by the end. But which excelled was never found, the man above or underground. The moral is so plain to hit, that, had I been the god of wit, then in a saw-pit and wet weather should Young and Phillips drudge together. Epitaph on General Gorgas and Lady Meath Under this stone lies Dick and Dolly. Doll dying first, Dick grew melancholy. For Dick without doll thought living a folly. Dick lost in doll a wife tender and dear, But Dick lost by doll twelve hundred a year, A loss that Dick thought no mortal could bear. Dick sighed for his doll and his mournful arms crossed, Thought much of his doll and the jointure he lost. The first vexed him much, the other vexed most. Thus loaded with grief, Dick sighed and he cried, to live without both full three days he tried, but liked neither loss, and so quietly died. Dick left a pattern few will copy after, then, reader, pray shed some tears of salt water, for so sad a tale is no subject of laughter. Meath smiles for the jointure, though gotten so late, the son laughs that got the hard-gotten estate. 
and Cuff grins forgetting the alicant plate. Here quiet they lie, in hopes to rise one day, both solemnly put in this hole on Sunday, and here rest, sic transit gloria mundi. Verses on I Know Not What My latest tribute here I send, with this let your collection end. Thus I consign you down to fame, a character to praise or blame, and if the whole may pass for true, contented rest, you have your due. Give future time the satisfaction to leave one handle for detraction. Dr. Swift to himself on St. Cecilia's Day Grave Dean of St. Patrick's, how comes it to pass that you who know music know more than an ass, that you who so lately were writing of drapers should lend your cathedral to players and scrapers, to act such an opera once in a year, so offensive to every true Protestant ear, with trumpets and fiddles and organs and singing, will sure the pretender and popery bring in, no Protestant prelate his lordship or grace, durst there show his right or most reverend face, how would it pollute their croziers and rochets to listen to minims and quavers and crotchets? An Answer to a Friend's Question The furniture that best doth please, St. Patrick's Dean, good sir, are these, the knife and fork with which I eat, and next the pot that boils the meat. The next to be preferred, I think, is the glass in which I drink the shelves on which my books I keep, and the bed on which I sleep, an antique elbow-chair between, big enough to hold the dean, and the stove that gives delight in the cold, bleak, wintry night. To these we add a thing below, more for use reserved than show. Section 111 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. An Apology to Lady Carteret A lady wise as well as fair, whose conscience always was her care, thoughtful upon a point of moment, would have the text as well as comment. So, hearing of a grave divine, she sent to bid him come to dine. But you must know he was not quite so grave as to be unpolite, thought human learning would not lessen the dignity of his profession, and if you'd heard the man discourse or preach, you'd like him scarce the worse. He long had bid the court farewell, retreating silent to his cell, suspected for the love he bore to one who swayed some time before which made it more surprising how he should be sent for thither now. The message told, he gapes and stares, and scarce believes his eyes or airs, could not conceive what it should mean, and fain would hear it told again. But then the squire, so trim and nice, twere rude to make him tell it twice, so bowed was thankful for the honour, and would not fail to wait upon her. His beaver brushed his shoes and gown, away he trudges into town, passes the lower castle yard, and now advancing to the guard, he trembles at the thoughts of state, for conscious of his sheepish gait, his spirits of a sudden failed him, he stopped and could not tell what ailed him. What was the message I received? Why, certainly, the captain raved, to dine with her and come at three, impossible it can't be me or maybe i mistook the word my lady it must be my lord my lord's abroad my lady too what must the unhappy doctor do is captain crashroad here pray no nay then tis time for me to go am i awake or do i dream i'm sure he called me by my name named me as plain as he could spake, and yet there must be some mistake. Why, what a jest should I have been, had now my lady been within! 
what could i've said i'm mighty glad she went abroad she'd thought me mad the hour of dining now is past well then i'll e'en go home and fast and since i scaped being made a scoff i think i'm very fairly off my lady now returning home calls crasherode is the doctor come he had not heard of him pray see tis now a quarter after three the captain walks about and searches through all the rooms and courts and arches examines all the servants round in vain no doctors to be found my lady could not choose but wonder captain i fear you've made some blunder but pray to-morrow go at ten i'll try his manners once again if rudeness be the effect of knowledge my son shall never see a college the captain was a man of reading and much good sense as well as breeding who loath to blame or to incense said little in his own defence next day another message brought the doctor frightened at his fault is dressed and stealing through the crowd now pale as death and blushed and bowed panting and faltering hummed and hawed her ladyship was gone abroad the captain too he did not know whether he ought to stay or go begged she'd forgive him in conclusion my lady pitying his confusion called her good nature to relieve him told him she thought she might believe him and would not only grant his suit but visit him and eat some fruit provided at a proper time he told the real truth in rhyme twas to no purpose to oppose she'd heard of no excuse in prose the doctor stood not to debate glad to compound at any rate so bowing seemingly complied though if he durst he had denied but first resolved to show his taste was too refined to give a face he treat with nothing that was rare but winding walks and purer air would entertain without expense or pride or vain magnificence for well he knew to such a guest the plainest meals must be the best to stomachs clogged with costly fare simplicity alone is rare while high and nice and curious meats are really but vulgar treats instead of spoils of persian looms the costly boast of regal rooms thought it more courtly and discreet to scatter roses at her feet roses of richest dye that shone with native lustre like her own beauty that needs no aid of art through every sense to reach the heart the gracious dame though well she knew all this was much beneath her due liked everything at least thought fit to praise it par manière de quit yet she though seeming pleased can't bear the scorching sun or chilling air disturbed alike at both extremes whether he shows or hides his beams though seeming pleased at all she sees starts at the ruffling of the trees and scarce can speak for want of breath in half a walk fatigued to death the doctor takes his hint from hence to apologize his late offence madame the mighty power of use now strangely pleads in my excuse if you unused have scarcely strength to gain this walk's untoward length if frightened at a scene so rude through long disuse of solitude if long confined to fires and screens you dread the waving of these greens if you who long have breathed the fumes of city fogs and crowded rooms do now solicitously shun the cooler air and dazzling sun if his majestic eye you flee learn hence to excuse and pity me consider what it is to bear the powdered courtier's witty snare to see the important man of dress scoffing my college awkwardness to be the strutting cornet's sport to run the gauntlet of the court winning my way by slow approaches through crowds of coxcombs and of coaches from the first fierce cockaded sentry quite through the tribe of waiting gentry to pass so many crowded stages and stand the staring of your pages and after all to crown my spleen be told you are not to be seen or if you are be forced to bear the awe of your majestic air and can i then be faulty found 
in dreading this vexatious round? Can it be strange if I eschew a scene so glorious and so new? Or is he criminal? Section 112 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Birth of Manly Virtue Inscribed to Lord Carteret, 1724 Once on a time a righteous sage, grieved with the vices of the age, applied to Jove with fervent prayer, O oh, Jove, if virtue be so fair, as it was deemed in former days by Plato and by Socrates, whose beauty's mortal eyes escape only for want of outward shape, make then its real excellence for once the theme of human sense. So shall the eye, by form confined, direct and fix the wandering mind, and long deluded mortals see with rapture what they used to flee. Jove grants the prayer, gives virtue birth, and bids him bless and mend the earth. Behold him blooming fresh and fair, now made, ye gods, a son and heir, an heir, and stranger yet to hear, an heir, an orphan of a peer. But prodigies are wrought to prove nothing impossible to Jove. Virtue was for this sex designed, in mild reproof to womankind in manly form to let them see the loveliness of modesty, the thousand decencies that shone with lessened lustre in their own, which few had learned enough to prize, and some thought modish to despise. To make his merit more discerned, he goes to school, he reads, is learned. Raised high above his birth by knowledge, he shines distinguished in a college, Resolved, nor honour, nor estate, himself alone should make him great. Here soon for every art renowned, his influence is diffused around. The inferior youth to learning led, less to be famed than to be fed. Behold the glory he has won, and blush to see themselves outdone. And now, inflamed with rival rage, in scientific strife engage. Engage, and... In the glorious strife, the arts new kindle into life. Here would our hero ever dwell, fixed in a lonely learned cell, contented to be truly great in virtue's best beloved retreat. Contented he, but fate ordains, he now shall shine in nobler sains, raised high like some celestial fire to shine the more still rising higher completely formed in every part to win the soul and glad the heart. The powerful voice, the graceful mien, lovely alike or heard or seen. The outward form and inward vie, his soul bright beaming from his eye, ennobling every act and air with just and generous and sincere. Accomplished thus, his next resort is to the council and the court, where virtue is in least repute and interest the one pursuit, where right and wrong are bought and sold, bartered for beauty and for gold. Here manly virtue, even here, pleased in the person of a peer, a peer, a scarcely bearded youth, who talked of justice and of truth, of innocence the surest guard, tales here forgot or yet unheard, that he alone deserved esteem who was the man he wished to seem called it unmanly and unwise to lurk behind a mean disguise. Give fraudful vice the mask and screen, tis virtue's interest to be seen. Called want of shame a want of sense, and found in blushes eloquence. Thus acting what he taught so well, he drew dumb merit from her cell, led with amazing art along the bashful dame and loosed her tongue, and while he made her value known, yet more displayed and raised his own. Thus young, thus proof to all temptations, he rises to the highest stations. For where high honour is the prize, true virtue has a right to rise. Let courtly slaves low bend the knee to wealth and vice in high degree. Exalted worth disdains to owe, 
its grandeur to its greatest foe. Now raised on high, see virtue shows the godlike ends for which he rose. For him let proud ambition know the height of glory here below. Grandeur by goodness made complete, to bless is truly to be great. He taught how men to honor rise, like gilded vapors to the skies, which howsoever they display their glory from the god of day, their noblest use is to abate his dangerous excess of heat, to shield the infant fruits and flowers, and bless the earth with genial showers. Now change the scene, a nobler care demands him in a higher sphere. Distress of nations calls him hence, permitted so by providence. For models made to mend our kind, to no one clime should be confined. And manly virtue, like the sun, his course of glorious toils should run, alike diffusing in his flight congenial joy and life and light. Pale envy sickens, error flies, and discord in his presence dies. Oppression hides with guilty dread, and merit rears her drooping head. The arts revive, the valleys sing, and winter softens into spring. The wandering world where e'er he moves with new delight looks up and loves. One sex consenting to admire, nor less the other to desire, while he, though seated on a throne, confines his love to one alone. The rest condemned with rival voice, repining, do applaud his choice. Fame now reports the western isle is made his mansion for a while, whose anxious natives night and day, happy beneath his righteous sway, weary the gods with ceaseless prayer to bless him and to keep him there, and claim it as Section 113 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On Paddy's Character of the Intelligencer, 1729. As a thorn bush or oaken bough stuck in an Irish cabin's brow, above the door at country fair betokens entertainment there, so bays on poets' brows have been set for a sign of wit within. And as ill neighbors in the night pull down an alehouse bush for spite, the laurel so, by poets worn, is by the teeth of envy torn. Envy a canker worm which tears those sacred leaves that lightning spares. And now to exemplify this moral, Tom having earned a twig of laurel, which measured on his head was found, not long enough to reach half round, but like a girl's cockade was tied, a trophy on his temple side. Paddy repined to see him wear this badge of honour in his hair, and thinking this cockade of wit would his own temples better fit. Forming his muse by Smedley's model, let's drive at Tom's devoted noddle, pelts him by turns with verse and prose, hums like a hornet at his nose at length presumes to vent his satire on the dean tom's honoured friend and patron the eagle in the tale ye know teased by a buzzing wasp below took wing to jove and hoped to rest securely in the thunderer's Section 114 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. An Epistle to His Excellency John, Lord Carteret, by Dr. Delaney, 1729. The wise and learned ruler of our isle, whose guardian care can all her griefs beguile, when next your generous soul shall condescend, to instruct or entertain your humble friend, whether retiring from your weighty charge, or some high theme you learnedly enlarge, of all the ways of wisdom reason well, how Richelieu rose and how Sejanus fell. 
or when your brow less thoughtfully unbends, circled with swift and some delighted friends, when mixing mirth and wisdom with your wine, like that your wit shall flow, your genius shine, nor with less praise the conversation guide than in the public councils you decide, or when the dean long privileged to rail asserts his friends with more impetuous zeal. You hear, whilst I sit by abashed and mute, with soft concessions shortening the dispute, then close with kind inquiries of my state. How are your tides, and have they rose of late? Why, Christchurch is a pretty situation. There are not many better in the nation. This with your other things must yield you clear, some six, at least five hundred pounds a year. Suppose at such time I took the freedom to speak these truths as plainly as you read em. You shall rejoin, my lord, when I've replied, and if you please, my lady shall decide. My lord, I'm satisfied you meant me well, and that I'm thankful all the world can tell. But you'll forgive me if I own the event is short, is very short of your intent. At least I feel some ills unfelt before, my income less and my expenses more. How doctor, double vicar, double rector, a dignitary with a city lecture! What glebes, what dues, what tithes, what fines, what rent? Why, doctor, will you never be content? Would my good lord but cast up the account, and see to what my revenues amount, my titles ample but my gain so small, that one good vicarage is worth them all. And very wretched sure is he that's double, in nothing but his titles and his trouble. And to this cry and grievance, if you please, my horses foundered on Fermanagh ways. Ways of well-polished and well-pointed stone, where every step endangers every bone, and more to raise your pity and your wonder, to churches twelve Hibernian miles asunder, with complicated cures I labor harden, beside whole summers absent from my garden. But that the world would think I played the fool, I'd change with Charlie Grattan for his school. What fine cascades, what vistos I might make, fixed in the center of the Iernian lake. There might I sail delighted, smooth and safe, beneath the conduct of my good Sir Rafe. There's not a better steerer in the realm. I hope, my lord, you'll call him to the helm. Doctor, a glorious scheme to ease your grief, when cures are cross, a school's a sure relief. You cannot fail of being happy there, the lake will be the lethe of your care. The scheme is for your honour and your ease, and, doctor, I'll promote it when you please. Meanwhile, allowing things below your merit, yet, doctor, you've a philosophic spirit. Your wants are few and like your income small, and you've enough to gratify them all. You've trees and fruits and roots enough in store, and what would a philosopher have of more? You cannot wish for coaches, kitchens, cooks. My lord, I've not enough to buy me books. Or pray suppose my wants were all supplied, are there no wants I should regard beside? Whose breast is so unmanned as not to grieve, compassed with miseries he can't relieve? Who can be happy who should wish to live, and want the godlike happiness to give? That I'm a judge of this you must allow. I had it once, and I'm debarred it now. Ask your own heart, my lord, if this be true, then how unblessed am I, how blessed are you? Tis true, but, doctor, let us waive all that. Say, if you had your wish, what you'd be at. Excuse me, good my lord, I won't be sounded, nor shall your favour by my wants be bounded. My lord, I challenge nothing as my due, nor is it fit I should prescribe to you. Yet this might Symmachus himself avow, whose rigid rules are antiquated now. My lord, I'd wish...
Section 115 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1 by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. An Epistle Upon an Epistle From a Certain Doctor to a Certain Great Lord Being a Christmas Box for Dr. Delaney As Jove will not attend on less When things of more importance press, you can't, grave sir, believe it hard, that you, a low Hibernian bard, should cool your heels a while and wait, unanswered at your patron's gate. And would my lord vouchsafe to grant this one poor humble boon I want, free leave to play his secretary, as Falstaff acted old King Harry. I tell of yours in rhyme and print, folks shrug and cry, there's nothing in't and after several readings of her it shines most in the marble cover how could so fine a taste dispense with mean degrees of wit and sense nor will my lord so far beguile the wise and learned of our isle to make it pass upon the nation by dint of his sole approbation the task is arduous patrons find to warp the sense of all mankind who think your muse must first aspire ere he advance the doctor higher you've cause to say he meant you well that you are thankful who can tell for still you're short which grieves your spirit of his intent you mean your merit a quanto rectius tu adepti quinil moliris tarn inepti smedley thou jonathan of cloffer when thou thy humble lay dost offer to grafton's grace with grateful heart thy thanks and verse devoid of art content with what his bounty gave no larger income dost thou crave but you must have cascades and all ierne's lake for your canal your vistos barges and a pox on all pride our speaker for your coxon it's pity that he can't bestow you twelve commoners in caps to row you thus edgar proud in days of yore held monarchs laboring at the oar and as he passed so swelled the dee enraged as erne would do at thee how different is this from smedley his name is up he may in bed lie who only asks some pretty cure in wholesome soil and ether pure the garden stored with artless flowers in either angle shady bowers no gay parterre with costly green must in the ambient hedge be seen but nature freely takes her course nor fears him from ungrateful force no shears to check her sprouting vigour or shape the yews to antic figure but you forsooth your all must squander on that poor spot called delville yonder and when you've been at vast expenses in whims parterres canals and fences your assets fail and cash is wanting no farther buildings farther planting no wonder when you raise and level think this wall low and that wall bevel here a convenient box you found which you demolished to the ground then built then took up with your arbor and set the house to rupert barber you sprang an arch which in a scurvy humour you tumbled topsy-turvy you changed a circle to a square then to a circle as you were who can imagine whence the fund is that you quadrata change rotundis to fame a temple you erect a flora does the dome protect mounts walks on high and in a hollow you place the muses and apollo there shining midst his train to grace your whimsical poetic place these stories were of old designed as fables but you have refined the poet's mythologic dreams to real muses gods and streams who would not swear when you contrive thus that your don quixote redivive us beneath a dry canal there lies which only winter's rain supplies oh couldst thou by some magic spell hither convey st patrick's well here may it reassume its stream and take a greater patrick's name if your expenses rise so high what income can your wants supply yet still you fancy you inherit a fund of such superior merit that you can't fail of more provision all by my lady's kind decision for thee more livings you can fish up you think you'll sooner be a bishop that could not be my lord's intent nor can it answer the event 
Most think what has been heaped on you to other sort of folk was due. Rewards too great for your flim flams, epistles, riddles, epigrams. Though now your depth must not be sounded, the time was when you'd have compounded for less than Charlie Grattan's school. Five hundred pound a year's no fool. Take this advice then from your friend, to your ambition put an end. Be frugal, Pat, pay what you owe, before you build and you bestow. Be modest, nor address your betters with begging vain familiar letters. A passage may be found, I've heard, in some old Greek or Latian bard, which says, Would crows in silence eat their offals or their better meat, their generous feeders not provoking by loud and inharmonious croaking, they might unhurt Section 116 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A libel on the Reverend Dr. Delaney and His Excellency John Lord Carteret, 1729. Deluded mortals, whom the great choose for companions tete-a-tete, -tete, who at their dinners on famille get leave to sit whene'er you will, then boasting tell us where you dined, and how his lordship was so kind, how many pleasant things he spoke, and how you laughed at every joke. Swear he's a most facetious man, that you and he are cup and can. You travel with a heavy load, and quite mistake preferment's road. Suppose, my lord, and you alone, hint the least interest of your own. His visage drops, he knits his brow, he cannot talk of business now or mention but a vacant post, he'll turn it off with, Name your toast. Nor could the nicest artist paint a countenance with more constraint. For, as their appetites to quench, lords keep a pimp to bring a wench. So men of wit are but a kind of panders to a vicious mind, who proper objects must provide to gratify their lust of pride. When wearied with intrigues of state, they find an idle hour to prate. Then shall you dare to ask a place, you forfeit all your patron's grace, and disappoint the sole design for which he summoned you to dine. Thus Congreve spent in writing plays, and one poor office half his days, while Montague, who claimed the station to be Macanus of the nation, for poets open table kept, but near considered where they slept, himself as rich as fifty jews was easy though they wanted shoes and crazy congreve scarce could spare a shilling to discharge his chair till prudence taught him to appeal from pian's fire to party zeal not owing to his happy vein the fortunes of his later scene took proper principles to thrive and so might every dunce alive thus steele who owned what others writ and flourished by imputed wit from perils of a hundred jails, withdrew to starve and die in Wales. Thus gay the hare with many friends, twice seven long years the court attends, who under tales conveying truth to virtue formed a princely youth, who paid his courtship with the crowd as far as modest pride allowed, rejects a servile usher's place, and leaves St. James's in disgrace. Thus Addison, by lords caressed, was left in foreign lands distressed, forgot at home, became for hire a travelling tutor to a squire. But wisely left the muse's hill, to business shaped the poet's quill, let all his barren laurels fade, took up himself the courtier's trade, and grown a minister of state, saw poets at his levy wait. Hail, happy Pope! whose generous mind, detesting all the statesman kind, contemning courts at courts unseen, refused the visits of a queen. A soul with every virtue fraught, by sages, priests, or poets taught, whose filial piety excels whatever Grecian story tells. A genius for all stations fit, whose meanest talent is his wit. His heart too great, though fortune little, to lick a rascal statesman's spittle. 
Appealing to the nation's taste, Above the reach of want is placed. By Homer dead was taught to thrive, Which Homer never could alive, And sits aloft on Pindus's head, Despising slaves that cringe for bread. True politicians only pay For solid work, but not for play, Nor ever choose to work with tools Forged up in colleges and schools. Consider how much more is due To all their journeymen than you. At table you can Horace quote, They at a pinch can bribe a vote. You show your skill in Grecian story, But they can manage Whig and Tory. You as a critic are so curious To find a verse in Virgil spurious. But they can smoke the deep designs When Bolingbroke with Pulteney dines. Besides, your patron may upbraid ye That you have got a place already, An office for your talents fit To flatter, carve, and show your wit, To snuff the lights and stir the fire, And get a dinner for your hire. What claim have you to place or pension? He overpays in condescension. But, reverend doctor, you we know, could never condescend so low. The viceroy whom you now attend would, if he durst, be more your friend. Nor will you in those gifts despise by which himself was taught to rise. When he has virtue to retire, he'll grieve he did not raise you higher, and place you in a better station, although it might have pleased the nation. This may be true, submitting still, to Walpole's more than royal will, and what condition can be worse? He comes to drain a beggar's purse, he comes to tie our chains on faster, and show us England is our master. Caressing knaves and dunces wooing to make them work their own undoing. What has he else to bait his traps, or bring his vermin in but scraps? The offals of a church distressed, a hungry vicarage at best, or some remote inferior post with forty pounds a year at most. But here again you interpose, your favorite lord is none of those, who owe their virtues to their stations and characters to dedications, for keep him in or turn him out, his learning none will call in doubt. His learning, though a poet said it, before a play would lose no credit nor Pope would dare deny him wit, although to praise it Philip's writ. I own he hates an action base, his virtues battling with his place, nor wants a nice discerning spirit betwixt a true and spurious merit, can sometimes drop a voter's claim and give up a party to his fame. I do the most that friendship can, I hate the viceroy, love the man. But you, who till your fortunes made, must be a sweetener by your trade, should swear he never meant us ill, we suffer sore against his will, that if we could but see his heart, he would have chose a milder part. We rather should lament his case, who must obey or lose his place. Since this reflection slipped your pen, insert it when you write again, and to illustrate it produce this simile for his excuse. So to destroy a guilty land, an angel sent by heaven's command, while he obeys almighty will, perhaps may feel compassion still, and wish the task had been assigned to spirits of less gentle kind. But I, in politics grown old, whose thoughts are of a different mould, who from my soul sincerely hate both kings and ministers of state, who look on courts with stricter eyes to see the seeds of vice arise, can lend you an illusion fitter, though flattering knaves may call it bitter, which, if you durst but give it place, would show you many a statesman's face. Fresh from the tripod of Apollo, I had it in the words that follow. Take notice to avoid offence, I here accept his excellence. So to effect his monarch's ends, from hell a viceroy devil ascends, his budget with corruptions crammed, the contributions of the damned, which with unsparing hand he strews through courts and senates as he goes, and then at Beelzebub's black hall complains his budget was too small. Your simile may better shine in verse, but there is truth in mine, for no imaginable things can differ more than gods and kings. And states
Section 117 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To Dr. Delaney on the libels written against him, 1729. As some raw youth in country bred, to arms by thirst of honour led, when at a skirmish first he hears the bullets whistling round his ears, will duck his head aside, will start, and feel a trembling at his heart, till scaping oft without a wound, lessens the terror of the sound. Fly bullets now as thick as hops, he runs into a cannon's chops. An author thus, who pants for fame, begins the world with fear and shame, when first in print you see him dread, each pop-gun levelled at his head. The lead yon critic's quill contains is destined to beat out his brains, as if he heard loud thunders roll, cries, Lord, have mercy on his soul, concluding that another shot will strike him dead upon the spot. But when with squibbing, flashing, popping, he cannot see one creature dropping, that, missing fire or missing aim, his life is safe, I mean his fame, the danger past takes heart of grace, and looks a critic in the face. Though splendor gives the fairest mark to poisoned arrows in the dark, yet in yourself, when smooth and ruined, they glance aside without a wound. Tis said the gods tried all their art, how pain they might from pleasure part. But little could their strength avail, both still are fastened by the tail. Thus fame and censure with a tether, by fate are always linked together. Why will you aim to be preferred in wit before the common herd, and yet grow mortified and vexed to pay the penalty annexed? Tis eminence makes envy rise, as fairest fruits attract the flies. Should stupid libels grieve your mind, you soon a remedy may find. Lie down obscure, like other folks, below the lash of snarlers' jokes. Their faction is five hundred odds, for every coxcomb lends them rods, and sneers as learnedly as they, like females o'er their morning tay. You say the muse will not contain, and write you must, or break a vein. Then if you find the terms too hard, no longer my advice regard. But raise your fancy on the wing, the Irish Senate's praises sing. How jealous of the nation's freedom, and for corruptions how they weed em. How each the public good pursues, how far their hearts from private views. Make all true patriots up to shoe-boys, huzzah their brethren at the blue boys. Thus grown a member of the club, no longer dread the rage of grub. How oft am I for rhyme to seek, to dress a thought I toil a week, and then how thankful to the town if all my pains will earn a crown, while every critic can devour my work and me in half an hour. Would men of genius cease to write, the rogues must die for want and spite, must die for want of food and raiment if scandal did not find them payment. How cheerfully the hawkers cry, a satire and the gentry buy, while my hard-laboured poem pines unsold upon the printer's lines. A genius in the reverend gown must ever keep its owner down. Tis an unnatural conjunction, and spoils the credit of the function. Round all your brethren cast your eyes, point out the surest men to rise, that club of candidates in black, the least deserving of the pack, aspiring factious fierce and loud with grace and learning unendowed can turn their hands to every job the fittest tools to work for bob will sooner coin a thousand lies than suffer men of parts to rise they crowd about preferment's gate and press you down with all their weight for as of old mathematicians were by the vulgar thought magicians so academic dull ale-drinkers pronounce all men of wit free thinkers Wit, as the chief of virtue's friends, disdains to serve ignoble ends. Observe what loads of stupid rhymes oppress us in corrupted times. What pamphlets in a court's defense show reason, grammar, truth, or sense? For though the muse delights in fiction, she near inspires against conviction. Then keep your virtue still unmixed, and let not faction come betwixt. By party steps no grandeur climat, though it would make you England's primat. 
First learn the science to be dull, And then may soon your conscience lull. If not, however, seated high, Your genius in your face will fly. When Jove was from his teeming head Of wit's fair goddess brought to bed, There followed at his lying in For after birth a suitor kin, Which, as the nurse pursued to kill, Attained by flight the muse's hill. Therein the soil began to root, And littered at Parnassus's foot. From hence the critic vermin sprung, With harpy claws and poisonous tongue, Who fatten on poetic scraps, Too cunning to be caught in traps. Dame nature, as the learned show, Provides each animal its foe. Hounds hunt the hare, the wily fox, Devours your geese, the wolf your flocks. Thus envy pleads a natural claim To persecute the muse's fame. On poets in all times abusive, From Homer down to Pope inclusive. Yet what avails it to complain? You try to take revenge in vain. A rat your utmost rage defies, That safe behind the wainscot lies. Say, did you ever know by sight In cheese an individual might? Show me the same numeric flay That bit your neck but yesterday. You then may boldly go in quest To find the Grub Street poet's nest. What sponging house in dread of jail Receives them while they wait for bail? What alley are they nestled in To flourish o'er a cup of gin? Find the last garret where they lay, Or cellar where they starve to-day. Suppose you have them all trepanned, With each a libel in his hand. What punishment would you inflict? Or call them rogues, or get them kicked? These they have often tried before, You but oblige them so much more. Themselves would be the first to tell, To make their trash the better sell. You have been libelled, let us know, What fool officious told you so. Will you regard the hawker's cries, Who in his titles always lies? What e'er the noisy scoundrel says, It might be something in your praise, And praise bestowed in Grub Street rhymes Would vex one more a thousand times. Till critics blame and judges praise, The poet cannot claim his bays. On me, when dunces are satiric, I take it for a panegyric. Section 118 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Directions for Making a Birthday Song, 1729 To form a just and finished peace, take twenty gods of Rome or Greece, whose godships are in chief request, and fit your present subject best. And should it be your hero's case to have both male and female race, your business must be to provide a score of goddesses beside. Some call their monarchs sons of Saturn, for which they bring a modern pattern, because they might have heard of one who often longed to eat his son. But this, I think, will not go down, for here the father kept his crown. Why, then, appoint him son of Jove, who met his mother in a grove. To this we freely shall consent, well knowing what the poets meant. And in their sense, twixt me and you, it may be literally true. Next, as the laws of verse require, he must be greater than his sire. For Jove, as every schoolboy knows, was able Saturn to depose. And sure no Christian poet breathing would be more scrupulous than a heathen. Or, if to blasphemy it tends, that's but a trifle among friends. Your hero now, another Mars is, makes mighty armies turn their arses. Behold his glittering falchion mow, whole squadrons at a single blow, while victory, with wings outspread, flies like an eagle o'er his head. His milk-white steed upon its haunches, or pawing into dead men's paunches. As Overton has drawn his sire, still seen o'er many an alehouse fire. Then from his arm hoarse thunder rolls, as loud as fifty mustard bowls, for thunder still his arm supplies, and lightning always in his eyes. They both are cheap enough in conscience, and serve to echo rattling nonsense. The rumbling words march fierce along, made trebly dreadful in your song. Sweet poet hired for birthday rhymes to sing of wars, choose peaceful times. What though for fifteen years and more Genus has locked his temple door, 
Though not a coffee-house we read in Has mentioned arms on this side Sweden, Nor London journals, nor the postman, Though fond of warlike lies as most men, For still with battles stuff thy head full, For must thy hero not be dreadful? Dismissing Mars, it next must follow, Your conqueror is become Apollo, That he's Apollo is as plain as, That Robin Walpole is Macanas. But that he struts and that he squints, You'd know him by Apollo's prince. Old Phoebus is but half as bright, For yours can shine both day and night. The first, perhaps, may once an age Inspire you with poetic rage. Your Phoebus royal every day Not only can inspire, but pay. Then make this new Apollo sit, Sole patron, judge, and god of wit. How from his altitude he stoops To raise up virtue when she droops, On learning how his bounty flows, And with what justice he bestows, Fair Isis and ye banks of Cam, be witness if I tell a flam, what prodigies in arts we drain from both your streams in George's reign, as from the flowery bed of Nile. But here's enough to show your style. Broad innuendos such as this, if well applied, can hardly miss. For when you bring your songs in print, he'll get it read and take the hint. It must be read before it is warbled, the paper gilt and cover marbled and will be so much more your debtor, because he never knew a letter. And as he hears his wit and sense, to which he never made pretense, set out in hyperbolic strains, a guinea shall reward your pains. For patrons never pay so well, as when they scarce have learned to spell. Next call him Neptune with his trident, he rules the sea, you see him ridant. And if provoked, he soundly firks his rebellious waves with rods like Xerxes. He would have seized the Spanish plate had not the fleet gone out too late, and in their very ports besiege them, but that he would not disoblige them, and make the rascals pay him dearly for those affronts they gave him yearly. Tis not denied that when we write, our ink is black, our paper white, and when we scrawl our paper o'er, we blacken what was white before. I think this practice only fit for dealers in satiric wit. But you some white lead ink must get, And write on paper black as jet. Your interest lies to learn the knack Of whitening what before was black. Thus your encomium to be strong Must be applied directly wrong. A tyrant for his mercy praise, And crown a royal dunce with bays. A squinting monkey load with charms, And paint a coward fierce in arms. Is he to avarice inclined? Extol him for his generous mind. And when we starve for want of corn, Come out with Amalthea's horn. For all experience this evinces The only art of pleasing princes. For princes' love you should discount On virtues which they know they want. One compliment I had forgot, But songsters must omit it not. I freely grant the thought is old, Why then your hero must be told. In him such virtues lie inherent To qualify him God's vice-regent that with no title to inherit he must have been a king by merit. Yet be the fancy old or new, tis partly false and partly true, and, take it right, it means no more than George and William claimed before. Should some obscure inferior fellow, like Julius or the youth of Pella, when all your list of gods is out, presume to show his mortal snout, and as a deity intrude, because he had the world subdued, O oh, let him not debase your thoughts, or name him but to tell his faults. Of gods I only quote the best, but you may hook in all the rest. Now, birthday bard, with joy proceed, to raise your empress and her breed. First of the first, to vouch your lies, bring all the females of the skies, the graces and their mistress Venus, must venture down to entertain us. With bended knees when they adore her, what dowdies they appear before her. Nor shall we think you talk at random, For Venus might be her great grandam. Six thousand years has lived the goddess, Your heroine hardly fifty odd is. Besides your songsters oft have shown That she has graces of her own. Three graces by Lucina brought her, Just three and every grace a daughter. Here many a king his heart and crown Shall at their snowy feet lay down. In royal robes they come by dozens To court their English-German cousins beside a pair of princely babies that five years hence will both be hebes. Now see her seated in her throne, with genuine lustre all her own. Poor Cynthia never shone so bright, 
Her splendour is but borrowed light, And only with her brother linked Can shine without him is extinct. But Carolina shines the clearer With neither spouse nor brother near her, And darts her beam o'er both our isles, Though George is gone a thousand miles. Thus Berecynthia takes her place, Attended by her heavenly race, And sees a son in every god, Unawed by Jove's all-shaking nod. Now sing his little highness Freddy, Who struts like any king already. With so much beauty show me any maid That could resist this charming Ganymede, Where majesty with sweetness vies, And like his father early wise. Then cut him out a world of work, To conquer Spain and quell the Turk. Foretell his empire crowned with bays, And golden times and halcyon days, and swear his line shall rule the nation for ever till the conflagration. But now it comes into my mind, we left a little duke behind, a cupid in his face and size, and only wants to want his eyes. Make some provision for the younker, find him a kingdom out to conquer, prepare a fleet to waft him o'er, make Gulliver his commodore, into whose pocket valiant Willyput will soon subdue the realm of Lilliput. A skilful critic justly blames hard, tough, crank, guttural, harsh, stiff names. The sense can ne'er be too jejune, but smooth your words to fit the tune. Hanover may do well enough, but George and Brunswick are too rough. Hess Darmstadt makes a rugged sound, and Guelp the strongest ear will wound. In vain are all attempts from Germany to find out proper words for harmony. And yet I must accept the Rhine, because it clinks to Caroline. Hail, Queen of Britain, Queen of Rhymes, be sung ten hundred thousand times. Too happy were the poet's crew, if their own happiness they knew. Three syllables did never meet, so soft, so sliding, and so sweet. Nine other tuneful words like that would prove even Homer's numbers flat. Behold, three beauteous vowels stand, with bridegroom liquids hand in hand. In concord here for ever fixed, no jarring consonant betwixt. May Caroline continue long, for ever fair and young in song. What though the royal carcass must squeeze in a coffin turned to dust? Those elements her name compose, like atoms, are exempt from blows. Though Caroline may fill your gaps, yet still you must consult your maps. Find rivers with harmonious names, Sabrina, Medway, and the Thames. Britannia long will wear like steel, but Albion's cliffs are out at heel. And patience can endure no more to hear the Belgic lion roar. Give up the phrase of haughty Gaul, but proud Iberia soundly maul. Restore the ships by Philip taken, and make him crouch to save his bacon. Nassau, who got the name of Glorious, because he never was victorious, a hanger-on has always been, for old acquaintance, bring him in. To Walpole you might lend a line, but much I fear he's in decline, and if you chance to come too late, when he goes out you share his fate, and bear the new successor's frown, or whom you once sang up, sing down. Reject with scorn that stupid notion to praise your hero for devotion, nor entertain a thought so odd that princes should believe in God, but follow the securest rule and turn it all to ridicule. Tis grown the choicest wit at court, and gives the maids of honour sport. For since they talked with Dr. Clark, they now can venture in the dark. That sound divine the truth has spoke all, and pawned his word hell is not local. This will not give them half the trouble of bargains sold or meanings double. Supposing now your song is done, to mine here handle next you run, who artfully will pare and prune your words to some Italian tune. Then print it in the largest letter, with capitals the more the better. Section 119 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. THE PHEASANT AND THE LARK, A FABLE BY DR. DELANEY, 1730 In ancient times, as bards indite, if clerks have conned the records right, a peacock reigned, whose glorious sway his subjects with delight obey. His tail was beauteous to behold, 
replete with goodly eyes and gold, Fair emblem of that monarch's guise, Whose train at once is rich and wise, And princely ruled he many regions, And statesmen wise, and valiant legions. A pheasant lord, above the rest, With every grace and talent blest, Was sent to sway with all his skill The sceptre of a neighbouring hill. No science was to him unknown, For all the arts were all his own, in all the living learned read, though more delighted with the dead. For birds, if ancient tales say true, had then their popes and homers too, could read and write in prose and verse, and speak like blank and build like pierce. He knew their voices and their wings, who smoothest soars, who sweetest sings, who toils with ill-fledged pens to climb, and who attained the true sublime. Their merits he could well descry, he had so exquisite an eye, and when that failed to show them clear, he had as exquisite an ear. It chanced, as on a day he strayed, beneath an academic shade, he liked amidst a thousand throats the wildness of a woodlark's notes, and searched and spied and seized his game, and took him home and made him tame found him on trial true and able, so cheered and fed him at his table. Here some shrewd critic finds I'm caught, and cries out, better fed than taught, than jests on game and tame and reads, and jests, and so my tale proceeds. Long had he studied in the wood, conversing with the wise and good, his soul with harmony inspired, with love of truth and virtue fired. His brethren's good and maker's praise were all the study of his lays, were all the study in retreat, and now employed him with the great. His friendship was the sure resort of all the wretched at the court, but chiefly merit in distress his greatest blessing was to bless. This fixed him in his patron's breast, but fired with envy all the rest. I mean that noisy, craving crew who round the court incessant flew, and prayed like rooks by pairs and dozens to fill the maws of sons and cousins, unmoved their heart and chilled their blood to every thought of common good, confining every hope and care to their own low contracted sphere. These ran him down with ceaseless cry, but found it hard to tell you why, till his own worth and wit supplied sufficient matter to deride. "'Tis envy's safest, surest rule to hide her rage in ridicule, "'the vulgar eye she best beguiles when all her snakes are decked with smiles, "'sardonic smiles by rancor raised, tormented most when seeming plazed. "'Their spite had more than half expired had he not wrote what all admired, "'what morsels had their malice wanted, but that he built and planned and planted.' How had his sense and learning grieved them, but that his charity relieved them? As highest worth dull malice reaches, as slugs pollute the fairest peaches, envy defames as harpies vile, devour the food they first defile. Now ask the fruit of all his favour, he was not hitherto a saver. What then could make their rage run mad? Why, what he hoped, not what he had? What tyrant ear invented ropes, or racks, or rods, to punish hopes? The inheritance of hope and fame is seldom earthly wisdom's aim, or, if it were, is not so small, but there is room enough for all. If he but chanced to breathe a song, he seldom sang, and never long, the noisy, rude, malignant crowd, where it was high, pronounced it loud. Plain truth was pride, and what was sillier, easy and friendly was familiar. Or if he turned his lofty lays with solemn air to virtue's praise, alike abusive and erroneous, they'd called it hoarse and inharmonious. Yet so it was to souls like theirs, tuneless as able to the bears. A rook with harsh malignant caw began was followed by a daw, though some who would be thought to know are positive it was a crow. Jack Daw was seconded by Tit, Tom Tit could write, and so he writ, a tribe of tuneless praters follow, the jay, the magpie, and the swallow, and twenty more their throats let loose, down to the witless waddling goose. Some pecked at him, some flew, some fluttered, some hissed, some screamed, and others muttered, 
The crow on carrion want to faste, The carrion crow condemn'd his taste. The rook in earnest too, not joking, Swore all his singing was but croaking. Some thought they meant to show their wit, Might think so still, but that they writ. Could it be spite or envy? No, who did no ill could have no foe. So why simplicity esteemed, Quite otherwise true wisdom deemed, This question rightly understood, What more provokes than doing good? A soul ennobled and refined Reproaches every baser mind, As strains exalted and melodious Make every meaner music odious. At length the nightingale was heard, For voice and wisdom long revered, Esteemed of all the wise and good, The guardian genius of the wood. He long in discontent retired, yet not obscured, but more admired. His brethren's servile souls disdaining, he lived indignant and complaining. They now afresh provoke his collar, it seems the lark had been his scholar, a favourite scholar always near him, and oft had waked whole nights to hear him. Enraged he canvasses the matter, exposes all their senseless chatter, shows him and them in such a light as more inflames yet quells their spite. They hear his voice and frighted fly, for rage had raised it very high. Shamed by the wisdom of his notes, they hide their heads and hush their throats. Answer to Dr. Delaney's Fable of the Pheasant and Lark, 1730 In ancient times the wise were able, in proper terms, to write a fable. Their tales would always justly suit the characters of every brute. The ass was dull, the lion brave, the stag was swift, the fox a knave, the daw a thief, the ape a droll, the hound would scent, the wolf would prowl. A pigeon would, if shown by Aesop, fly from the hawk or pick his peas up. Far otherwise a great divine has learnt his fables to refine. He jumbles men and birds together as if they all were of a feather. You see him first the peacock bring, against all rules to be a king that in his tail he wore his eyes, by which he grew both rich and wise. Now pray observe the doctor's choice, a peacock chose for flight and voice. Did ever mortal see a peacock attempt a flight above a haycock? And for his singing, Dr. Uno himself complained of it to Juno. He squalls in such a hellish noise, he frightens all the village boys. This peacock kept a standing force in regiments of foot and horse, had statesmen, too, of every kind, who waited on his eyes behind. And this was thought the highest post, for rule the rump, you rule the roast. The doctor names but one at present, and he of all birds was a pheasant. This pheasant was a man of wit, could read all books wherever writ, and when among companions privy could quote you Cicero and Livy. Birds, as he says, and I allow, were scholars then as we are now could read all volumes up to folios, and feed on fricassees and folios. This pheasant, by the peacock's will, was viceroy of a neighbouring hill, and as he wandered in his park, he chanced to spy a clergy lark. Was taken with his person outward, so prettily he picked a cowturd. Then in a net the pheasant caught him, and in his palace fed and taught him. The moral of the tale is pleasant, himself the lark, my lord the pheasant. A lark he is, and such a lark as never came from Noah's ark, and though he had no other notion but building, planning, and devotion, though tis a maxim you must know, who does no ill can have no foe. Yet how can I express in words the strange stupidity of birds? This lark was hated in the wood because he did his brethren good. At last the nightingale comes in to hold the doctor by the chin, we all can find out what he means, the worst of disaffected deans, whose wit at best was next to none, and now that little next is gone. Against the court is always blabbing, and calls the senate house a cabin, so dull that but for spleen and spite we near should know what he could write, who thinks the nation always erred because himself is not preferred. His heart is through his libel seen, nor could his malice spare the queen who had she known his vile behaviour, would ne'er have shown him so much favour. A noble lord has told his pranks, and well deserves the nation's thanks. Oh, would the senate deign to show resentment on this public foe, 
Our nightingale might fit a cage, There let him starve and vent his rage. Or would they but in fetters bind This enemy of human kind? Harmonious coffee, show thy zeal, Thou champion for the common wheel, Nor on a theme like this repine, For once to wet thy pen divine. Bestow that libeller a lash, Who daily vends seditious trash, Who dares revile the nation's wisdom, But in the praise of virtue is dumb. That scribbler lash, who neither knows The turn of verse nor style of prose, Whose malice for the worst of ends Would have us lose our English friends, who never had one public thought, nor ever gave the poor a grot. One clincher more, and I have done, I end my labours with a pun. Jove, send this nightingale may fall, who spends his day and night in gall. So nightingale and lark... Section 120 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dean Smedley's Petition to the Duke of Grafton It was, my lord, the dexterous shift of t'other Jonathan, viz. Swift, but now St. Patrick's saucy dean, with silver verge and surplice clean, of Oxford or of Armand's grace, in looser rhyme to beg a place. A place he got, ye clept a stall, and eke a thousand pounds withal, and were he less a witty writer, he might as well have got a mitre. Thus I, the Jonathan of Cloffer, in humble lays my thanks to offer, approach your grace with grateful heart, my thanks and verse both void of art. Content with what your bounty gave, no larger income do I crave, rejoicing that in better times Grafton requires my loyal lines. Proud, while my patron is polite, I likewise to the patriot write, Proud that at once I can commend King George's and the Muse's friend, Endeared to Britain and to thee, Disjoined Hibernia by the sea, Endeared by twice three anxious years, Employed in guardian toils and cares, By love, by wisdom, and by skill, For he has saved thee gainst thy will. But where shall Smedley make his nest? and lay his wandering head to rest? Where shall he find a decent house, to treat his friends and cheer his spouse? O oh, tack, my lord, some pretty cure, in wholesome soil and ether pure, the garden stored with artless flowers, in either angle shady bowers, no gay parterre with costly green within the ambient hedge be seen, let nature freely take her course, nor fear from me ungrateful force. No shears shall check her sprouting vigour, nor shape the yews to antic figure. A limpid brook shall trout supply, in May to take the mimic fly. Round a small orchard may it run, whose apples redden to the sun. Let all be snug and warm and neat, for fifty turned a safe retreat. A little Euston may it be, Euston I'll carve on every tree. But then to keep it in repair, my lord, twice fifty pounds a year, will barely do, but if your grace could make them hundreds, charming place. Though then wouldst show another face, Cloffer far north, my lord, it lies, midst snowy hills in clement skies. One shivers with the arctic wind, one hears the polar axis grind. Good John, indeed, with beef and claret, makes the place warm that one may bear it. He has a purse to keep a table, and eke a soul as hospitable. My heart is good, but assets fail, to fight with storms of snow and hail. Besides, the country's thin of people, who seldom meet but at the steeple. The strapping dean that's gone to down, near named the thing without a frown. When much fatigued with sermon study, he felt his brain grow dull and muddy. No fit companion could be found to push the lazy bottle round. Sure then, for want of better folks, to pledge his clerk was orthodox. Ah, how unlike to Gerard Street, where bows and bells in parties meet, where gilded chairs and coaches throng and jostle as they troll along, where tea and coffee hourly flow and gapeseed does in plenty grow, 
and Grizz, no clock more certain, cries, Exact at seven, hot mutton pies. Their lady Luna in her sphere Once shone when Ponsforth was not near, But now she wanes, and, as tis said, Keeps sober hours and goes to bed. There, but tis endless to write down All the amusements of the town, And spouse will think herself quite undone To trudge to Connor from sweet London, And care we must our wives to please, Or else we shall be ill at ease. You see, my lord, what tis I lack, Tis only some convenient tack, Some parsonage house with garden sweet, To be my late, my last retreat. A decent church, close by its side, There preaching, praying, to reside. And as my time securely rolls, To save my own and other souls. THE DUKE'S ANSWER BY DR. SWIFT Dear Smet, I read thy brilliant lines, Where wit in all its glory shines, Where compliments with all their pride Are by their numbers dignified. I hope to make you yet as clean As that same viz. St. Patrick's Dean. I'll give thee supplies, verge and stall, And maybe something else withal, And were you not so good a writer, I should present you with a mitre. Write worse, then, if you can, be wise, believe me, tis the way to rise. Talk not of making of thy nest, and never lay thy head to rest. That head so well with wisdom fraught, that writes without the toil of thought, while others rack their busy brains, you are not in the least at pains. Down to your deanery now repair, and build a castle in the air. I'm sure a man of your fine sense can do it with a small expense. There your dear spouse and you together may breathe your bellies full of ether. When Lady Luna is your neighbour, she'll help your wife when she's in labour. Well skilled in midwife artifices, for she herself oft falls in pieces. There you shall see a rarey show will make you scorn this world below. When you behold the milky way, as white as snow, as bright as day, the glittering constellations roll about the grinding arctic pole, the lovely tingling in your ears wrought by the music of the spheres. Your spouse shall then no longer hector, you need not fear a curtain lecture. Nor shall she think that she is undone for quitting her beloved London. When she's exalted in the skies, she'll never think of mutton pies. When you're advanced above Dean Viz, you'll never think of Goody Grizz. But ever, ever live at ease, and strive and strive your wife to please. In her you'll centre all your joys, and get ten thousand girls and boys. Ten thousand girls and boys you'll get, and they like stars shall rise and set. While you and spouse transformed shall soon be a new sun and a new moon. Nor shall you st Section 121 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 1, by Jonathan Swift. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Parody on a Character of Dean Smedley written in Latin by himself. The very reverend Dean Smedley, of dullness, pride, conceit, a medley, was equally allowed to shine as poet, scholar, and divine. With godliness could well dispense, would be a rake, but wanted sense, would strictly after truth inquire, because he dreaded to come nigh her. For liberty no champion bolder, he hated bailiffs at his shoulder to half the world a standing jest, a perfect nuisance to the rest. From many, and we may believe him, had the best wishes they could give him. To all mankind a constant friend, provided they had cash to lend, one thing he did before he went hence, he left us a laconic sentence, by cutting of his phrase and trimming to prove that bishops were old women. Poor Envy durst not show her fizz, she was so terrified at his. He waded without any shame through thick and thin to get a name, tried every sharping trick for bread, and after all he seldom sped. 
When fortune favour'd he was nice, He never once would cog the dice; But if she turn'd against his play, He knew to stop a quatre trois, Now sound in mind, and sound in corpus, Says he, though swell'd like any porpoise. He hies from hence at forty four, But by his leave he sinks a score, To the East Indies, there to chate, Till he can purchase an estate; Where, after he has fill'd his chest, He'll mount his tub and preach his best, And plainly prove, by dint of text, This world is his, and theirs the next. Lest that the reader should not know The bank where last he set his toe, T'was Greenwich there he took a ship, And gave his creditors the slip. But lest chronology should vary Upon the Ides of February, In seventeen hundred eight and twenty To Fort St. George a peddler went he, Ye fates, when all he gets is spent, Return him beggar as he went.